The Last Secrets by John Buchan Dedication and Preface To the memory of Brigadier General Cecil Rawling, CMG, CIE, who fell at the Third Battle of Ypres, an intrepid explorer, a gallant soldier, and the best of friends. Preface The first two decades of the 20th century will rank as a most distinguished era in the history of exploration. For during them, many of the great geographical riddles of the world have been solved. This book contains a record of some of the main achievements. What Nansen said of polar exploration is true of all exploration. Its story is a mighty manifestation of the power of the unknown over the mind of man. The unknown, happily, will always be with us, for there are infinite secrets in a blade of grass and an eddy of wind, and a grain of dust, and human knowledge will never attain that finality when the sense of wonder shall cease. But to the ordinary man there is an appeal in large, bold, and obvious conundrums which is lacking in the minutiae of research. Thousands of square miles of the globe still await surveying and mapping, but most of the exploration of the future will be the elucidation of details. The main lines of the Earth's architecture have been determined, and the task is now one of amplifying our knowledge of the grinding and buttresses and stonework. There are no more unvisited forbidden cities or unapproached high mountains or unrecorded great rivers. The world is disenchanted. Over soon must Europe send her spies through all the land. It is in a high degree improbable that many geographical problems remain, the solving of which will come upon the mind with the overwhelming romance of the unveilings we have been privileged to witness. The explorers will still be a noble trade, but it will be a filling up of gaps and a framework of knowledge which we already possess. The morning freshness has gone out of the business, and we are left with the plodding duties of the afternoon. Some of the undertakings described in these pages have not been completed. The foot of man has not yet stood on the last snows of Everest or on the summit of Karstens. One notable discovery I have not dealt with, the great Turfan depression in the heart of Central Asia, far below the sea level, the existence of which was first established by the Russian Roborowski before the close of the last century and the details of which have been described by Sir Oriel Stein in his Ruins of Desert Cathay and Ser India. But Sir Oriel's interest was chiefly in the antiquities of the place, and the more strictly geographical results have not yet been given to the world. Today, if we survey the continents, we find nothing of which the main features have not already been expounded. The Amazon basin might be regarded as an exception, and only a little while ago, men dreamed of discovering among the wilds of the Bolivian frontier the remains, perhaps even the survival, of an ancient civilization. It would appear that these dreams are baseless. The late President Roosevelt did indeed succeed in putting upon the map a new river, the Rio Roosevelt, 1,500 kilometers long, of which the upper course was entirely unknown, and the lower course explored only by a few rubber collectors. A river which is the chief affluent of the Madeira, which is itself the chief affluent of the Amazon. But now all the tributaries have been traced, and though there is much unexplored ground in the Amazon Valley, it consists of forest tracts lying between the rivers, all more or less alike in their general character, and with nothing to repay the explorer except their flora and fauna. Africa is now an open book, even though many parts have been little traveled. The map of Asia alone holds one blank patch, which may well be the last of the great secrets, the desert of southern Arabia, which lies between Yemen and Oman, 800 by 500 miles of waterless sands. Long ago there were routes athwart it, and hidden in its recesses some great news may await the traveler. But its crossing will be a hazardous affair for whoever undertakes it, since he will have to lean upon the frail reed of milk camels for food and transport. For the rest, 
the problems are now of survey and scientific inquiry rather than of exploration in the grand manner i have many acknowledgments to make my thanks are due in the first place to mr charles turley smith who has contributed the chapters on arctic and antarctic exploration subjects on which he is especially equipped to write and in order to put the conquest of the two poles in its proper light has supplied a sketch of the long history of polar exploration i am deeply indebted to mr arthur r hinks the secretary and to mr edward hewood the librarian of the royal geographical society for their help and advice i have also to express my thanks to messrs constable and company for permission to reproduce illustrations and to quote from works published by them to Major G. H. Putnam and Messrs. Seeley, Service and Company for the same kindness, to Major F. M. Bailey, C.I.E., and the British Political Office in Sikkim for the story of the Brahmaputra Gorges, and to my friends of the Mount Everest Committee for their assent to my use of their beautiful photographs of that mountain. J. B. End of Dedication and Preface Chapter 1. Lhasa Till the summer of 1904, if one had been asked what was the most mysterious spot on the Earth's surface, the reply would have been Lhasa. It was a place on which no Englishman had cast an eye for a hundred years, and no white man for more than half a century. In our prosaic modern world, there remained one city among the clouds about which no tale was too strange for belief. The greatest of the mountain barriers shut it off from the south, and on the north it was guarded by leagues of waterless desert. Explorer after explorer had set out on the quest, but all had stopped short before the golden roofs of the sacred city could be seen from any hilltop. Even in the early days, the place had never been explored, for the visitors had been jealously watched and hurried quickly away. In the Potala might be treasures of a culture long hidden to the world, lost treatises of Aristotle, unknown Greek poems, relics, perhaps, of the mystic kingdom of Kublai Khan, riches of gold and jewels drawn from the four corners of Asia. And then... Suddenly, in 1904, we went there, not as apologetic travelers taken by side paths, but as an armed force marching along the highway to the very heart of the mystery, and letting loose at once upon the world a flood of accurate knowledge. For a moment, we were carried centuries away from high politics and every modern invention, and were back in the great ages of discovery with the Portuguese in their quest for Ophir or Prester John, or with Raleigh looking for Manoa the Golden. It was impossible for the least sentimental to avoid a certain regret for the drawing back of that curtain which had meant so much to the imagination of mankind. The shrinkage of the world goes on so fast, our horizon grows so painfully clear, that the old untiring wonder which cast its glamour over the ways of our predecessors is vanishing from the lives of their descendants. With the unveiling of Lhasa fell the last stronghold of the older romance. Tibet had always been a forbidden land, and, as a rule, adventurers only penetrated its fringes. Somewhere about the year 1328, a certain friar Oderic of Portanon, traveling from Cathay, is said to have entered Lhasa. And in the middle of the 16th century, for now Mendez Pinto may have reached it. In 1661, the Jesuits Gruber and de Orville made a journey from Peking to Lhasa, and thence by way of Nepal into India. In the early part of the 18th century, there was a temporary unveiling, and a Capuchin mission was established in the holy city. Various Jesuits also reached the place, notably one Desideri. And in 1730 came Samuel Vanderpoot, a doctor of laws of Leiden, who stayed long enough to learn the language. In 1745, the Capuchin mission came to an end, and the curtain descended. 
In 1774, George Bogle of the East India Company was in Tibet on a mission from Warren Hastings, but the first Englishman did not reach Lhasa till 1811, when Thomas Manning of Caius College, Cambridge, a friend of Charles Lamb, arrived and stayed for five months on his unsuccessful journey from Calcutta to Peking till 1904 manning was the solitary englishman who was known for certain to have entered the sacred city though there was a tale of one william warcroft reaching the place in 1826 and living there for twelve years in disguise in 1844 the french missionaries hook and gabet reached lhasa from china and recorded their experiences in one of the most delightful of all books of travel they were the last Europeans to have the privilege up to the entry of the British army. But throughout the last half of the 19th century, Indian natives in the government service were employed in the survey of Tibet, men of the type of Babu whom Mr. Kipling has described in Kim. The whole business was kept strictly secret. The agents were known only by the letters of the alphabet and when they crossed the Tibetan borders, they were aware that they had passed beyond the protection of the British Raj. More than one reached Lhasa by fantastic routes, with the result that the Indian government had accurate information about the city filed in its archives, while the world at large knew the place only from the history of Huk and Gebe, and from the drawing of the Potala made by Gruber in the 17th century. Of the later European travelers, none reached the capital. Mr. Littledale, in 1895, was not stopped by the Tibetan authorities till he was within 50 miles of the city, and Sven Heden in 1901 got within 14 days of Lhasa from the north. But, meantime, events were happening which were to impel the government of India to interfere more actively in Tibetan policy than by merely sending native agents to collect news. The traditional policy was to preserve Tibet as a sanctuary, but a sanctuary is only a sanctuary if all the neighbors combine to hold it inviolate. In 1903, the position of Britain and Tibet was like that of a big boy at school who is tormented by an impertinent youngster. He bears it for some time, but at last is compelled to administer chastisement. The Convention of 1890 and the Trade Regulations of 1893 were outraged by the Tibetans in many of their provisions. Our letters of protest were returned unopened, and, since news travels fast upon the frontier, our protected peoples began to wonder what made the British Raj so tolerant of ill treatment. This was bad enough for our prestige in the East, but the danger became acute when we discovered that the Dalai Lama was in treaty with Russia, and that an avowed Russian agent, one Dorjiev, was in residence at his court. The two powers in Lhasa were the Dalai Lama, who speedily fell under Russian influence, and the Tsong Du, or council composed of representatives of the great priestly caste, who suspected all innovations, and were in favor of maintaining the traditional policy of exclusion against Russia and Britain alike. China, though the nominal suzerain, was impotent, her viceroy, the Amban, being partially insulted by both parties. In these circumstances, Britain could only make her arrangements by going direct to headquarters. Dorjiev had played his cards with great skill and seemed to be winning everywhere. The Dalai Lama was wholly with him and had received from the Tsar a complete set of vestments of a bishop of the Greek church. The Russian monarch was recognized as a bodhisattva incarnation, representing no less a person than Tsong Kappa, the Luther of Lamaism. And Russia was popularly believed to be a Buddhist power, or at any rate the sworn protector of the Buddhist faith. It is difficult to overestimate the significance of these doings. But at the same time, Russian influence was rather potential than actual. The Cossacks, who accompanied Sven Hedden, were headed off from the holy city as vigorously as any English explorer, and the tales of arming with Russian rifles, which filtered through to India, were rather intelligent anticipations than records of facts. 
there were thus two parties in tibet pulling against each other but both in different ways hostile to our interests the dalai lama and dorjieff favored a departure from the traditional tibetan policy in favor of russia the Songdu and the Lamaist hierarchy in general were all for exclusion, but in their willfulness declined to observe treaties or behave with neighborly honesty. This internal strife, which alone made possible the success of our expedition, also made its dispatch inevitable, for neither party was prepared to listen to any argument but force few enterprises have ever been undertaken by britain more unwillingly and her decision was only arrived at under the compulsion of stark necessity there were many who reprobated what they assumed to be a violation of the sacred places of an ancient pure and pacific religion but there was no need for compunction on that score since lamaism was the grossest perversion of buddhism in all asia spiritually it had more kinship with the aboriginal devil worship of tibet than with the gentle greed of gautama practically it was a political tyranny of monks who battened upon a mild and industrious population and ruled them with coarse theological terrors our reception by the monasteries was sufficiently gruff but to the common people we came rather in the guise of friends in July 1903, Colonel Young Husband, as he was then, Mr. White and Captain O'Connor went to the Kambajong, a place in southern Tibet, just north of Sikkim. There they met the abbot of Tashil Hunpo and certain emissaries from Lhasa, but nothing could be done. And with the concurrence of the Indian office, it was arranged that a mission should go to Giangtze, the chief town of southern Tibet, accompanied by a small escorting force. While troops were being collected, the commissioner, Colonel Young Husband, went to Tuna, on the bleak plain above the Tang La, where he waited through three weary winter months. Meanwhile, General MacDonald, a soldier who had had a distinguished record in Central Africa, took up his quarters at Chumbai, while Major Betherton, the chief transport and supply officer, accumulated stores in that valley and prepared the line of communications those were anxious months of waiting for the mission for the tibetans were in force in the neighborhood and daily threatened to attack the small post but nothing happened till the escort joined them in the end of march nineteen o four and all things were ready for the advance it is worth while looking back upon the road to tuna from the plains of bengal surely one of the most wonderful of the great north roads of the world. At Siliguri, the little toy railway to Darjeeling runs up the hillside. But the path for the troops lay along the gorge of the Tista River, through forest of sal and gurgeon, which give place in turn to teak and bamboo, till the altitude increases and the tree fern and rhododendron take their places, and at last the pines are reached, and the fringe of the snows is near from the glorious subtropical vegetation of gangtok the capital of sikkim the road runs through difficult ravines till it passes the tree line at Lagyap and climbs over the frozen summit of the natu la from this point tibet is visible with the majestic snows of chumulhari hanging like a cloud in the north then you descend to the chumbai valley the debatable land of tibet where stands Ta Karpo, the great white rock, which recalls a famous passage in the Odyssey. Right under Chumohari and just south of the Tang La lies Farijong, the first of the minor Tibetan fortalices, which looks as if it were a bad copy of some European model. A little farther, and you are over the pass, and on the great plateau of Tuna, where icy winds blow from the hills and drive the gritty soil in blizzards about the traveler. There are few places in the world where in so short a time, so complete a climatic and scenic change can be experienced. On the 31st of March, the expedition left Tuna and after an unfortunate encounter with the tibetans which cost the latter many lives and in which mr edmund candler the distinguished war correspondent was wounded 
the enemy made a further stand at Red Idol Gorge. Nothing of importance, however, occurred till the town of Gangsi was reached and occupied without a shot. Very soon it became apparent that no more could be done here than at Cambajong, and the government of India were obliged to sanction a farther advance to Lhasa. For this, preparations must be made. So the commissioner, with a small escort, took up his quarters at Gyangtze, while General MacDonald returned to Chambai for reinforcements. The Jong was found to be deserted, but unfortunately was neither held nor destroyed, the mission residing in the plain below. At first, the waiting among those iris-clad meadows was pleasant and idyllic enough. The country people brought abundant supplies, and members of the staff rode through the neighborhood and had tea with various dignitaries of the church. But early in May, things took a turn for the worse. It was reported that the Tibetans were fortifying the Kerala, the next pass on the Lhasa Road, and since it is the first principle of frontier warfare to strike quickly, Colonel Brander was dispatched with a larger part of the garrison to disperse them. He performed the task with conspicuous success, and the incident is remarkable for one of the strangest pieces of fighting in our military history. It was necessary to enfilade a sangar in which the enemy was ensconced, and a native officer, Wasawa Singh, with twelve Gurkhas, was detached for the work. They climbed up by means of cracks and chimneys up a 1,500-foot cliff, an exploit which would have done credit to any alpine club, even if the climbers had not been cumbered with weapons exposed to fire and laboring at a height of nearly 19,000 feet. During the engagement, disquieting news arrived from Gyangtze that the Jong had been reoccupied by the enemy and that the mission was undergoing a continuous bombardment. Colonel Brander hurried back to find that the world had moved fast in his absence and that there was a new type of Tibetan army to be faced, a type possessed of both dash and persistence with some notion of strategy and with guns which, at short range, could do real execution. So began the blockade of the mission house, an imperfect blockade for the telegraph wires remained intact the mail was delivered with fair regularity, and the besieged endured no special privations. The honors, said Mr. Percival Landon, were pretty evenly divided. Neither Tibetans nor we were able to storm the other's defenses. A mutual fusillade compelled each side to protect its occupants by an elaborate system of traverses. And straying beyond the narrow tracks of the fortifications was, on either side, severely discouraged by the other. An attempt to cut our communications failed, and by the capture of Pala, the garrison greatly strengthened its position. Our troops had an experience of the type of fighting which has scarcely been known since the great sackings of the Thirty Years' War. In an upland country, we expect attacks on fortified hilltops and long-range encounters such as we saw in South Africa. But in an episode like the capture of Naini, it was medieval street fighting that we had to face. The castle of Otranto provided no more endless labyrinths than those of Tibetan monasteries. Bands of desperate swordsmen were found in knots under trap doors and behind sharp turnings. They would not surrender and had to be killed by rifle shots fired at a distance of a few feet. On the 26th June, General MacDonald arrived with a relieving force, and soon after came the Tongsa Penlop, the temporal ruler of Bhutan, a genial potentate in rich, varicolored robes and a Homburg hat. The Tibetan offensive had weakened, but the Jong had to be taken before the mission could advance. Down the middle of the precipitous southeastern face of the great rock ran a deep fissure across which walls had been built. It was decided to breach these walls by our gunfire, and then to attack by way of the cleft. The actual assault was a brilliant and intrepid exploit, for which Lieutenant Grant of the 8th Gurkhas most deservedly received the Victoria Cross. With our guns battering the walls above, he and his men scrambled up the ravine, while masses of rubble poured down on them, and every now and then carried off a man. 
then the gurkha's bugles warned the guns to cease and the last climb began up a face so steep that there was no possible shelter from the enemy's fire by such desperate mountaineering the invaders at last reached the wreckage of the tibetan wall grant and one of the gurkhas were the first two men over and to the observers below their deaths seemed a certainty they were two against the whole enemy force in the jong and had the tibetans reserved their fire and waited at the bastions they could have picked off every man of the assault as his head appeared above the breach but the bold course proved the wise one and presently the garrison surrendered rarely has the victoria cross been better earned and it is satisfactory to know that lieutenant grant reaped the reward of perfect fearlessness and received only a slight wound on the fourteenth of july the expedition moved out from Gyangtze along the road to lhasa grass and a glory of flowers covered the glens which led up to the kerala the serious fighting was over and the second crossing of that pass was remarkable only for the fact that some rock platforms and caves had to be cleared by our panting troops at an altitude of over nineteen thousand feet in the rest of the story the soldier finds little place and the interest attaches itself to the durbars of the commissioner and the treasure house of natural and artistic wonders which the mission was approaching for after Gyangsi, the resistance of the tibetans was at an end half sullenly and half curiously they permitted our advance delaying us a little with fruitless negotiations while in lhasa the game of high politics which the dalai lama had played was turning against him and like another deity he was meditating a pilgrimage after the kerala came the yam dak or as some call it the yutso or turquoise lake the most wonderful natural feature of the plateau its curious shape its pale blue waters its shores of white sand fringed with dog roses and forget-me-nots the cloud of fable which has always brooded over it and its august environment make it unique among the lakes of the world i quote a fragment of mr landon's description quote, below lie both the outer and the inner lakes this following with the counter indentations in the in and out windings of the other shoreline the mass and color of the purple distance is scotland at her best scotland too in the slow drift of a slant roofed rain cloud in among the hills at one's feet the water is like that of the lake of geneva but the tattered outline of the beach with its projecting lines of needle rocks its wide white curving sand spits its jagged islets its precipitous spurs and above all the mysterious tarns strung one beyond another into the heart of the hills all these are the yamdok's own and not another's if you are lucky you may see the snowy slopes of tonang guarded by the waters and always on the horizon are the everlasting ice fields of the himalayas bitterly ringing with argent and sun and color of the still blue lake you will not ask for the added glories of a tibetan sunset the gray spin and scatter of a rain-threaded afterglow or the tangled sweep of a thundercloud's edge against the blue will give you all you wish and you will have had seen the finest view in all this strange land End quote. on the shore lies the convent of samding the home of the dorji phagmo or pig goddess which was jealously respected by the troops since its abbess had nursed chandra das one of the adventurous agents of the indian government when he fell sick during his travels the present incarnation a little girl of six declined to reveal herself nothing was more satisfactory in the whole tale of the expedition than the way in which any service done at any time to a british subject white or black met with full recognition such conduct cannot have failed to have raised the prestige of the power which showed itself so mindful of its servants prestige and reputation of a kind indeed we already possessed the tibetan monasteries had a trick of sending their most valuable longings to the nearest convent for they argued the english do not enter nunneries or war with women 
On July 24th, the expedition crossed the Kumbala and descended to the broad green valley of the Tsang Po. The crossing of that river, a work of real difficulty, was made tragic by the death of Major Betherton, the brilliant transport officer, to whom, perhaps more than to any other soldier, the military success in the enterprise was due. Not the least of the mysteries of Tibet was this secret stream, which the traveler, after miles of bleak upland, finds flowing among English woods and meadows. In Assam and Bengal it was the Brahmaputra, but when it entered the hills it was as unknown to a civilized man as Alf or the four rivers of Eden. What its middle course was like, and how it broke through the mountain barrier were questions which no one had answered, nor at the time was there any accurate knowledge of its upper valleys. Once on the north bank, Lhasa was but a short way off, and in growing excitement the expedition covered the last stages. It was one of the great moments of life, and we can all understand and envy the final hurried miles, till through the haze the eye caught the gleam of golden roofs and white terraces. The first prospect brought no disappointment. If the streets were squalid, they were set in a green plain seamed with waters. Trees and gardens were everywhere, while above, the huge Assisi-like citadel of the Potala typified the massive secrecy of generations, and the ring of dark hills reminded the onlooker that this garden ground was planted on the roof of the world. Meanwhile, the expedition set itself down outside the gates to abide the pleasure of the sullen and perturbed masters. The deity of the place had gone on a journey. No one quite knew whither. He had kept his moonlight flitting a secret, and had gone off on the northern road with Dorjieff and a small escort to claim the hospitality of his spiritual brother of Urga. He had played his impossible game with spirit and subtlety, and he had a pretty taste for romance in its ending. When one looks for mystery in Lhasa, wrote Mr. Candler, one's thoughts dwell solely on the Dalai Lama and the Potala. I cannot help dwelling on the flight of the thirteenth incarnation. It plunges us into medievalism. To my mind, there is no picture so engrossing in modern history as that exodus when the spiritual head of the Buddhist church, the temporal ruler of six millions, stole out of his palace by night and was borne away in his palanquin. The romance which Mr. Candler saw in the Potala, Mr. Langdon found most conspicuously in the church of the Jokang. The palace was magnificent from the outside, but within it was only a warren of small rooms and broken stairways. The great cathedral, on the other hand, was hidden away among the trees and streets so that its golden roof could only be seen from a distance, but inside it was a shrine of all that was mysterious and splendid. The contrast was allegorical of the difference between the temporal ruler of Lamaism, gaudy, tyrannical, and hollow, and the sway of the Buddhist church, which by hidden ways and unseen agencies dominated the imagination of Asia. The Chinese Amban, having a natural desire to pay back the people who had so grossly neglected him, invited certain members of the mission to enter this holy of holies. The visitors were the first white men to approach the inner sanctuary of the Buddhist faith. They were stoned on leaving the building, but the site was one worth risking much to see. In the central shrine sat the great golden Buddha, roped with jewels, crowned with turquoise and pearl, surrounded by dim, rough-hewn shapes which loomed out fitfully in the glare of the butter lamps, while the maroon-clad monks droned their eternal chant before the silver altar. And the statue was as strange as its environment. Quote, For this is no ordinary presentation of the master. The features are smooth and almost childish. Beautiful they are not, but there is no need of beauty here. There is no trace of that inscrutable smile which, from Mudkin to Salon, is inseparable from our conception of the features of the great teacher. Here there is nothing of the saddened smile of the melancholia, who has known too much and has renounced it all as vanity. 
here instead is the quiet happiness and the quick capacity for pleasure of the boy who had never yet known either pain or disease or death it is gautama as a pure and eager prince without any thought for the morrow or care for today End quote. mr landon has other pictures of almost equal charm he takes us to the famous Ling Kor, the sacred road which encircled the town, worn with the feet of generations of men seeking salvation. We see the unclean abode of the Ragiabas, that strange, unholy caste of beggar scavengers. We walk in the gardens of the Lu Kang, by the willow-fringed lake and the glades of velvet turf. And not least, we visit the temple of the chief wizard, where every form of human torment is delicately portrayed in fresco and carving. But if we wish to realize the savagery at the heart of this proud theocracy, we must go with Mr. Candler to the neighboring Dipong Monastery on the quest for supplies and see the tribe of inquisitors buzzing out like angry wasps and submitting only when the guns were trained on them. For these weeks of waiting in Lhasa were an anxious time for all concerned. Our own position was precarious in the extreme, and had the Lhasans once realized it, impossible. Winter was approaching, the government was urging the mission to get its treaty and come home, and yet day after day had to pass without result, and the commissioner could only wait and oppose to the obstinacy of the monks a stronger and quieter determination. Sir Francis' young husband was indeed almost the only man in the empire fitted for the task. He sat through every durbar, says Mr. Candler, a monument of patience and inflexibility, impassive as one of their own Buddhas. Priests and counselors found that appeals to his mercy were hopeless. He too had orders from his king to go to Lhasa. If he faltered, his life also was at stake decapitation would await him on his return. That was the impression he purposely gave them. It curtailed palaver. How, in the name of all their Buddhas, were they to stop such a man? At last, on 1st September, when after a month's diplomacy the Tibetans had only admitted two of our demands, the time came to deliver our ultimatum. The delegates were told that if all our terms were not accepted within a week, General MacDonald would consider the question of using stronger arguments. Our forbearance was justified by its results, for the opposition suddenly subsided and we gained what we asked without any coercion. It was a diplomatic triumph of a high order obtained in the face of difficulties which seemed to put diplomacy out of the question. The final scene came on 7th September, when in the audience chamber of the Potala the treaty was signed by the commissioner and by the acting regent who affixed the seal of the Dalai Lama, the four chapes, a representative of the Song Du, and the heads of the great monasteries. Thereafter came a limelight photograph of the gathering, and with this very modern climax, the great Asian mystery became a thing of the past. The Dalai Lama had already been formally deposed, his spiritual powers were transferred to our friend the Tasha Lama, and with the treaty in our baggage and real prestige in our wake, we began the homeward march. What were the results of the expedition? Geographically, they appeared a little barren, for we stuck too close to the high road to solve many of the greater mysteries. One fact of cardinal importance was established. Our concept of Tibet was revolutionized, and instead of an arid plateau, we learned that about one-third of it was nearly as fertile and well-watered as Kashmir. For the rest, the two most interesting expeditions were forbidden, down into the Brahmaputra to Assam, and to the mountains nine days north of Lhasa, which had formed the southern limit of Sven Hayden's exploration. One valuable expedition was, however, undertaken. Western Tibet had hitherto been the best-known part of the tableland, and now our knowledge of it was linked on to the Lassen district. On 10th October, Captains Ryder, Rawling, and Wood, and Lieutenant Bailey, with six Gurkhas, left Gyangsi and made their way by Shigatse up to the Tsangpo. They explored the river to its source, 
and passing the great manasarowar lakes arrived at gartok on the upper indus thence they entered the sutledged valley and crossing the shipke pass of over eighteen thousand feet reached simla in the first week of january nineteen o five much was added to our knowledge of the Himalaya. the fact was established that the old reports of northern rivals to everest was unfounded and moreover the highest mountains in the world was seen from the northern side where the slopes are easier and the possibility of an attempt on it occurred to various minds a hope which seventeen years later was realized on the political side the true achievement was not the formal treaty but the going to lhasa we taught the tibetans that their mysterious capital could not be shut against our troops and that russian promises were less real than british performances we showed ourselves strong and above all things humane and we earned respect and it would also appear a kind of affection when the venerable regent solemnly blessed the commissioner and general macdonald for their clemency and presented each with a golden image of the buddha an honor rarely granted to the faithful and never before to an unbeliever he gave expression to the general feelings of the people tibet was enveloped once more in its old seclusion a deeper seclusion indeed since we guaranteed it a final result was that we vindicated our claim to protect our subjects and those who served us we took our gurkhas into the forbidden land which their native traditions had invested with a miraculous power and showed them the truth as for bhutan up to nineteen o four it was as obscure as tibet and its people were strangers they were now in the commissioner's phrase our enthusiastic allies their ruler in his homburg hat joined us in the march and acted as master of ceremonies in introducing us to the lhasa notables nearly twenty years have passed and much water has since run under the bridges in nineteen o six china adhered to the treaty and in nineteen o seven came the anglo-russian convention which provided for the secluding of the country by both powers and recognized china's suzerain rights in 1909 the dalai lama who had been restored was ejected by chinese troops and in 1910 he was at darjeeling a refugee claiming our hospitality once again he was reinstated and he has ever since been a faithful ally of britain at the outbreak of the great war he offered one thousand tibetan troops and informed the king that lamas through the length and breadth of tibet were praying for the success of the british arms and for the happiness of the souls of the fallen since nineteen o four both china and russia have crumbled into anarchy there is no peril to india through the eastern himalayan passes and the strategic importance of tibet has dwindled it is still a forbidden country but it is no longer a secret one posts run regularly to lhasa and a telegraph line has been laid to that mysterious capital but it is mysterious only by a literary convention the true mystery is gone the secret such as it was has been revealed and the human mind can no longer play with the unknown child roland had reached the dark tower and found it not so marvelous after all it is hard not to sympathize with mr chandler's plaint Quote, there are no more forbidden cities which men have not mapped and photographed our children will laugh at modern travelers' tales. They will have to turn again soon to Gulliver and Harun el Rashid, and they will soon tire of these. For now that there are no real mysteries, no unknown land of dreams where there may still be genie and mahatmas and bottle imps, that kind of literature will be tolerated no longer. Children will be skeptical and matter of fact and disillusioned and there will be no sale for fairy stories any more but we ourselves are children why could we not have left at least one city out of bounds End quote. these reflections do not detract from the romance of the expedition itself and the privilege of the fortunate men who shared in it for them it was assuredly a great adventure one which could never be repeated it may be summed up, as Mr. Landon has summed it up, 
in certain famous lines from the odyssey which have not only a curious local application but embody the true spirit of adventure over the tides of ocean on they pressed on past the great white rock beside the stream on till through god's high bastions east and west they reached the plains with pale starred iris dressed and found at last the folk of whom men dream End of chapter one chapter two the gorges of the brahmaputra fifty years ago one of the questions most debated among geographers was the origin of the brahmaputra the great river navigable for eight hundred miles from its mouth was familiar enough in its course through the plains of india but it flowed from the wild abor country and no part of the indian borders was less known than those northeastern foothills meantime in tibet north of the main chain of the himalayas there was a large river the tsang po flowing from west to east did the tsang po ultimately become the brahmaputra or did it flow into the irrawaddy or even into the yangtze kiang all three views were held but there was no evidence to decide between them in eighteen seventy four a native explorer the pundit nain singh started on his famous journey from le to lhasa and was instructed if possible to follow the tsang po and see where it went he reached lhasa and on his return struck the tsang po at sitang well to the east of the point where the british expedition crossed in nineteen o four he followed its course for thirty miles farther down but was prevented from continuing his journey and compelled to return by the direct route to india in eighteen seventy eight another native explorer g m n seems to have followed the tsang po down as far as gyala which is not far from the point where the river turns sharply to the south but his reports were not considered reliable in eighteen eighty four another native kinthup succeeded in following the tsang po to a point called pemakuchung there he found an enormous gorge and was compelled to make a detour out to the north and east rejoining the stream where it entered the abor country kinthrop's report was of the highest interest he had stood at the beginning of an apparently impassable gorge and he reported a fall at pimakochung of a hundred and fifty feet he was however quite illiterate and was only able to make his report from memory and it presently appeared that the height might be only fifty feet and that the higher fall was not in fact a main stream but a small tributary one fact however of the utmost importance had been established by his expedition the sang po was beyond reasonable doubt the brahmaputra in its upper course the lhasa expedition in nineteen o four would fain have traced the river to the plains had not the government interposed a veto in the years that followed the source of the tsang po was discovered by captain rawling in nineteen eleven the abor expedition increased our knowledge of the course of the brahmaputra right up to the skirts of the main range the problem now was not the linking up of the tsang po and the brahmaputra but what happened to the river in the hairpin bend between pimakochung and its debouchment in the abor valleys the elevation of the stream at the point where the main road to Lhasa crossed it was in the neighborhood of twelve thousand feet. From there, as far as Pimakochung, we knew that there was no very great loss in altitude. But when the Brahmaputra appeared in the Abor foothills, it was only between one thousand and two thousand feet above the sea. The stretch of unknown course was perhaps two hundred miles, and in that section the rivers broke through the main range of the Himalaya it was possible nay it was probable that somewhere in those gorges which kintha had thought impassable lay hidden the most tremendous waterfall in the world the secret of the brahmaputra gorges was one of the topics that most fascinated geographers between the years nineteen o four and nineteen thirteen in that latter year the mystery was solved and the ignotum proved not to be the magnificum this is the story of the solution 
the course of the brahmaputra through assam is roughly from northeast to southwest but at a place called sadia the main stream there known as the daihong turns sharply to the north at that point too it receives an important tributary on its left bank called the daibong during the winter of nineteen twelve to nineteen thirteen captain f m bailey an officer of the indian political service was employed by the government to survey the daibong basin while another party had gone through the abar country to survey the daihong early in nineteen thirteen captain bailey and captain morshead of the royal engineers collected what stores they could and started off from the village of mipi on the upper waters of the daibong their aim was to cross into the daihang valley and to follow the river upstream to the tibetan plateau captain bailey had been with the lhasa expedition and had a long record of exploration in different parts of tibet so he had all the qualifications needed by the pioneer but his party was imperfectly equipped since it started more or less on the spur of the moment and had had no time to obtain proper stores from india he trusted to the prestige won by the abor expedition and his experience of the ways of the tibetans to furnish him with coolies and local supplies the reader's attention is now prayed for the map the first business was to cross the high passes separating the daibang from the daihang the weather proved abominable and for part of the route only half rations could be issued as they descended into the valley of the daihang they found once more cultivation and villages and they were able to supplement their stores by shooting game especially pheasants which teemed by the roadside it was necessary to establish touch with the abor survey party lower down the river and accordingly they had to halt for some days at a place called kapu they managed to take the altitude in the river bed and found the height above sea level to be two thousand six hundred and ten feet an important result for they were able to take no other observation at water level below the main gorges these foothills of the himalaya were inhabited chiefly by savage tribes akin to the abors who were known generically as lopas but as the expedition advanced up the river they came to the country of the pobas who were under tibetan influence at lagung which is about the centre of the hairpin bend the course of the river turned west it might have been possible for them to have followed it some thirty miles farther but they were pressed by a poba official with whom they made friends to go northeast into the absolutely unknown country of pome which would enable them to make a circuit and reach Djala at the head of the gorges. Captain Bailey considered that it would be easier to explore the gorges by going downstream. On the 21st of June, they crossed a pass of over 13,000 feet into the valley of the river known as the Po Tsang Po, an affluent of the Brahmaputra. It was a stream 80 yards wide and of such rapidity that its current was one whirl of foam the natives were in great fear of the chinese and it was necessary to go boldly to showa the capital where a letter could be received from the abor survey party vouching for their respectability the chinese had burned the place killed the chief and decapitated the council and the inhabitants looked askance at the travellers because of the chinese writing on a tablet of indian ink which they carried after three days however a letter arrived from the abor party which persuaded them that captain bailey and captain morshead were at any rate servants of the english king the explorers now moved northeastwards down the po tsang po finding great difficulty in crossing the tributaries where the bridges had mostly been destroyed it was a beautiful land bright with primula iris and blue poppy and the roads were lined with raspberries they were now leaving the pome country and traveling among a more civilized type of tibetan who wore hats like clergymen made out of yak's hair after crossing a pass of over fifteen thousand feet they returned to the main stream of the tsang po this country was under the charge of tsong pen of tsela who came to meet the travelers an urbane gentleman whose son was at rugby and a promising cricketer they were now on the tsang po above the mysterious gorges 
they had left behind them the hot valleys of the lower stream and found a dry tibetan dale where the chief crops were barley and buckwheat the river was broad and slow at one point stretching into a lake six hundred yards wide and its altitude was nine thousand six hundred eighty feet the problem was now to follow it down from that point to the point of their last observation where the altitude was only two thousand six hundred and ten feet somewhere in the intervening tract of gorge it must make the enormous descent of over seven thousand feet the first stage was the twenty two miles down to giala which had been visited in eighteen seventy eight the stream was in flood owing to melting snows and the waterside track was difficult four days march below giala they reached pimacochang the limit of kinthrop's exploration so far they had passed various small rapids but nothing in the nature of a fall a mile below pimacochang they came on kinthrop's cascade it proved to be only some thirty feet high and not vertical the road now became extraordinarily intricate great spurs ran down to the river and blocked the glen and it was necessary to cut paths through dense forest and thickets of rhododendron to surmount them there was no track of any kind and the tributaries descending from the adjacent glaciers were often hard to cross they ran short of food and could get no reliable information as to the possibility of their descending the stream captain morshead and the coolies accordingly returned to gala and captain bailey with one man and fifteen pounds of flour attempted to descend the tsang po by the route which a party of monbas was said to have recently taken he found the monbas but they were wild and suspicious and far from helpful they refused to take him to their village and declined to show him the road around the difficult cliffs apparently they considered that a traveller who had only one servant and who carried most of his baggage himself must be a person of small importance and not worth troubling about he managed however to pick up from them certain news about the lower valley he returned to giala and rejoined captain morshead and they proceeded to piece their knowledge together at giala a small stream drops from the cliffs making a waterfall in which the god shing chi chogya is concealed the image of the deity is carved or painted in the rock behind the fall but it is only possible to see it in winter when there is little water this apparently was kinthrop's fall of a hundred and fifty feet now why should so meagre a natural feature have attained such celebrity among the tibetans for the fame of it has spread far and wide over the country the reason seems to be that it is unique because there are no other high falls had this deduction been made from kinthrop's evidence the mystery of the brahmaputra gorges would have been solved long ago the travellers collected their observations on the altitude of the river level and the speed of the current at pei where they first struck the tsang po the height was nine thousand six hundred and eighty feet thirty four miles below it the river level was eight thousand seven hundred and thirty feet giving a drop of twenty eight feet to the mile at pimacochang the altitude was eighty three eighty feet and the drop twenty four feet a mile three miles farther down the altitude was eight thousand ninety giving a drop of ninety seven feet a mile which included the thirty feet drop of kinthrop's fall at the lowest point captain bailey reached in the river bed the altitude was seven thousand four hundred eighty feet giving a drop of forty eight feet to the mile the next point on the river which they had visited was lagung below the gorges where they could not take an observation in the river bed but forty five miles downstream the altitude was two thousand six hundred and ten feet there remained therefore some fifty miles of gorge which had not been and could not be explored and the information about it was only indirect from lagung upstream to where the po tsang po joined the tsang po lay a stretch which many natives had visited the altitude of the junction was estimated at five thousand seven hundred feet which would give a drop of three thousand ninety feet in the seventy-five miles down to their observation of two thousand six hundred and ten feet a fall of some forty-one feet per mile here there was clearly no waterfall 
from the junction of the two streams to the point where captain bailey turned back was not more than twenty miles and the drop one thousand seven hundred and eighty feet giving a fall of eighty nine feet a mile the monbos whom he had met told him that they had hunted on the right bank of the stream throughout this unknown stretch and that though there were many rapids there were no big cascades we are not concerned with the rest of the journey of captain bailey and captain moorshead which took them upstream to tsitang where nain singh had gone in eighteen seventy four and back to india by the wild country of the bhutan border their evidence may be considered to have finally solved the riddle of how the great river breaks through the highest range on the globe it does it by means of hundreds of miles of marvelous gorges where the stream foams in rapids but there is no fall more considerable than can be found in many a scottish salmon river i am not sure that the reality is not more impressive than the romantic expectation the mighty current is not tossed in spray over great cliffs but during the eons it has bitten a deep trough through that formidable rock wall curiously enough the rivers which break through the himalaya chose the highest parts of the range through which to cut south of pimacochung is the great peak of namchabarwa twenty five thousand four hundred forty five feet high north of it is the peak of giala twenty three thousand four hundred and sixty feet the distance between these mountains is only some fourteen miles and through this gap at an altitude of just under nine thousand feet flows the great river end of chapter two chapter three the north pole part one when skeptical people say that polar exploration has been of no benefit to mankind it is permissible to think that their judgment is as unsound as their point of view is limited not only have polar explorers added enormously to the scientific knowledge of the world but they have also materially aided commerce but even if these voyages had been barren of scientific and commercial results they would have been infinitely worth making for among polar explorers are many men who must be universally regarded as heroes no training was more rigorous and dangerous no work has ever called for more endurance resource and courage a nation which is without its heroes is in a sad plight a nation which has them and ignores their example can only be looked upon with pity the spirit of high adventure is one that no country can afford to neglect the history of geographical discovery is in its initial stages almost solely one of conquest men either for their own or their country's profit and sometimes for both went out in search of unknown lands because they wanted to trade with them pythias who has been described as one of the most intrepid explorers the world has ever seen was the first man to bring news of the arctic regions to the civilized world he did not pretend to have visited them but in or about three thirty b c he set out from marseilles and journeyed north during this voyage which must have lasted for several years he visited britain and then proceeding to the most northerly point of the british isles he heard of an arctic land called thule which at one time of the year enjoyed perpetual day and at another had to endure perpetual night with a leap over a few hundred years we come to ptolemy whose influence on geography was almost paramount from the second century to comparatively modern times no one is more dangerous than a bad cartographer or more valuable than a good one but although ptolemy made many mistakes he also did such splendid work that it is quite easy to forget them to him we owe the names of latitude and longitude and it has been well said of him that he held the extraordinary distinction of being the greatest authority on astronomy and geography for over fifteen hundred years ptolemy's work may have required to be corrected and amplified but at least he gave the world something which was worthy of correction 
in the eighth and ninth centuries norsemen became terrors in europe Harold of the Fair Hair reigned from 860 to 930 A.D., and these 70 years formed a period of great adventure. During Harold's reign, the Norsemen colonized Iceland, and in 983, Eric the Red founded a colony in Greenland, which flourished until the Norwegians ceased to take an interest in it. Not until the 15th century did English seamen begin to turn their attention to the north they were more or less forced to do so. Portugal and Spain were all powerful in the east and west, and so England began earnestly to think of discovering a way to Cathay and the Spice Islands by a northern route. But if we were a little slow in beginning to pay attention to the Arctic regions, we have every cause to be satisfied with our work after we had once begun it. The 15th century saw considerable activity as regards Scandinavia, but it was not until 1505 that a charter was granted to the Company of Merchant Adventurers, and from that year we can date our real interest in Arctic discovery. It is well, perhaps, to bear in mind, while thinking of polar exploration, that there is a marked difference between the two polar regions. The Arctic is an ocean surrounded by continental lands. The Antarctic is a continental land surrounded by oceans. In 1553, Sir Hugh Willoughby set out to try and find a northeast passage to the Indies. On this voyage, in which Willoughby lost his life, Novia Zemla was discovered, and Richard Chancellor, who took part in the expedition, reached Archangel and then, traveling overland to Moscow, was received graciously by Ivan the Terrible, the Tsar of Russia. This visit was of importance because it helped to establish trade between England and Russia. Competition to find a route northwards to China and the Indies had by this time become acute in Europe, and many bold navigators set out from England. Among the sailors who were maintaining her high record on the seas, Sir Martin Frobisher deserves especially to be mentioned. In 1576, he set out, cheered doubtless by knowing that Queen Elizabeth had a good liking of their doings, to find a northwest passage. On three occasions, Frobisher voyaged northwards, and he reached Greenland and discovered the strait that was named after him. He is not worthy, Sir Humphrey Gilbert wrote in the latter part of the 16th century, to live at all who, for fear of danger or death, shunneth his country's service or his own honor, since death is inevitable and the fame of virtue immortal. Most assuredly, our Elizabethan sailors did not shun their country's service, and Elizabeth herself was the first to appreciate and encourage their enterprise. In 1585, yet another distinguished explorer, John Davis, embarked upon his career, and during his voyages, he made discoveries that converted the Arctic region from a confused myth into a defined area. He found several passages toward the west, and thus strengthened the hope of finding a northwest passage. And he also reached the farthest north, 72 degrees, 12 minutes north, some 1,100 miles from the geographical North Pole. As yet, no one had turned his thoughts to the North Pole itself, but it may truly be said that Davis and men of his caliber were already beginning to prepare the way for the time when it would be reached. For his discoveries, like those of many of the earlier explorers, were both important in themselves and also act as a guide and incentive to those who followed. In the meantime, Davis had obtained the record for the farthest north, a record which Great Britain, with the exception of a very few years, continued to hold until 1882. Many English navigators did great work in maintaining this record, and among them was Henry Hudson, who set out in 1607 with the object of finding a northwest passage to the Indies. Hudson, in this voyage, reached 80 degrees north and did most valuable work in the Spitsbergen quadrant. It is also reported that two of his men saw a mermaid, which may at least be taken as evidence that they were more than ordinarily observant. 
both geographically and commercially hudson's voyages were of the first importance he not only made many discoveries including that to the river which bears his name but he also brought back the news that led directly to the establishment of the spitzbergen whale fishery an industry that was extremely lucrative to holland in sixteen fifteen william baffin discovered the land that is called after him and then for some time english discovery in the arctic regions ceased to be noteworthy baffin made no less than five voyages to the north and scientifically his observations were permanently valuable to subsequent explorers apart from geographical discovery these arctic voyages had so far been a great stimulant to trade in greenland davis strait and the spitzbergen seas trade had followed discovery and what had happened in those parts of the arctic also took place in hudson's bay after the hudson's bay company was formed in sixteen sixty eight in fact for the time being the desire to make geographical discoveries was almost obliterated by the desire to trade it is however pleasant to note that during the eighteenth century some of our governments took an intelligent interest in the geographical discovery they offered a reward of five thousand pounds for reaching eighty nine degrees north and twenty thousand pounds was offered to anyone who could find the northwest passage in the earlier part of the eighteenth century the part that the russians took in arctic discovery must not be omitted in seventeen twenty eight peter the great sent out an expedition under the command of vitus bering a dane in which bering strait and other discoveries were made and although it is impossible to mention them in detail the contributions that the russians made in revealing the new world to the old were most creditable to them as a nation in seventeen seventy three captain phipps conducted an expedition which now derives its chief interest from the fact that horatio nelson then a young midshipman took part in it great says sir clement smarkham as are the commercial advantages obtained from arctic discovery and still greater as are its scientific results the most important of all are its uses as a nursery for our seamen as a school for our future nelsons and as affording the best opportunities for distinction to young naval officers in time of peace and it is incontestably true that many of our finest sailors have learnt their trade in the severe school of the geographical exploration with the advent of the nineteenth century many expeditions were sent to the far north the desire actually to reach the north pole itself did not enter the thoughts of these courageous navigators the main object of their voyages being either to find the northwest passage around north america to the indies or the northeast passage around asia nevertheless each one of these voyages added to the store of knowledge that was being accumulated each expedition solved some of the mysteries of the north and prepared the way for the solution of what came to be considered the greatest mystery of all in eighteen nineteen sir edward perry embarked upon the first of the arctic voyages which have made his name famous in the annals of exploration a sailor by profession perry was happy in possessing the qualities that fitted him to lead men during his first expedition the prize offered by the english government to the first navigator who passed the hundred and tenth meridian was won perry and his party spent a winter in the arctic a winter which thanks to their leader's careful preparations was passed without mishap and then when the winter was over an expedition to explore the interior of melville island was made thus arctic traveling was inaugurated by perry other successful voyages under the same leadership followed and when in eighteen twenty seven our admiralty began favorably to consider the idea of getting as near as possible to the pole by way of spitzbergen perry was naturally chosen to command the expedition so for the fourth time perry sailed northwards and having reached the north coast of spitzbergen he found a good harbor for his ship the hecla and left her there the explorers had taken specially fitted boats with them and these they hoped to be able to haul over the ice 
the summer however had begun to break up the flows and in consequence the travellers had constantly to take the steel runners off the boats so that stretches of open water could be crossed moreover the flows they did find seemed to resent such treatment for most of them were small and bestrewn with most obstructive hummocks not until they had been pulling and hauling for nearly a month did they meet with large flows and by that time the southerly drift of the ice was in full swing however hard perry and his men pulled they found that the drift was as strong as they were or stronger after terrific labor perry reached eighty two degrees forty five minutes a higher latitude than any reached during the next fifty years it was a great attempt by a man whose devotion to his duty is beyond all praise before we come to the most tragic story in the history of arctic exploration reference must be made to the discoveries of captain john ross in his first expedition to the north captain ross was not successful but in his second voyage when he was accompanied by his nephew james c ross who afterwards gained distinction in the antarctic the magnetic north pole was discovered and the british flag fixed there in seventy degrees five minutes seventeen seconds north and seventy six degrees sixteen minutes four seconds west ross's expedition spent four consecutive winters in the far north discovered over two hundred miles of coastline and returned with a bountiful crop of scientific knowledge we may well admire the love of adventure and the desire to make geographical and scientific discoveries which induce these constant expeditions to parts of the world that cannot possibly be called inviting honor was and is due to the man who undertook them but to john franklin's memory a special honor is paid for his name is connected with both heroism and tragedy. As a boy, Franklin, in spite of his father's opposition, determined to be a sailor. At the age of fourteen, he was in the Polyphemus at the Battle of Copenhagen, and subsequently he was present at the Battle of Trafalgar. Peace, then as always, brought unemployment for sailors with it, and at the age of twenty-nine, franklin found himself unwanted in the navy when however the admiralty decided in eighteen eighteen to send expeditions to find the north pole and the northwest passage franklin was chosen to command the trent this ship was totally unsuited for such a task and owing to official economy not to say parsimony franklin had to return without achieving any success in the following year he was again sent out with orders to explore the northern coast of arctic america and the trending of that coast from the mouth of the copper mine eastwards not until eighteen twenty two did this expedition of discovery come to a close after five thousand five hundred and fifty miles had been covered by water and land the tale of its adventures extraordinary as they were is only the preface to franklin's life as an explorer so famous indeed was he that when in eighteen forty four he returned from tasmania where he had been governor for seven years he was offered the command of an important arctic expedition at this time he was nearly sixty years old but he was anxious to resume his exploratory work and in eighteen forty five he sailed with the erebus and the terror ships that had already won their laurels under sir james ross in the antarctic in the hope of finding the northwest passage so much coveted and so long concealed franklin was instructed to try a route by wellington channel if ice did not block the way the channel was found to be clear and the explorers made their way up it until they reached seventy seven degrees north then their advance was blocked by ice and they turned south and found winter quarters off beachy island all so far had gone well and when the ships were released from the ice at the end of the winter hopes for further successes must have run high but presently a mistake was made that had fatal results a mistake due to an error of the chart makers for some time the ships sailed gaily on important discoveries being made from day to day then came the fatal decision all was open to the south 
if they had continued on their southerly course the two ships would have reached the bering strait there was the navigable passage before them but alas the chart makers had drawn an isthmus which only existed in their imagination connecting boothia with king william land so they altered their course to the west and were lost soon the ships were surrounded by a dense ice pack and were dangerously imprisoned in the spring of eighteen forty seven travelling parties were sent out and one of them under graham gore's command discovered a northwest passage and consequently proved the connection between the atlantic and the pacific oceans when the parties returned franklin was seriously ill and he died on the eleventh of june eighteen forty seven no more beautiful epitaph has ever been written than the one in westminster abbey which tennyson wrote in honor of john franklin his uncle-in-law not here the cold north hath thy bones and thou heroic sailor soul are passing on thy happier voyage now towards no earthly pole a terrible winter for this gallant band of explorers followed for months and months the ice remained impenetrable and at last the ships had to be abandoned even if the erebus and the terror could have been freed from the ice it was more than doubtful if they would float so battered were they by their long slow drift food was both inadequate in quantity and poisonous in quality twenty-two officers and men died during that winter of horror the rest were so weak from privations that although they knew their only chance was to retreat by Bax fish river none of them had the strength successfully to undertake such a march it is useless to dwell over the sufferings of these heroic men captain crozier and captain fitzjames took every precaution and made all preparations that were under the circumstances possible but the dice were too heavily loaded against them with their two heavy boat sledges they started on the twenty second of april eighteen forty eight to make their desperate effort not one of them survived the erebus sank when the ice released her the terror also sank but not until she had drifted on to the american coast and been plundered by eskimos it is pitiable to think that prompt action from england might have saved some at least of these valuable lives but at first although there was considerable anxiety about their fate no effort was made to find them not until eighteen forty eight were expeditions sent out in search of franklin's party and neither of these was successful in finding any traces one of these expeditions was however noteworthy for leopold mcclintock who subsequently became so renowned as a sledge traveller took part in it by 1850 the whole country had become thoroughly aroused and the government decided to send out strongly equipped expeditions the enterprise and the investigator under captains collinson and mcclure were sent out to search by way of bering strait and four ships under captain austin were to seek for traces of the missing party by way of lancaster sound austin's expedition failed to find the missing men but it was excellently conducted and organized and its sledge travelers among whom was mcclintock covered over seven thousand miles and discovered more than one thousand two hundred miles of new land when captain austin returned to england nothing had been heard of the enterprise and the investigator and after some discussion and consequent delay it was resolved again to send the four ships to the arctic not only franklin's men but also the enterprise and the investigator had now to be searched for it was a case of search parties looking for search parties in their main object that of clearing up the mystery of franklin and his companions these expeditions were not successful but in other ways they more than justified themselves both collinson in the enterprise and mcclure in the investigator succeeded in finding a northwest passage and much needed help was brought to mcclure by the expedition sent out partly for the purpose of aiding him and collinson further the sledge journeys of mcclintock and meacham during these expeditions were unrivalled in result 
and a real triumph of organization. Owing to the outbreak of the Crimean War in 1854, popular interest in the fate of the Franklin expedition diminished, but Lady Franklin remained loyal to the object to which so many years of her life had been dedicated. And after the government had refused to assist her further, she decided to fit out a private expedition of which Captain McClintock took command. In June 1857, the Fox, a steam yacht of 177 tons, started on her voyage to Greenland, but on reaching Melville Sound, McClintock found it extraordinarily packed with ice. The little vessel was firmly imprisoned and had to spend the winter in the drifting pack. During eight months, she drifted southward for nearly 1,200 geographical miles, and she was not liberated from her prison until April 1858. After such an experience, many leaders would have made for a port in which to refit. But McClintock was of a different temper. No sooner had the fox freed herself from her perilous position than he turned her head towards the north and once more took up the work that he had been sent out to do. And this determination to concentrate at all costs on the definite object in hand ultimately met with its sad reward. In June 1859, it was proved beyond any doubt that the report of the Eskimos, which had been received in England in 1854, to the effect that they had seen the dead bodies of several of Franklin's men, was true. All the coastline along which the retreating crews performed their fearful march must, McClintock wrote, be sacred to their names alone. Among the many feats that McClintock and his men performed during this last search were a march round King William Island, the discovery of the one navigable northwest passage, and the discovery of some 800 miles of new coastline. As far as geographical discovery was concerned, the main result of the many expeditions sent out in search of Franklin was that the islands to the north of North America had been mapped out. In 1853, an American expedition, under Elisha Kane, which was sent out in search of Franklin, to the north of Smith Sound, was fruitful in geographical discovery, and outlined what had been called the American route to the Pole. Interest in the Smith Sound route began to grow in England, and was stimulated by another American expedition, led by Charles Hall in 1871. But although the desire to undertake more Arctic research was strongly felt by many Englishmen, it cannot be said that it was encouraged in official circles. In 1872, Mr. Lowe and Mr. Goshen did receive a deputation of Arctic enthusiasts, but were by no means encouraging in their replies. An expedition, however, under Commander Albert Markham, sent out in 1873 and succeeded in capturing 28 whales, which were worth nearly 19,000 pounds, and the result of this voyage was to stimulate the idea of further Arctic enterprise. In November 1874, Lord Beaconsfield, who was at the time Prime Minister, announced that an Arctic expedition to encourage maritime enterprise and to explore the regions around the Pole would be sent out. Sir Clements Markham and other Arctic enthusiasts in England were delighted with this announcement, but their delight was short-lived. These enthusiasts had for years been advocating that exploratory work should be undertaken in the region round the Pole, but they did not consider that a mere rush to the Pole should be undertaken until, at any rate, work of more value to mankind had been done. The conduct of the projected expedition was taken over by the Admiralty, and great was the consternation of Sir Clements and his friends when it was announced that the main object of the expedition was to attain the highest latitude and, if possible, to reach the North Pole. However displeasing such an object was to these enthusiasts, they could not but rejoice at the interest shown in their expedition and in the fact that Captain Nares was appointed to command it. At the end of May, 1875, the ship sailed from Portsmouth 
and on arriving in the Arctic regions, Nares had to bear in mind his definite instructions. In short, exploratory work was to give way to an effort to reach, if possible, the pole itself. But, anxious as he was to carry out his orders, one terrible scourge stood in his way. Scurvy, that deadly disease, attacked his party during the winter and nearly half his men suffered from it. Under such conditions, he was severely handicapped. But he decided to send out three sledge parties, eastward, westward, and to the north. Lieutenant Pelham Aldrich was in charge of the western party, and although most of the sledge crew were weakened by scurvy, they marched over 600 miles and succeeded in reaching 82 degrees 48 minutes north, a few miles farther north than Perry had reached some 50 years previously. In 1882, an American expedition under Lieutenant Greeley, though terribly unfortunate in some respects, was successful in wresting the record for farthest north from the British. We must turn aside for a moment from these efforts to get farther and farther north to mention the exploits of that distinguished Swedish explorer, Adolf Erik Nordenskjold. As early as 1873, Nordenskjold began to think that the northeast passage by the Siberian coast might, when found, prove to be of great commercial value, and after some preliminary expeditions, he, in 1878, set out in the Vega on his great voyage, and in August the ship passed Cape Chelyuskin, the most northerly point of the Old World. By September, however, the Vega, when very near to the completion of her task, was so surrounded by ice that she could proceed no farther, and for ten months she was held a prisoner. Not until the following July was the Vega free to resume her voyage, and shortly afterwards she rounded East Cape and saluted the easternmost coast of Asia in honor of the completing of the Northeast Passage. Nordenskiel, both as an explorer and as a man of science, has left the world greatly in his debt, and it has been well said that when he died, a vast amount of knowledge died with him. Nordenskjold's name, like Fritjof Nansen's, is intimately connected with exploratory work in Greenland. Nansen was born in 1861, and he was only 27 years of age when his devotion to discovery led him to make an expedition on lines that were as courageous as they were original. Up to this date, 1888, the recognized method employed in polar exploratory work had been to establish a base where stores were placed, and from this base to march as far as possible in various directions. But when Nansen determined to cross Greenland from east to west, he paid no attention to recognized methods. With five companions, he, in June 1888, was taken in the Jason to the ice's edge on the east coast of Greenland, and there the explorers, hoping shortly to reach land, took to their boats. Some time, however, passed before they could make a landing, but eventually a suitable place was found, and then they began their great march. With no base to which they could return, the party had literally taken their lives into their hands, for failure almost certainly meant death. Starting on the 22nd of August, the party, four days later, had mounted to a height of 6,000 feet, and by the middle of September had reached the summit, 8,250 feet. Eventually, the explorers managed to reach the Danish settlement at Godthab, and in the following year returned to Norway. It was a fine effort, fruitful alike in geographical discovery and in meteorological results and, famous as Nansen's name subsequently and deservedly became, by no means his least claim to the honor is derived from this great march across Greenland. Between 1892 and 1895, the American Lieutenant Peary, using dogs for purposes of traction, made two successful marches across Greenland, and so prepared himself for the attacks on the North Pole itself attacks which he was ultimately to bring to a successful conclusion. 
The date 1893 will always be renowned in the history of Arctic exploration, for during that year, Nansen embarked upon his remarkable voyage in his no less remarkable ship, the Fram. From careful observations and investigations, Nansen was convinced that there was a continuous drift of ice from the northeast shore of Siberia across the Arctic Ocean. Hitherto, Arctic explorers had struggled hard to avoid being beset by ice. Far from following in their wake, it was Nansen's plan to get his vessel frozen in the pack and then to drift toward the pole. It would be untruthful to say that his plan was encouraged by the majority of Arctic experts, but Nansen was not the man to be dissuaded from any project which, after consideration, he had taken in hand. For such a voyage, an especially constructed ship was necessary, and so Mr. Colin Archer was instructed to build a vessel specially designed to resist ice pressure. The main object of Nansen and Archer was that she should slip like an eel out of the embraces of the ice. Nansen calculated that the drift would take about three years, and he provisioned the Fram for five years. On this historic voyage, Nansen was accompanied by twelve other adventurous men. Sailing from Norway in July 1893, the Kara Sea was crossed, and early in September, Cape Chelyuskin was rounded. About a fortnight later, the ship was frozen in, and the great drift began. During the next months, the Fram was given ample opportunity to prove her worth, and she seized it nobly. In October, great pressure from the ice was experienced, but both then and later the ship resisted and rose to the pressure. During her first year in the ice, the Fram drifted a distance of 189 miles. During the second winter, Nansen, taking Frederick Johansen with him and leaving Otto Sverdrup in charge of the ship, decided to leave the Fram and try to reach the Pole. A start was made in March 1895, and in less than a month, 86 degrees 28 minutes north was reached. At that point, the explorers had to turn south, and after many perilous adventures, they landed at the end of August on an island of the Franz Josef group. There they decided to winter, and there they had to remain for nine long months. When at last they were able to proceed, a grave disaster was only prevented by Nansen's promptitude and courage. The explorers were on shore when Johnson noticed that their kayaks, Eskimo canoes of light wooden framework covered with sealskins, were adrift. The loss of these boats could scarcely have meant less than death to the explorers, and Nansen immediately jumped into the icy water and swam to retrieve them. It was an action as prompt as it was heroic, and it saved the situation. But Nansen's condition, when he brought back the kayaks to land, has been described as more dead than alive, and some time passed before he fully recovered from the results of his effort. Some weeks later, the kayaks were once more made as seaworthy as was possible under the circumstances, and Nansen and Johansen were again embarking on their adventurous voyage, when, by good fortune, they were frowned by Frederick Jackson, the leader of the Jackson-Harmsworth expedition, which did such good work in Franz Joseph land. This meeting between Nansen and Jackson has been compared with the famous one between Livingstone and Stanley, and even if the latter was the more dramatic, the former was as opportune for there is no gainsaying that Nansen and his companion were in a most perilous position. In the meantime, the drift of the Fram under Sverdrup's able leadership continued, and she did not return to Norway until August 1896. The results of the Fram expedition were exceptionally important. They threw, Sir Clements Markham wrote, new light on the whole Arctic problem. Nansen lifted the veil, and his expedition was the most important in modern times. It was discovered that there was a deep-sea ocean to the north of Spitsbergen at Franz Josef Land, extending beyond the Pole. 
in eighteen ninety seven the meeting was held in the albert hall in honor of nansen whose work both geographically and scientifically more than deserved the great welcome given to him in england in an introduction to his in the northern mists arctic exploration in early times nansen quotes words from the old norse chronicle the king's mirror that are curiously illuminating Quote, if you wish to know what men seek in this land the arctic regions or why men journey thither in so great danger of their lives it is the threefold nature of man that draws him thither one part of him is emulation and desire of fame for it is man's nature to go where there is a likelihood of great danger and to make himself famous thereby another part is the desire of knowledge for it is man's nature to wish to know and see those parts of which he has heard and to find out whether they are as it was told him or not the third part is the desire of gain seeing that men seek after riches in every place where they learn that profit is to be had even though there is great danger in it and indeed it may well be admitted that the factors which have helped to make the modern world are mainly a desire for fame a desire for knowledge and a desire for riches and woe betide the nation that forgets the first and second of these factors and loses its soul in concentration upon the last of them end of chapter three part one chapter three the north pole part two during the years succeeding nansen's expedition the desire to reach the north pole itself took possession of the minds of many brave men bit by bit the arctic regions had been mapped out gradually the obstacles that maintained the pole and its splendid isolation were being overcome some years were to pass before its mysteries were unveiled but in those years there was an almost continuous effort to probe those mysteries nansen had discovered beyond any doubt that the pole lay in an ice-covered sea an inhospitable place enough but this fact did not prevent explorers from wanting to actually locate it and in nineteen hundred the duke of the abruzzi tried to reach it by way of franz joseph land owing to a frost-bitten hand the duke could not take part in the main journey of his expedition and so captain cagney commanded it the pole withstood this effort but cagney did succeed in reaching eighty six degrees thirty three minutes north and thus beat nansen's record for farthest north previous to the abruzzi expedition robert peary had launched his first great attack upon the pole this expedition lasted for four years eighteen ninety eight to nineteen o two but peary encountered such dense packs of ice which blocked his way to the polar ocean that he failed in his main object another attempt followed in nineteen o six and although this was not crowned with complete success peary made a world's record for farthest north by reaching eighty seven degrees six minutes in this expedition he nearly lost his life but he returned to america with a grim determination to make yet another attempt experience had been bought by perry in abundance and at a great cost and to this was added an energy that was remarkable even among polar explorers this third voyage to the polar regions had in the nature of things to be his last he was when he set out upon it fifty-three years of age and although after spending over twenty years in arctic work he had an experience that was invaluable even experience cannot make an arctic explorer forget that youth is also a great asset in the polar regions in may nineteen o eight peary published his program the main features of which are worthy of record he decided to use the same ship the roosevelt which had taken him to the north in his nineteen o six expedition his route was to be by way of smith sound his winter quarters were to be at cape sheridan or even nearer to the pole if the ship could proceed farther 
he intended to use sledges and eskimo dogs for traction and lastly he placed his confidence in eskimos the arctic highlanders as the rank and file of his sledge parties most careful preparations were made for this expedition and while peary was making them he received much practical support but also some suggestions that were not notably helpful for instance one cheerful crank invited him to become a human cannonball some sort of machine was to be taken to the north and then when it was pointed towards the pole the inventor assured peary that it would shoot him there in no time the explorer did not see his way to accepting such an abrupt means of transit when the roosevelt sailed on seventeenth july nineteen o eight she had twenty-two men on board including peary himself robert bartlett master of the roosevelt george wardwell dr goodsell professor marvin donald mcmillan george borup and matthew henson peary's negro assistant who had accompanied him on many expeditions when Perry's vast knowledge of the polar regions is remembered, his remarks on the essentials required in an Arctic sledge journey must admittedly be valuable. The essentials, and only the essentials, he writes, needed in a serious Arctic sledge journey, no matter what the season, the temperature, or the duration of the journey, whether one month or six, are four. Pemmican, tea, ship's biscuit, condensed milk and it is interesting to note that of these commodities he took fifty thousand pounds of pemmican ten thousand pounds of biscuit eight hundred pounds of tea and one hundred cases of condensed milk on this expedition the roosevelt reached cape york greenland on the first of august and there she said a temporary good-bye to the civilized world there also perry met with eskimos whose friendship he had gained by many and continuous acts of kindness the eskimos are within their limits a lovable and loyal people their good qualities are those of nice children their bad qualities those of mischievous children i have made it a point perry says to be firm with them but to rule them by love and gratitude rather than by fear and threats an Eskimo, like an Indian, never forgets a broken promise, nor a fulfilled one. These Eskimos live on the verge of starvation for many months in the year, but if they are not troubled by questions of morality in one sense of the word, they are at any rate ready to share what they have got in the way of food, or of means to obtain it, with those who are less fortunate than themselves religion as we understand it does not enter into their scheme of things but they pay studious attention to spirits especially to tornarsuk who is the devil himself and consequently leader of all evil spirits one can appreciate the childlikeness of people who will rip an old garment to shreds so that the devil may be prevented from wearing it after leaving cape york Perry transferred himself for some days to the Eric, his auxiliary supply steamer, so that he could collect as many Eskimos and dogs as he required. By the 11th of August, the Eric reached Etta and joined the Roosevelt. Finally, Perry selected 49 Eskimos and 246 dogs, and having transferred them to the Roosevelt, the explorers set out to fight their way through 350 miles of ice-blocked water that separated Eta from Cape Sheridan. And the ice during that journey was in no gentle mood. So great were the risks that the ship might at any time be crushed that the boats fully equipped and provisioned were always ready to be lowered at a moment's notice. A terrific battle with that uncompromising opponent, the ice, followed, but not until 30th August did the struggle reach its climax on that day the ship was kicked about by flows as if she had been a football and the pressure was so terrific that peary decided to dynamite the ice this operation was successful in relieving the situation but some days passed before even the greatest optimist in the ship could consider her free from danger but on the fifth of september the roosevelt managed to fight her way through to cape sheridan and after a project to take her on to porter bay had been abandoned 
the work of unloading her was begun and with her lighter load captain bartlett proceeded to get her as near the shore as possible the first stage on the way to the pole was behind the explorers and if the next stage was shorter in distance it was no less important a part of the whole scheme this second stage consisted of the transportation of supplies from cape sheridan to cape columbia ninety miles northwest of the ship cape columbia is the most northerly point of grand land and from there peary had determined to make his dash over the ice to the pole but to move an enormous quantity of supplies over such a distance was work that needed much thought and care for in the first place some of perry's companions were unused to driving sledges and secondly neither the weather nor the track were likely to give them much assistance these sledging parties on the way to cape columbia were soon organized and in addition hunting parties were sent out and a supply of fresh meat for the winter was obtained imagine us perry wrote in our winter home on the roosevelt the ship held tight in her icy berth a hundred and fifty yards from the shore the ship and the surrounding world covered with snow the wind creaking in the rigging whistling and shrieking round the corners of the deck houses the temperatures ranging from zero to sixty below and the ice back in the channel outside groaning and complaining with the movement of the tides in these words peary gives us an excellent picture of the explorer's winter home a home upon which the sun never shone for many months but which in spite of the darkness was a home of unceasing industry and preparation and among the innumerable activities that took place none was more important than the task of attending to the dogs early in november peary had become anxious about these all-important factors of his expedition over fifty of them were dead already and a few days later only one hundred sixty dogs out of the two forty five with which he had arrived were left a change of diet from whale to walrus meat put an end to these appalling losses but peary's anxiety until he discovered a way to prevent them can be easily imagined for without any adequate supply of dogs he knew all too well that neither he nor anyone else would ever reach the pole by the end of the autumn season snow igloos had been built on the track to cape columbia we have the best authority namely perry's for saying that one of these snow houses can be built by four good workmen in an hour into this shelter the traveler literally crawls for the only means of interest is a hole at the bottom of one side and when the last man of the party has got in this opening is closed up by a block of snow already cut for the purpose except for one most alarming experience when in a terrific gale the ice made a stupendous effort against the invading ship the winter was spent rather with anxiety about the future than with worry about the present no wonder that peary speculated over what awaited him when he started on his great march after leaving cape columbia over four hundred miles separated him from his goal and these miles had to be traveled over the ice of the polar sea there is no land he writes between cape columbia and the north pole and no smooth and very little level ice but even ice through which the traveller must sometimes pickaxe his way is not the most serious impediment to those who would reach the pole the great obstacle the ever-present source of anxiety are the leads which constantly appear these leads are really patches of open water varying in extent which the winds and tides cause in the ice movement for no reason that is apparent these dangerous obstacles suddenly block the explorer's advance and little can be done save to wait for them to remove themselves these leads were to be perry's greatest impediment in his march and were destined to be fatal to one valued member of his party the final attack on the pole began on fifteenth of february nineteen o nine when bartlett with a pioneer party left the roosevelt and a week later peary started on his way at this time seven members of the expedition nineteen eskimos one hundred forty dogs and twenty-eight sledges divided into various parties were engaged in the great effort to reach the pole 
it was arranged that all these parties should meet perry at cape columbia on the last day of february and on that day bartlett and borup started from the cape with advance parties the duties of these advance parties were as onerous as they were important for it was to bartlett that perry looked for a trail by which the main party could travel on the second day's march after perry had left cape columbia and the land behind him he met with his first open lead and a slight delay occurred but on the following day his lead was covered with young ice and perry determined to cross it if the reader he wrote will imagine crossing a river on a succession of gigantic shingles one two or three deep and all afloat and moving he will perhaps form an idea of the uncertain surface over which we cross this lead such a passage is distinctly trying as any moment may lose a sledge in its team or plunge a member of the party into the icy water and later on when borup was crossing an open crack his dogs fell into the water and the loss both of dogs and the sledge with its invaluable load of provisions was only prevented by borup's exceptional quickness and strength the explorers had advanced nearly fifty miles from cape columbia when they were held up by a big lead which refused most obstinately to cover itself with ice strong enough to bear the sledges for a week this open water delayed the expedition and Peary had good reason to wonder if his most careful preparation and organization were once more to miss the success that they deserved. On the 11th of March, however, the parties managed to cross the lead, and on the march that followed, they crossed the 84th parallel. When the explorers started on this journey, Peary did not announce how far each one of his companions was to accompany him on the march, and presently Dr. Goodsell and Macmillan, with Eskimos, sledges, and dogs, turned back. Then the main expedition consisted of sixteen men, twelve sledges, and one hundred dogs. On March 19th, Perry revealed the program he intended to follow to Bartlett, Marvin, Borup, and Henson. First of all, Borup was to turn back. Five marches farther on, Marvin was to go and after another five marches, Bartlett was to leave the polar party, which would then consist of six men, forty dogs, and five sledges. Unlike most programs, this one of Peary's was faithfully carried out. Borup returned when 85 degrees 23 minutes was reached, and during the next days the explorers advanced so rapidly that they succeeded in passing both Nansen's and the Duke of the Abruzzi's record for farthest north. In turn, first Bartlett and then Marvin started upon the homeward track, and Perry was left with four Eskimos, Engawa, Siglu, Ota, and Okwea, Henson, five sledges, and forty dogs. Of these Eskimos, Okwea was the only one who had not been in any previous expedition. But all the same, he was the most romantic of the party, because he was intent upon winning the rewards that would enable him to marry the girl of his choice. Glimmering before his eyes, Okuya saw a whaleboat, a rifle, and other prizes which Peary had promised to those who went with him to the farthest point. Not for a moment was there any doubt about Okuya's keenness, for he was spurred on by two of the greatest incentives that any young man can have, a desire to be wealthy and a desire to marry. Left alone with Henson and the Eskimos, Perry still had 133 nautical miles to travel before he reached his goal. This distance he intended to cover in five marches, and provided that the gales would leave him in peace and not open the leads of water, he had every hope of carrying out his intention. Up to this stage in the march, Perry had been whipper in, but in the last stages he led the van and during the concluding stages it must be admitted that fortune smiled upon the travelers true that in this almost breathless rush for the pole leads were not entirely absent but such as were encountered did not seriously delay the marches as however peary got nearer and nearer to the pole the fear that the prize might at the last moment be snatched away from him by an impassable lead was constantly with him 
on the fifth of april the party reached eighty nine degrees twenty five minutes north and were within thirty five miles of the pole so near indeed were they that peary writes by some strange shift of feeling the fear of the leads had fallen from me completely i now felt that success was certain and his confidence was justified on april sixth nineteen o nine peary with his colored assistant matthew henson and the four eskimos reached the pole and there the leader of this successful party wrote the following note ninety degrees north latitude north pole sixth april nineteen o nine i have to-day hoisted the national ensign of the united states of america at this place which my observations indicate to be the north pole axis of the earth and have formally taken possession of the entire region and adjacent for and in the name of the president of the united states of america i leave this record and united states flag in possession robert e peary united states navy the explorers spent thirty hours at the pole and then started upon the long journey back to the coast of grantland by the twenty third of april favored by beautiful weather the party had reached cape columbia so favored indeed had they been that utah remarked on their arrival that the devil is asleep or having trouble with his wife or we should never have come back so easily on that same day peary wrote in his diary i have got the north pole out of my system after twenty-three years of effort hard work disappointments hardships privations more or less suffering and some risks the joy of success tremendous as it was could not but be dimmed by the news that awaited perry on his return to the ship for marvin had lost his life on the return journey in trying to cross some young and treacherous ice and the loss of this gallant and able man illustrates all too sadly the some risks of which perry wrote risks which all explorers in greater or less measure have to run as a conclusion to this chapter of adventure and determined effort the words of that prince of explorers fritjof nansen seem peculiarly appropriate from first to last he wrote the history of polar exploration is a single mighty manifestation of the power of the unknown over the mind of man End of chapter three chapter four the mountains of the moon twenty-four centuries ago a line of estulus egypt nurtured by the snow embodied a geographical theory which descended from heaven knows what early folk wandering aristotle with his mountain of silver from which the nile flowed continued the tradition in literature meantime sabaean arabs trading along the east coast of africa and making expeditions to the interior came back with stories of great inland seas and snow mountains near them what they saw may have been only kilimanjaro and kenya but the popular acceptance of their reports points to the earlier tale linking the snows with the nile valley greek and roman travelers spread the rumor and presently it found its way probably through marinus of tyre into the pages of the geographer ptolemy ptolemy had no doubt about these snows he called them the mountains of the moon and definitely fixed them as the source of the river of egypt for centuries after him the question slumbered and men were too busied with creeds and conquests to think much of that font of the nile which alexander the great saw in his dreams when the exploration of equatoria began in the last century the story revived and the discovery of kenya and kilimanjaro seemed to have settled the matter it was true that these mountains were a long way from the nile watershed but then ptolemy had never enjoyed much of a reputation for accuracy still doubt remained in some minds and explorers kept their eyes open for snow mountains which should actually feed the nile since after all so ancient a tradition had probably some ground of fact speak in eighteen sixty one 
thought he had discovered them in the chain of volcanoes between Lake Kaibu and Lake Albert Edward, but these mountains held no snow. He received a hint, however, which might have led to success, for he heard from the Arabs of Unyamwezi of a strange mountain west of Lake Victoria, seldom visible, covered with white stuff, and so high and steep that no man could ascend it. In 1864, Sir Samuel Baker was within sight of Ruanzori and actually saw dim shapes looming through the haze, to which he gave the name of Blue Mountains. In 1875, Stanley encamped for several days upon the eastern slopes, but he did not realize the greatness of the heights above him. He thought that they were something like Elgon, and he christened them Mount Edwin Arnold, a name happily not continued, but he had no thought of snow or glacier, and he disbelieved the native stories of white stuff on the top. In 1876, Gordon's emissary, Jesse, recorded a strange apparition like snow mountains in the sky, which his men saw, but he seems to have considered it a hallucination. Stranger still, Emin Pasha lived for ten years on Lake Albert and never once saw the range a fact which may partly be explained by his bad eyesight. Runzori keeps its secret well. The mists from the Semliki Valley shroud its base, and only on the clearest days, and for a very little time, can the traveler get such a prospect as Mr. Grogan got on his famous walk from the Cape to Cairo. A purple mass, peak piled upon peak, black streaked with forest, scored with ravine, and ever mounting till her castellated crags shoot their gleaming tops far into the violet heavens. The true discoverer was Stanley, who in 1888 suddenly had a vision of the range from the southwest shore of Lake Albert. Everyone remembers the famous passage, quote, While looking to the southeast and meditating upon the events of the last month, my eyes were directed by a boy to a mountain said to be covered with salt, and I saw a peculiar-shaped cloud of a most beautiful silver color, which assumed the proportions and appearance of a vast mountain covered with snow. Following its form downward, I became struck with the deep blue-black color of its base, and wondered if it portended another tornado. Then, as the sight descended to the gap between the eastern and western plateaus, I became for the first time conscious that what I gazed upon was not the image or semblance of a vast mountain, but the solid substance of a real one, with its summit covered with snow. It now dawned upon me that this must be Ruanzori, which was said to be covered with a white metal or substance believed to be rock, as reported by Cavalli's two slaves." End quote. Stanley had neither the time nor the equipment for mountain expeditions, though to the end of his life, Ruanzori remained for him a center of romance. It was his dear wish, as he told the Royal Geographical Society shortly before his death, that some lover of alpine climbing would take the range in hand and explore it from top to bottom. In 1889, one of his companions, Lieutenant Stairs, made an attempt from the northwest and reached a height of nearly 11,000 feet. Two years later, Dr. Stuhlman, a member of Emmons Expedition, made a bold journey up the Butago Valley on the west, discovered the wonderful mountain vegetation, and nearly reached the snow level. In 1895 came Mr. Scott Elliott, who was primarily a botanist, but who, in spite of a bad malaria, managed to struggle as far as 13,000 feet. Then followed troubles in Uganda, and it was not till 1900 that the work of exploration was resumed. To make the story clear, it is necessary to explain that the range runs practically north and south, and that, at about halfway, it is cut into by two deep valleys, the Mobuku running to the east, and the Butago running to the Semliki on the west. Fort Portal at the northern end is the nearest station, and as from it the eastern side is the more accessible, it was natural that the Mobuku Valley should be chosen as the best means of access. In 1900, Mr. Moore reached its head, 
and ascended the mountain called Kianja to the height of 14,900 feet. He had no sight of the range as a whole, but he believed this to be the highest peak and put the summit at about 16,000 feet. In the same year, Sir Harry Johnson followed this route. He ascended to a height of 14,828 feet on Kianja and saw from the Mobuku Valley a mountain to the north which he named Duwoni. He came to the conclusion that the highest altitude of the range was not under 20,000 feet, and in this view he was followed by other travelers like Mr. Wild, Mr. Grogan, and Major Gibbons, none of whom, however, actually made any ascents of the peak. The first serious mountaineering expedition was made in 1905 by Mr. Douglas Freshfield and Mr. A. L. Mum, who suffered from such appalling weather that they had to give up the attempt. Being experienced mountaineers, however, they reached some valuable conclusions. From the plains, they had a clear view of the tops and ascertained that the mountain called Kianja at the head of the Mobuku Valley was certainly lower than a twin peak snow mountain beyond it to the west. They also placed the extreme height of the range at no more than 18,000 feet. Meanwhile, Lieutenant Barons of the Anglo-German Boundary Commission had made an elaborate triangulation and gave to the twin tops of the highest peak altitudes of 16,625 feet and 16,549 feet, measurements, let it be noted, which were only a few hundred feet out. One other expedition, which occupied the close of the same year and the beginning of 1906, deserves mention. A Mr. A. F. R. Wollaston of the British Museum party found an old ice axe in a hut probably left by Mr. Freshfield, and with a few yards of rotten rope set off with a companion to climb Kianja. He reached a height of 16,379 feet and also climbed a peak to the north, which he believed wrongly to be Duoni, and which now very properly bears his name. The whole performance was a brilliant adventure, and Mr. Wollaston has published the story of his travels in a delightful book. Such was the position when, in April 1906, the Duke of the Abruzzi and his party left Italy to solve once and for all the riddle of the mountains. The Duke was perhaps the greatest of living mountaineers. As a rock climber, his fame has filled the Alps, and no name is more honored at Courmayeur or the Montevert. He had led polar expeditions, and he had made the first ascent of the Alaskan Mount St. Elias. His experience, therefore, had made him not only a climber, but an organizer of mountain travel. It was to this latter accomplishment that he owed his success, for Ruanzori was not so much a climber's as a traveler's problem. The actual mountaineering is not hard, but to travel the long miles from Entebbe to the range, to cut a path through the dense jungles of the valleys, and to carry supplies and scientific apparatus to the high glacier camps required an organizing talent of the first order. The Duke left no contingency unforeseen. He took with him four celebrated Cormayar guides and a staff of distinguished scientists, as well as Cav Vittoria Sella, the greatest of living mountain photographers. So large was the expedition that 250 native porters were required to carry stores from Entebbe to Fort Portal. It was not a bold personal adventure like Mr. Wollaston's, but a carefully planned scientific assault upon the mystery of Ruanzori. The Duke did not only seek to ascend the highest peak, but to climb every summit and map accurately every mountain, valley, and glacier. The story of the work has been officially written, not indeed by the leader himself, who had no time to spare, but by his friend and former companion, Sir Filippo de Filippi. It is an admirable account, clear and yet picturesque, and it is illustrated by photographs and panoramas which have not often been equaled in mountaineering narratives. The charm of the book is its strangeness. It tells of a kind of mountaineering to which the world can show no parallel. When Lhasa had been visited, Ruanzori remained with the gorges of the Brahmaputra, 
one of the few great geographical mysteries unveiled happily the unveiling has not killed the romance for the truth is stranger than any forecast if the mountains of the moon are lower than we had believed they are far more wonderful here you have a range almost on the equator rising not from an upland like kilimanjaro but from the albertine depression which is six hundred or seven hundred feet below the average level of uganda a range of which the highest peaks are a thousand feet higher than mont blanc which is draped most days of the year in mist and accessible from the plains only by deep-cut glens choked with strange trees and flowers the altitude would in any case give every stage of climate from torrid to arctic but the position on the line adds something exotic even to the familiar mountain sites draping a glacier moraine with a tangle of monstrous growths and swelling the homely alpine flora into portents the freakish spirit in nature has been let loose and she has set snowfields and rock aritz in the heart of a giant hothouse the duke of the abruzzi was faced at the start with a deplorable absence of information even the season when the weather was most favorable was disputed mr freshfield following sir harry johnston's advice tried november and found a perpetual shower bath warned by this experience the duke selected june and july for the attempt and was fortunate enough to get sufficient clear days to complete his task though he was repeatedly driven into camp by violent rain another matter in doubt was the best means of approach to the highest snows the obvious route was the mobuku valley but by this time it was pretty clear that kianja the peak at its head was not the highest and it was possible that there might be no way out of the valley to the higher western summits still it had been the old way of travelers and since the alternative was the Butago valley right on the other side of the range the duke chose to follow the steps of his predecessors just before butiti he got his first sight of the snow and made out that a double peak which was certainly not johnston's duwani was clearly the loftiest duwani came to view again in the lower mabuka valley and the site combined with the known locality of kianja enabled the expedition to take its bearings duwani was seen through the opening of a large tributary valley the bujuku which entered the mabuku on the north side between the portal peaks now it had been clear from the lowlands that the highest snows were to the north of duwani and must consequently lie between that peak and the mobuku valley the conclusion was that the bajuku must lead to the foot of the highest summits while the mobuku could not the discovery was the key to the whole geography of the range but the duke did not at once act upon it he wisely decided to explore kianja first so thinning out his caravan and leaving his heavier stores at the last native village he with his party pushed up the mobuku torrent the mobuku valley falls in stages from the glacier and at the foot of each stage is a cliff face and a waterfall the soil everywhere oozes moisture and where an outcrop of rock or a mat of dead boughs does not give firmer going it is knee-deep in black mud the first stage is forest land great conifers with masses of ferns and tree ferns below and above a tangle of creepers and flaming orchids at the second terrace you come to the fringe of alpine life here is the heath forest of which let the narrative tell Quote, trunks and boughs are entirely smothered in a thick layer of mosses which hang like waving beards from every spray cushion and englobe every knot curl and swell around each twig deform every outline and obliterate every feature till the trees are mere mass of grotesque contortions monstrous tumefactions of the discolored leprous growth no leaf is to be seen save on the very topmost twigs yet the forest is dark owing to the dense network of trunks and branches the soil disappears altogether under innumerable dead trunks heaped one upon another in intricate piles covered with mosses viscous and slippery when exposed to the air black naked and yet neither mildewed nor rotten where they have lain for years and years in deep holes 
no forest can be grimmer and stranger than this the vegetation seems primeval of some period when forms were uncertain and provisory End quote. but the third terrace is stranger still there one is out of the forest and in an alpine meadow between sheer cliffs with far at the head the gorge of bujongolo and the tongue of the glacier above it but what an alpine meadow Quote, the ground was carpeted with a deep layer of lycopodium and springy moss and thickly dotted with big clumps of the papery flowers pink yellow and silver white of the heliochrysum and everlasting above which rose and tall columnar stalks of lobelia like funeral torches besides huge branching groups of the monster senecio the impression produced was beyond words to describe the spectacle was too weird too improbable too unlike all familiar images and upon the whole brooded the same grave deathly silence it is a commonplace to say that in savage africa man is surrounded by a fauna still primeval but in these mountains the flora too is of an earlier world that strange world which is embalmed in our coal seams under the veil of mist among cliffs which lose themselves in the clouds the traveller walks in an unearthly landscape with the gaunt candelabra of the senecios the flambeaux of the lobelias and the uncanny blooms of the helichrysa like decorations at some ghostly feast the word helichrysa calls up ridiculous theocritian associations as if the sunburnt little creeping gold of sicily were any kin to these african marvels our elders were wise when they named the range the mountains of the moon for such things might well belong to some lunar gorge of mr wells's imagination beyond kianja the duke found a little lake where a fire had raged and the senecios were charred and withered it was a veritable valley of dry bones bujongolo offered the expedition a stone heap overhung by a cliff and there the permanent camp was fixed among mildews and lichens and pallid mist and an everlasting drip of rain five weeks were passed with this unpromising spot as their base the first business was to ascend kianja this gave little trouble for the ridge was soon gained and an easy arit to the south led to the chief point the height proved to be fifteen thousand nine hundred eighty eight feet and the view from the summit settled the geography of the range and confirmed the duke's theories for it was now clear that the ridge at the head of the mobuku was no part to the watershed of the chain and that the duwani of johnston was to the north not of the mobuku but on the bujuku the highest summit stood over the west rising from the cool at the head of the bujuku valley the duke saw that they might also be reached by making a detour to the south of kianja and ascending a glen which is one of the high affluents of the butagu the great valley on the west side of the system it may be convenient here to explain the main features of the range giving them the new names which the expedition invented and which are now adopted by geographers kianja became mount baker and its highest point is called edward peak after the then king of england due south across the freshfield pass stands mount luigi de savoia a name given by the royal geographical society and not by the duke who wished to christen it after joseph thompson the traveller due north from mount baker and separated from it by the upper bujuku valley is mount speak the duwani of johnston with its main summit called vittorio emmanuel west of the gap between baker and speak stands the highest summit of all mount stanley with its twin peaks margarita and alexandra north of mount speak is mount emmon and east of the latter is mount jesse five of the great massifs cluster around the bujuku valley while the sixth mount luigi de savoia stands by itself at the south end of the chain the assault on mount stanley was delayed for some days by abominable weather at last came a clear season and the duke with his guides crossed freshfield pass and ascended the valley at the back of mount baker 
There they spent an evening which showed what ruins Ori could be like when clouds are absent. They found a little lake, embosomed in flowers under the cliffs, and looking to the west they saw the sun set in crimson and gold over the great spaces of the Congo forest. Next day they reached the call which bears the name of Scott Elliot, and encamped on one of the Mount Stanley glaciers at the height of 14,817 feet. At 7.30 on the following morning, they reached the top of the first peak, Alexandra, 16,749 feet high. A short descent and a difficult piece of step cutting through snow cornices took them to the summit of Margarita, 16,815 feet, the highest point of the range. Quote, they emerged from the mist into splendid, clear sunlight. At their feet lay a sea of fog, an impenetrable layer of light, ashy white cloud drift, stretching as far as the eye could reach, was drifting rapidly northwestward. From the immense moving surface emerged two fixed points, two pure white peaks sparkling in the sun with their myriad snow crystals. These were the two extreme summits of the highest peaks. The Duke of the Abruzzi named these mountains Margarita and Alexandra in order that, under the auspices of these two royal ladies, the memory of the two nations may be handed down to posterity. Of Italy, whose name was the first to resound on these snows in a shout of victory, and of England, which in its marvelous colonial expansion carries civilization to the slopes of these remote mountains. It was a thrilling moment when the little tricolor flag given by H.M. Queen Margarita of Savoy unfurled to the wind and sun the embroidered letters of its inspiring motto, Ardisi Espera. End quote. The conquest of Mount Stanley was the culminating point of the expedition. After that, the topography being known, it only remained to ascend the four massifs of Speke, Emin, Jesse, and Luigi di Savoia. In addition, the Bujuka Valley, with its tributary the Megusi, was thoroughly explored. The aim of the Duke being completeness, many of the peaks were ascended several times to verify the observations. There is an account of how from one peak, in a sudden blink of fine weather, the leader saw two portions of the expedition in different parts of the range moving about their allotted tasks. The result of this wise organization is that today the world knows every peak, glacier, and valley in Ruanzori far more minutely than many habitable parts of the East African plateau. The expedition was not only a fine adventure, but a wonderful piece of solid and enduring scientific work. No Englishman will grudge that the honors of the pioneer fell to so brilliant a climber and so unwearied a traveler as the Duke of the Abruzzi. The Italian name has always stood high in mountaineering annals, and the Duke has long ago earned his place in that inner circle of fame, which includes Mummery and Guido Re, Moore and Zygmondi. The riddle of equatorial snow has been solved, and there is nothing very startling in the answer. The upper part of the mountains has no marvels to show equal to the giant groundsels and lobelias and the forests of heath on the lower slopes. The glaciers are all small, without tributaries, as in Norway, and there are no real basins, but merely a sort of glacier caps from which ice digitations flow down at divers points. All the same, the glacier formation is more respectable than Mr. Freshfield thought, for he saw only the small ice stream at the head of the Mabuku, and was not aware of the much greater one from Mount Stanley, which descends to the upper Bujuku Valley. The limit of perpetual snow is about 14,600 feet. Mr. Freshfield was so struck by the small size of the Mobuku torrent where it issues from the glacier and by its clearness that he thought it must come from some underground spring rather than from real melting of the ice. He maintained that tropical glaciers were consumed mainly by evaporation and only in a small degree by melting. The Duke has, however, made it clear that the glaciers of Ruanzori are subject to the same conditions as those of the Alps, and that their streams are true glacier torrents. The limpidity of the water he ascribes to their almost complete immobility, which means that there is no grinding of the detritus in their beds. 
On the whole, the range offers no great scope for the energies of the mountaineer. The ice and snow work is easy, and even the huge cornices, such as are found on Margarita, are fairly safe for the climber, owing to the way in which they are propped by a forest of ice stalactites caused by the rapid melting of the snow. On the other hand, there is an abundance of rock climbing of every degree of difficulty, for the mountains below the snow line fall very sheer to the valleys. Luigi di Savoia, Emin, and Jesse are virtually rock peaks. An isolated summit, Mount Cagney, is wholly rock, and there are fine rock faces on Mount Baker and the Edward and Savoia peaks of Mount Stanley. I doubt, however, if Ruinzori will ever be a center for the rock gymnast. The weather would damp the ardor of the most earnest habitué of Chamonix or San Martino. A few hours of sunshine once a week are not enough in which to plan out routes up cliffs whose scale far exceeds the measure of the Alps. The Grepon or the Drew would have long remained virgin if their crags had been forever slimy with moisture and draped in mist, and the climber had to descend to no comfortable mountain burt but to a clammy tent among swamps and mildews. And yet those peaks remain almost the strangest of the world's wonders, and their ascent will always be one of the finest of human adventures. They are mountains of the moon rather than of this common earth. The first discoverers brought back tales which were scarcely credible. Ice peaks of Himalayan magnitude soaring out of flame-colored tropic jungles. For long, mountaineers were consumed with curiosity as to what mysteries lay behind that veil of mist. For all they knew, equatorial snow might be difficult beyond the skill of man, and ruin Zori the eternal and unapproachable goal of the adventure's ambition. The truth is prosaic beside these imaginings. Any man who can afford the time and the money, who selects the right time of year, and is sound in wind and limb, can stand on the dome of Margarita. But the experience will still be unique, for these mountains have no fellows on the globe. There is a certain kinship between the tale of the first ascent of Mount McKinley in Alaska and that of the Duke of the Abruzzi. That gaunt icy peak is as unlike the ordinary snow mountains as Ruins Ori. The climb began from the glacier at a height of a thousand feet, and 19,000 feet of snow and ice had to be surmounted. The Alaskan giant and the mountains of the moon stand at opposite poles of climate, but both are alike in being outside the brotherhood of mountains. They are extravagances of nature, molded without regard to human needs. For mountains, when all has been said, belong to the habitable world. There are barriers between the settlements of man, and from their isolation the climber looks to the vineyards and cornlands and cities on the plains. An ice peak near the pole and a range veiled in the steaming mists of the line are solitudes more retired and sanctuaries more inviolate. The common mountaintop lifts a man above the tumult of the lowlands, but these seem to carry him beyond the tumult of the world. End of chapter 4「Chapter Five: The South Pole, Part One. The imaginations of bold men were captured by the idea of Arctic exploration for centuries before the Antarctic was even thought of as a field for discovery. The Arctic regions have a history dating back to the days of King Alfred. The Antarctic can make no such boast as this, and it is true to say that attention was first drawn to the far south by the mapmakers. Much praise is due to the early mapmakers, but as regards the far south, it must be admitted that they indulged in considerable guesswork. Ortelius, for instance, in his Map of the World, which was published in Antwerp in 1570, had the temerity to draw the coast of Terra Australis Nondum Cognita, round the world as far north in two places as the Tropic of Capricorn. Hakluyt did, in 1599, omit the southern content from his celebrated map of the world, an abstinence on his part that deserves to be mentioned. But fictions, in spite of Hakluyt, continued to appear in later maps, and if they did nothing else, they were at least useful in directing the thoughts of navigators toward the Antarctic. 
accident rather than design was however responsible for the first discoveries in the south in fifteen twenty magellan found the strait which is known by his name and during the sixteenth century what discoveries were made in the direction of the south were due to contrary winds owing to gales sir francis drake in fifteen seventy eight reached in latitude fifty six degrees south the uttermost part of the land towards the south pole and so sadly against his will made discoveries and it was owing to what has happily been called a discovery causing gale that some dutch ships which had set out in fifteen ninety eight for the exciting but scarcely laudable purpose of plundering the coasts of chile and peru were scattered in all directions one of these ships a mere baby of eighteen tons was driven to sixty four degrees south and there her captain dirk gerritz sighted high land with mountains covered with snow like the land of norway if proof of the universal ignorance of the south at the beginning of the seventeenth century is needed we have the expedition of pedro fernandez de quiros quiros was commissioned by the king of spain philip the third to undertake a voyage for the purpose of annexing the south polar continent and after this annexation had been completed he was commanded to convert the inhabitants to the true faith it was an ambitious program and it was far indeed from being carried out in fact the results of the expedition was almost comical quiros discovered the largest island of the new hebrides and in the belief that it was part of the southern continent he not only annexed it but also the south pole itself to the crown of spain this expedition must be considered the first Antarctic expedition, but there is no denying that its results were more ludicrous than encouraging. Little progress was made during the 17th century in adding to the world's knowledge of the South, but in one way and another the mapmakers received severe buffets. Toward the end of that century and the beginning of the next, some ships reached 62 degrees south and 63 degrees south, and encountering great icebergs gained knowledge that tended to disperse the idea of a huge continent from which men could reap wealth and live in comfort while reaping it in spite however of this waning belief in a fertile and populous southern continent several voyages were undertaken to look for it but it is to be noted that the men who made these adventurous journeys were not in the least interested in exploration for exploration's sake the reason why they made these expeditions was mainly because they hoped to enrich themselves. Not until the latter half of the 18th century was there any change in what may be called the spirit of exploration. And then, in 1764, the English government issued instructions to Commodore Byron which clearly showed that the importance of discovery, for discovery's sake alone, was beginning to be realized. Science had been making progress, and the desire really to know and no longer guess at the extent and nature of the world perceptibly increased. Scientists engaged solely on scientific work accompanied both the expeditions of Marion and Kerguelen, and when Captain James Cook sailed in 1772 from Deptford on what was the first British Antarctic expedition, he was also accompanied by scientists. The name of James Cook will always be given a place of honor among explorers, for, quite apart from the discoveries that he made, he set an example of courage in facing dangers and difficulties that can never be forgotten. He and all the earlier navigators, we must remember, had to undertake their voyages in ships that were totally unfit to encounter ice. And when this fact is realized, we are compelled to admire the pertinacity with which they carried out their work and to recognize that the results of their efforts were, under the circumstances, magnificent. It has been well said that James Cook defined the Antarctic region, and that James Ross discovered it. And indeed, it would be difficult to overestimate the importance either of Cook's voyages or of those subsequently undertaken by Ross. January 17, 1773 was a red-letter day in the annals of exploration, for during its forenoon, Cook crossed the Antarctic Circle for the first time. Icebergs and loose pack ice were then surrounding him, but he pushed on until he sighted closely packed ice. 
In his opinion, he might possibly have pushed his way through this ice, but in such a ship as the Resolution, 462 tons, he did not consider himself justified in making so dangerous an experiment. The latitude that he reached was 71 degrees 10 minutes south, longitude 106 degrees 54 minutes west. Cook's expedition returned to Portsmouth in July 1775, and then the value of this voyage was recognized. He had made the circuit of the Southern Ocean in a high latitude, and had forever crushed the idea of a fertile and fruitful Southern continent. If land lay beyond the Antarctic Circle, Cook thought it must consist of, quote, countries condemned to everlasting rigidity by nature never to yield to the warmth of the sun for those wild and desolate aspect i find no words End quote. cook in short had revealed the limits of the habitable globe and his accounts of what he had encountered in the far south did not encourage men who were anxious to find land in which fortunes could quickly be made to think longingly of the antarctic after Cook's return, no serious attempt at geographical discoveries in the South was made until the Russian government, in 1819, sent an expedition under Captain Bellinghausen to the Southern Seas. Bellinghausen's ambition was to rival Cook's feat of making the circuit of the Southern Ocean in a high latitude, and he achieved it. He was also the first explorer definitely to discover land within the Antarctic Circle. Two or three years later, James Weddell, whose real business was sealing, reached a latitude of 74 degrees 15 minutes south, more than three degrees to the south of Cook's farthest point, and for nearly 20 years Weddell's record remained intact. During the first half of the 19th century, the southern seas became the scene of extensive sealing industries, and however much we may regret the wholesale slaughter that took place, we have to confess that some of these sealers made important geographical discoveries. Both Captain John Biscoe and Captain John Balleny were engaged in the Antarctic sealing trade, but they were fortunate enough to be employed by the firm of Enderby. Charles Enderby instructed his captains not to neglect geographical discovery, and his instructions were faithfully carried out. To the enterprise of Enderby, and to the courage and perseverance of his captains, we owe the discovery of Graham Land, Enderby Land, Kemp Island, and Sabrina Land. A French expedition under Captain de Erville and an American one under Captain Wilkes followed in 1840. De Erville, who encountered so many icebergs that he felt as if he was in narrow streets of a city of giants, sighted land in latitude 66 degrees south, longitude 140 degrees east, and named this coast Adili Land. Wilkes also claimed to have discovered land, but of his claims, one of our greatest explorers has written, quote, Had he been more circumspect in his reports of land, all would have agreed that his voyage was a fine performance. End quote. Two or three years before de Herbeville and Wilkes set out on their voyages, Colonel Sabine, at a meeting of the British Association, read a paper on the subject of terrestrial magnetism and the result was that polar exploration received a great incentive. By this time, the importance of terrestrial magnetism in regard to the navigation of ships was admitted, and the government was petitioned to send a naval expedition for the purpose of increasing our knowledge of this science in the South. A favorable reply was received from Lord Melbourne, and in 1839 Sir James Ross was appointed to command an expedition whose object was rather magnetic research than geographical discovery. Two old bomb vessels, the Erebus, 370 tons, and the Terror, 340 tons, were selected by Ross, and when their bows had been strengthened, he had at his disposal the first vessels that could be navigated among the southern pack ice. A detailed account of Ross's achievements cannot be given, but of them, Captain Scott wrote, the high mountain ranges and the coastline of Victoria Land were laid down with comparative accuracy from Cape North in latitude 71 to Wood Bay in latitude 74, and their extension was indicated less definitely to McMurdo Bay in latitude 77 and one half. 
few things could have looked more hopeless than an attack on that ice-bound region which lay within the antarctic circle yet out of this desolate prospect raus wrested an open sea a vast mountain region a smoking volcano erebus and a hundred problems of interest to the geographer the highest latitude reached by ross was seventy eight degrees ten minutes south and he described the huge wall of ice which he sighted there and named the great barrier as a mighty and wonderful object far beyond anything we could have thought of or conceived this barrier was in later years found to be four hundred miles wide and of even greater length slowly very slowly the far south was being compelled to reveal some of its secrets but in spite of the interest and enthusiasm caused by ross's discoveries many years passed after his return to england in eighteen forty three before further steps were taken to make geographical discoveries in the antarctic but during this period in which geographical enterprise languished scientific research was being carried on a great desire to increase the knowledge of the science of oceanography had sprung up and as a practical outcome of the labors of scientists and inventors the challenger expedition excellently equipped for scientific research was set out under the command of captain nares in january eighteen seventy three this expedition was in itself most important but it is not belittling it to say that part of its value in the history of antarctic exploration lies in the fact that it stimulated interest in the far south and this interest gradually increased until the wish to solve the mysteries of the south polar regions became dominant in the minds of many men in england and germany in eighteen eighty five the british association appointed an antarctic committee and some two years later this committee reported in favor of further exploration great difficulties chiefly financial had however to be faced by the supporters of this expedition and a shrewd blow was received when the board of trade refused to recommend a grant of money because there were no trade returns from the antarctic regions a reply that might produce a derisive smile from the most zealous of economists for the moment the idea of antarctic exploration had received a decided setback but determined men were working to conquer the practical difficulties and none more determined than sir clement markham who was elected president of the royal geographical society in may eighteen ninety three no sooner was it generally known that a real effort was being made in england to make further discoveries in antarctica as it was by this time called than several other countries were stimulated at various dates to send out expeditions Borchgrevnik, a Norwegian, de Gerlache, a Belgian, Otto Nordenskiold, a Swede, and Charcoal, a Frenchman, led expeditions, all of which did valuable work in the South. In November 1893, a meeting of the Royal Geographical Society was held, and the duties of the projected British expedition were stated the first duty was to determine the nature and extent of the antarctic continent the fifth was to obtain as complete a series as possible of magnetic and meteorological observations such an expedition was intended both to encourage maritime enterprise and to add to the world's knowledge from the outset the promoters had decided that their expedition should be under naval control but the government could not be persuaded to take charge of it the admiralty however assisted both with the loan of instruments and by granting leave to officers and men on full pay innumerable obstacles continued to hamper the promoters on every side but they were slowly removed and at last the ship was launched at dundee in march nineteen o one and christened the discovery sir clements markham fourteen years before had in his own mind selected the fittest commander if an expedition to the south ever became practicable the name of this commander was robert falcon scott and after much opposition had been overcome opposition which sir clements described as harder to force a way through than the most impenetrable of ice packs scott's appointment was confirmed a great attack upon the antarctic regions was about to be made but it is worthy of record that in the instructions issued to captain scott 
No mention of the South Pole as an objective was made. By July, the labor of preparations for the expedition was almost finished, and on August 5, 1901, the discovery was visited by King Edward VII and Queen Alexandra, and then started on her adventurous voyage. We can easily understand Scott's anxiety to be up and away, for he had no polar experience to help and guide him, and his desire to justify the confidence placed in him must have been intense. In the discovery, in addition to Scott himself, were several men whose names were destined to become famous in the history of polar exploration. Ernest H. Shackleton was a second lieutenant. Ernest A. Wilson was described as surgeon, artist, and vertebrate zoologist. Edgar Evans was a petty officer. Frank Wilde and Thomas Crean were A.B.'s. William Lashley was a stoker. Surely the nucleus of a goodly company. Littleton, New Zealand, had been chosen for the headquarters of the expedition in the south, and the discovery arrived there on 30th November. She stayed for three weeks to refit and take in provisions, and then started upon the next stage of her eventful journey. The Antarctic Circle was crossed on the 3rd January, and soon afterwards the pack was on all sides of the ship. But she behaved splendidly, and Scott was delighted with the way she forced herself through the ice. Scott's original intention had been that the discovery should not winter in the Antarctic, but that, having landed a party of men, she should return northward before the ice made such a journey impossible. A hut had been provided for this party, but in February a spot was found in McMurdo Sound in which it was thought that the ship would pass the winter in safety. Consequently, Scott decided to use the Discovery as his headquarters and to utilize the hut for other purposes. The task of erecting the huts, in addition to the main hut, there were two smaller ones for magnetic work, was difficult, but it was eventually accomplished and the party began to settle down to spend the approaching winter. Before, however, the winter set in, Scott, knowing how ignorant he and his companions were of sledging, was anxious to gain as much experience as possible, and the result of the sledging expeditions that were made only showed how urgently this experience was needed. Early in March, Scott wrote, quote, Even at this time, I was conscious how much there was to be learnt, and I felt that we must buy our experience through many a discomfort. And on looking back, I am only astonished that we bought that experience so cheaply, for clearly there were the elements of catastrophe as well as of discomfort in the disorganized condition in which our sledge parties left the ship. End quote. When the discovery was brought into McMurdo Sound, there was good reason to suppose that she would soon be frozen in. But weeks passed before the sea became frozen, and until the ship was firmly fixed in the ice, there was always a chance that she might be driven away by a gale and be unable to return. This uncertainty hampered operations for some time, and it was not until the last days of March 1902 that the ship was satisfactorily frozen in. The sun departed at the end of April, and during the long winter that followed, the party of explorers had much to occupy them and to discuss. Scott had taken dogs with him for sledging purposes, but although he knew that they must increase his radius of action, he always detested the idea of using them because of the suffering that must necessarily be caused. But the question of using dogs was only one of the many problems in connection with sledging that was debated during that Antarctic winter. In judging the journeys that followed in the spring, it is to be remembered that as far as the Antarctic regions are concerned, they were pioneer efforts, and also that the conditions of the Antarctic sledging differ considerably from those of the Arctic. In these journeys, Scott and his companions were taught lessons that were afterwards of the greatest value to other explorers as well as to themselves, lessons that nothing except experience could teach. The journey that Scott, with Wilson, Shackleton, and several dogs began on the 2nd of November, with the object of pushing as far south as possible, was accompanied at the outset by a supporting party. But this party turned back by the 15th, 
and Scott, Wilson, and Shackleton had immediate cause to know how strenuous a task they had before them. The dogs were already causing anxiety, and were quite unable to do the work expected from them. Relay work, which meant that each mile had to be traveled three times, became the order of the day, and, in consequence, the advance toward the south was greatly hindered. Soon afterwards, the men themselves began to suffer from blistered noses, cracked lips, and painful eyes. But on the 21st, Scott took a meridian altitude and found the latitude to be 80 degrees one minute south. In spite of all discomforts and anxieties, Scott was in a happy mood that night when he wrote, quote, All our charts of the Antarctic region show a plain white circle beyond the 80th parallel. It has always been our ambition to get inside that white space, and now we are there, the space can no longer be a blank. This compensates for a lot of trouble. End quote. As the advance laboriously continued, the condition of the dogs, to Scott's poignant sorrow, went from bad to worse, and by 21st December the question of turning back had to be considered. At this time, additional anxiety was caused by Shackleton, who was showing symptoms of scurvy. But Christmas Day was in sight, and as on that festival the travelers had decided to have a really satisfying meal, they resolved to push on farther. Their meal on Christmas Day put new life into the party, but they realized all too acutely that their food supplies were so inadequate that, if they were to continue the advance, they must be prepared to face the risk of famine. There were, however, strong incentives to urge them on their way. Each day took them farther and farther into regions hitherto untrodden by the feet of men. Who can blame them for taking the risks that were involved in their determination to continue the march? But on 27th December, Wilson, whose industry in sketching and determination not to give in were beyond praise, was suffering so severely from snow blindness that he had to march blindfold, and at last the decision to turn back had to be made. Observations taken at their last camp showed that they had reached between 82 degrees 16 minutes and 82 degrees 17 minutes south, a finer record than Scott anticipated after he had realized that the dogs were unable to fulfill the hopes placed in them. The return march was a prolonged period of suspense. By January 9, 1903, only four out of the 19 dogs which had started on the journey were alive, and on the 15th, the last of them had to be killed. I think, Scott wrote, we could all have wept. Even more serious was the fact that at this time, Shackleton became seriously ill. A grim struggle followed, for although Shackleton showed unending courage, he was suffering severely from scurvy, and Scott and Wilson, who were themselves attacked in a lesser degree by this disease, often had cause to wonder whether this return journey was not beyond their powers. It was with feelings of profound thankfulness that, at the beginning of February, Scott and his companions reached the ship. For ninety-three days they had been on the march, and during that time they had traveled 960 statute miles. When the explorers reached their goal, they found that the relief ship, the morning, had arrived, and Shackleton returned in her. But the discovery, after being so reluctant to freeze firmly into the ice, refused entirely to thaw out, and consequently Scott and most of his original party spent a second winter in the Antarctic. During this additional year, Scott, with Edgar Evans and Lashley as his companions, made a wonderful western journey in which adventures enough to last ordinary men for a lifetime were almost part of the daily routine. Not until February 1904 was the discovery freed from the ice, and on 10th September she reached Spithead after an absence from England of over three years. In those years a crop of most useful information had been gathered, and many geographical discoveries had been made. Among the latter were King Edward Land, Ross Island, and the Victoria Mountains, and, most important of all, the Great Ice Cap on which the South Pole is situated. Not for some years yet was the South Pole to reveal its secret, 
but Scott's first expedition may truthfully be said to have shown the way towards that revelation. In the years to come, Amundsen frankly admitted how carefully he and his companions studied the accounts of Scott's and Shackleton's expeditions. After Scott's return from his first visit to the Antarctic, no further attempt was immediately made to visit the far south. But that great explorer, Ernest Shackleton, had seen enough of the South to be gripped by the desire to solve more of its problems. And in the Geographical Journal of March 1907, he stated the program of a proposed expedition. In this program, Shackleton said, quote, I do not intend to sacrifice the scientific utility of the expedition to a mere record-breaking journey, but say frankly, all the same, that one of my great efforts will be to reach the southern geographical pole. End quote. The financial difficulties that seemed to be inseparable from polar expeditions followed, but they were ultimately removed, and on July 30, 1907, the Nimrod sailed for New Zealand. Bearing in mind the failure of the dogs in Scott's expedition, Shackleton decided to use Manchurian ponies as his principal means of traction. The utmost care was taken in preparing the equipment and in choosing the staff to accompany the expedition. Shackleton intended to land a shore party, and among this party were Frank Wild and Ernest Joyce, who had been with Scott, Douglas Mawson, Lieutenant J.B. Adams, Dr. E. Marshall, Raymond Priestley, and G.E. Marston. Before leaving England, Shackleton decided, if possible, to establish his winter quarters on King Edward VII land, in preference to Scott's old quarters at Hut Point in McMurdo Sound. But he was unable to carry out this plan, and ultimately he landed close to Cape Royds on the east coast of Ross Island. On February 22, 1908, his ship, the Nimrod, started upon her journey to New Zealand. The winter quarters that had necessarily to be chosen were separated from Hunt Point by some 20 miles of frozen ice and Shackleton was greatly disappointed that he was prevented from landing on King Edward VII land, where he would not only have broken fresh ground, but would also have been considerably nearer to the pole. In the light of subsequent events, it is of interest to note that Shackleton, in his search for winter quarters off the barrier, looked with eagerness upon a bay which he named the Bay of Whales, but owing to the conditions of the ice, he thought it necessary to leave this spot as quickly as possible. In another respect, this expedition met with poor fortune, namely in the loss of ponies. When the party settled down to spend the winter, only four ponies were still alive, and it is no cause for wonder that they were watched with the closest attention. And as a Manchurian pony has been endowed with more than his fair share of original sin, he requires a very great deal of watching. Before the winter set in, an attempt was made to reach the top of Mount Erebus, and this attempt met with a success that acted as a tonic both to those who took part in it and to those who had remained in winter quarters. As soon as midwinter day had passed, Shackleton began to make arrangements for the sledging work that had to be done in the approaching spring. Depots had to be laid in the direction of the South Pole, which was over 880 statute miles distant from Cape Royds. These preparations went on apace, and with a view to starting on the southern march from the nearest possible point to the Pole, stores and the like were transferred to Hut Point, and depots were also laid to help the travelers on their way. Adams, Marshall, and Wilde were chosen to accompany Shackleton in this determined effort to reach the South Pole and on the 29th of October they set out with the four ponies and the four sledges. By 3rd November they had left the sea ice and were on the barrier, but instead of finding a better surface, they found it increasingly difficult. At the outset, however, the ponies did splendid work, though one of them on the 9th November nearly disappeared into a great fathomless chasm. At the time the travelers were in a nest of crevasses, and Adams's pony suddenly went down a crack. Fortunately, with help from Wilde and Shackleton, the pony and the sledge were saved from falling into this abyss, but it was an alarming incident, 
for as all the cooking gear and biscuits and a large portion of the oil were on this sledge the loss of it would have been an irretrievable disaster to the southern journey the twenty sixth of november was a day to be remembered by shackleton and his companions for at night they found they had reached a latitude eighty two degrees eighteen minutes south and so had passed scott's farthest south on first december latitude eighty three degrees sixteen minutes south was reached but by this time three of the ponies had been killed and only one was left a few days later this last pony disappeared down a crevasse and nearly took wild in the sledge with him serious as the loss of this gallant pony was there was great cause for thankfulness that wild and the sledge had almost miraculously been saved had the sledge gone only two sleeping bags would have been left for the four men and the equipment would have been so short that the explorers could scarcely have got back to winter quarters presently the travelers left the barrier and attacked the great beardmore glacier which was between them and the plateau on the ninth of december three hundred and forty geographical miles lay between them and the pole and progress was painfully slow for the surface consisted mainly of rotten ice through which their feet continually broke a week later they had traveled over nearly one hundred miles of crevassed ice and had risen six thousand feet but the plateau which they so eagerly longed to reach still lay ahead of them never shackleton wrote do i expect to meet anything more tantalizing than the plateau appalling surfaces to walk on which wilde described as like walking over the glass roof of a station continued after the plateau had been reached and before christmas arrived it was obvious if the advance was to be continued that absolute hunger amounting almost to starvation stared the explorers in the face on the evening of new year's day nineteen o nine the pole was only one hundred seventy two and a half miles distant but the men's strength was nearly exhausted the thermometer remained obstinately below zero and on the sixth of january there were over fifty degrees of frost with a blizzard and drift a last dash onwards followed and on ninth january shackleton and his party reached eighty eight degrees twenty three minutes south and left the union jack flying on the plateau the attempt to reach the pole had failed but it was a gallant attempt and the homeward marches that followed showed clearly enough that to have advanced farther was beyond the powers of the men indeed the return journey was a terrible experience a grim struggle against starvation and to add to the misery of it dysentery owing in shackleton's opinion to eating diseased ponies meat attacked each member of the party all that was possible had been done and had not the wind been behind the explorers during one of their acutest periods of suffering it is improbable that they would ever have reached their winter quarters while shackleton was making his great march a party consisting of david mawson and mckay had set out with a view to determining the position of the south magnetic pole in this they were successful the mean position of the magnetic pole being marked down by mawson as in latitude seventy two degrees twenty five minutes south longitude one fifty five degrees sixteen minutes this was a great triumph for the explorers and needless to say it was not gained without many perilous adventures and narrow escapes in march nineteen o nine the nimrod returned safely to littleton new zealand where shackleton and his men met with the warmest of welcomes once again the south pole had resisted the attempt to locate it but the time was drawing near for its mysteries to be disclosed End of chapter 5, part 1chapter five the south pole part two when on september thirteenth nineteen o nine captain scott published his plans for a british antarctic expedition in the following year roald amundsen was not thinking about the far south the fram it is true was being prepared for a third voyage 
but the Arctic was again to be her destination. Then, during the September of 1909, came the news that Peary had reached the North Pole. One of the great secrets of the world had been revealed, but another was still undiscovered, and Amundsen's thoughts were promptly turned from the Arctic to the Antarctic. For various reasons, Amundsen did not announce his change of plans, and when the Fram sailed in August 1910, only a very few people knew where she was bound for. Not until the ship left Madeira did Amundsen announce his destination to the men who were accompanying him, and they received the news with joy. In two or three respects, Amundsen's expedition differed considerably from Scott's new expedition. Amundsen, for instance, relied on dogs for his motive power. Scott relied on ponies. Then, again, Amundsen decided to make his winter headquarters off the Bay of Whales, which was a degree farther south than McMurdo Sound, where Scott wintered. Scott was to take the Beardmore Glacier as his route to the South Pole. Amundsen's plan, when he set out for the Pole, was to leave Scott's route alone and push straight south from his starting place. Our starting point lay 350 geographical miles, Amundsen wrote, from Scott's winter quarters in McMurdo Sound, so there could be no question of encroaching upon his sphere of action. Lastly, it must be mentioned that the Norwegians were as at home on ski as they were on their feet, while most of Scott's men were at their best only moderate performers upon ski. All went well with the Fram on her voyage to the south. She crossed the Antarctic Circle on January 2, 1911, and twelve days later she was in the Bay of Whales. In landing on the Great Barrier, Amundsen knew that he was taking a considerable amount of risk, for there was no certainty that it was not a float where he landed on it from the Bay of Whales. In Amundsen's opinion, however, the barrier there rests upon a good solid foundation, probably in the form of small islands, skerries, or shoals. And indeed, the barrier treated him well. The landing was performed with supreme ease, and enough seals were found to relieve any possible anxiety as to the supply of fresh meat. Penguins, those delightful birds which provide both humor and food for visitors to Antarctica, were not plentiful, and those that were seen were chiefly of the Adelie species. Framheim, the hut in which the South Pole party were to live during the winter, was soon erected, and Amundsen found infinite satisfaction in the number of dogs which were safely landed. So, far from losing dogs on the voyage, he had started with 97 and finished with 116, a most welcome addition. The Fram, leaving eight men to winter on shore, was due to sail in the middle of February upon an oceanographical cruise, but before leaving she received some unexpected visitors. On the 4th of February, Captain Scott's ship, the Terra Nova, with a party which had vainly hoped to land on King Edward Seventh land, came into the Bay of Wales. The news that Amundsen was safely established reached Scott on the 22nd of February, and he could not fail to be impressed by it. Quote, One thing only, he wrote characteristically, fixes itself definitely in my mind. The proper as well as the wiser course for us is to proceed exactly as though this had not happened to go forward and do our best for the honor of the country without fear or panic. There is no doubt that Amundsen's plan is a very serious menace to ours. He has a shorter distance to the pole by 60 miles. I never thought he could have got so many dogs safely to the ice. But above and beyond all, he can start his journey early in the season, an impossible condition with ponies. End quote. Words that, in the light of future events, are more than ordinarily significant. Before the winter set in, Amundsen determined to deposit food and the like on the way to the Pole, and on the 10th February he set out on his first journey with three men, three sledges, and eighteen dogs. The first trip upon the barrier was full of exciting possibilities. Amundsen was without knowledge of the ground over which he had to travel, and he did not know whether the dogs would respond to the demands made upon them, or if his outfit would stand the severe test to which it was to be put. 
This was essentially a trial trip, and the travelers were naturally anxious that it should be successful. Eighty degrees south was reached, and in every respect, save one, Amundsen was satisfied with his journey. The only fly in his ointment was that time had been wasted in preparations before the party was ready to start in the mornings. But it was only a small fly, and Amundsen knew that with thought it could easily be removed. The dogs had responded so splendidly to the calls made upon them that perhaps the most important question of all had been satisfactorily answered. More depot-laying expeditions followed, and before the winter closed around the explorers, they had placed three tons of supplies at depots in latitudes 80 degrees, 81 degrees, and 82 degrees south. Amundsen and his men could, therefore, settle down for their period of waiting with justifiable hopes that the great spring march to the pole would end in triumph. The winter was spent in paying attention to the minutest details of equipment, and the inhabitants of Framheim were kept gloriously busy and contented. But with the coming of spring, Amundsen began to be impatient to be up and away on his great journey. Temperatures, however, remained very low, somewhere in the neighborhood of minus 60 degrees Fahrenheit, and until they ceased to grovel in the depths, no start could be made. With the beginning of September, the temperatures began to improve, and Amundsen was determined to start as soon as he possibly could, arguing that he could turn around and come back if he found that he had started too soon. So on the 8th of September, he did set out, and soon discovered that the dogs could not endure the intense cold. On the 11th, the temperature was minus 67.9 degrees Fahrenheit. On the following day, it was minus 61.6 degrees Fahrenheit, with a breeze dead against the travelers. On reaching the 80 degrees south depot, Amundsen deposited more stores and then returned to Framheim. More than a month passed before the South Pole party was able to make another start, and it is of interest to note that, whereas Amundsen ultimately got off on the 19th of October, Scott was unable to start before the 1st of November. The South Pole party, which set out from Framheim, consisted of Amundsen, Hansen, Wisting, Hossel, and Bajaland, and they were accompanied by 52 dogs drawing four sledges. As an illustration of the dangers that lay between the explorers and the pole, it is enough to say that on the first day's journey, a terrible disaster was only avoided by a few inches. In the thick weather, they had steered too far to the east and almost fell into what Amundsen describes as a yawning black abyss, large enough to have swallowed us all and a little more. On the 21st, Bajalan's sledge sank down a crevasse and had to be unloaded before it could be brought again to the surface. Wisting, with alpine rope fastened around him, went down and unloaded the sledge, and when he came up again and was asked if he was not glad to be out of such a position, he replied, it was nice and warm down there. It is true that such events are far from unusual in the lives of polar explorers, but Wisting's answer is worth quoting because it is typical of the cheerful spirit shown by Amundsen's companions during the whole of the journey. In temperament, they were admirably suited for the task that they had undertaken. With a view to landmarks on the return journey, Amundsen, rightly leaving nothing more to chance than he could help, decided to build snow beacons. The first beacon was built in 80 degrees 23 minutes south, and altogether 150 beacons were erected six feet in height. Up to 82 degrees south, the course had already been traveled by depot-laying parties, but when, on the 6th of November, they left 82 south behind them, their journey was absolutely into the unknown. At this time, they were marching about 23 miles daily, and at this rate, they advanced a degree in three days. On reaching 83 degrees south, the explorers deposited provisions for five men and twelve dogs for four days, and depots were subsequently made at 84 degrees south and 85 degrees south. It was from the latter depot that they decided to make what may, without exaggeration, be called their dash for the pole. From their camp at 85 degrees south, 
the distance to the pole and back was 683 miles. After consideration, Amundsen determined to take forward provisions and so forth for 60 days on the sledges and depot the rest of the supplies and outfit. A weary ascent to the plateau lay before the explorers, and they started upon it on the 17th of November. Three days later they had reached the plateau, but although they were happy enough in having accomplished a long and dangerous climb, their first camp on the plateau was not one of happy memory. Grim work had to be done. Amundsen arrived on the plateau with 42 dogs, but 24 of them had to be killed when the plateau was reached. It was a sacrifice that had to be made if the success of the expedition was to be considered. But no one can read Amundsen's account of it without recognizing how bitterly he and his companions regretted the necessity. This camp, not without reason, was called the butcher shop, and as both the men and dogs required rest before setting out on the final stages of their march, it had been decided to remain there for two days. The eighteen remaining dogs were divided into three teams, with six dogs in each team, and one sledge was left behind. But owing to the weather, the explorers could not leave this hated butcher shop until the 25th of November, and when they did set out again, a blizzard was blowing. So tired, however, were they of waiting in such an inhospitable and gruesome spot, that all of them were eager to quit it, whatever the condition of the weather might be. Fog subsequently impeded the party, and again and again Amundsen blessed the assistance that they received from Ski. I am not, he wrote, giving too much credit to our excellent Ski when I say that they not only played a very important part, but possibly the most important part of all, on our journey to the South Pole. Many a time we traversed stretches of surface so cleft and disturbed that it would have been an impossibility to get over them on foot. The 7th December was a great day for the expedition because during it they passed Shackleton's farthest south, 88 degrees, 23 minutes south. They proceeded for another two miles and then determined to make their last depot. So important to them was this depot that they not only marked it at right angles to their course, but also by snow beacons at every two miles to the south. As the explorers approached the pole, Amundsen, very naturally, was beset by nervousness. Would he be the first? was a question that kept on recurring in his mind. There was no cause to worry. Blessed by fine weather, he and his companions reached the South Pole on December 14, 1911, and the five of them together planted the pole from which the Norwegian flag flew. Thus we plant thee, beloved flag, at the South Pole and give to the plain on which it lies the name of King Hakon Seventh's Plateau. On this day, Scott was still struggling on his great march to the same destination, which he reached in the third week of January. The calculations that Amundsen carried out at the South Pole gave its latitude as 89 degrees 56 minutes south. Amundsen had won the race, and with his victory had revealed one of the great secrets of the world. His success had been gained by strenuous labor, great courage, and infinite care. And if Britons connect Scott's name inseparably with the South Pole, and honor it as that of one of their heroes, they do not for a moment grudge Amundsen the honor due to him as one of the greatest explorers of all time. For Amundsen was the first to discover the South Pole, and no one wishes, or is likely, to forget it. The Norwegians reached the pole with seventeen dogs, one of which had to be killed there, and they traveled back with two sledges, a team of eight dogs in each sledge. On his return journey, Amundsen was fortunate enough to meet with favorable winds and weather, and the explorers arrived at Framheim on January 25, 1912, having traveled 1,860 miles in 99 days. It was a glorious achievement, a great victory over conditions that are scarcely conceivable to anyone unacquainted with the Antarctic or Arctic regions. To pass from Amundsen's expedition to Scott's last expedition is to turn from one splendid exploit to another. 
Scott, as everyone knows, was beaten in the actual race for the South Pole. But he and his friends reached their goal, and the tale of their struggle against misfortune after reaching it is one of the finest and most pathetic in the world. When Scott's intentions to lead another Antarctic expedition were known, no less than 8,000 applicants volunteered to go with him, and among this enormous numbers were several men whose names will forever find a place in the history of polar exploration. When the Terra Nova sailed from Littleton, New Zealand, for the Antarctic regions on November 29, 1910, she carried both ponies and dogs. Three motor sledges, of which one was lost in landing, were also taken, and Scott, with his intense dislike for the cruelty inseparably connected with the use of animals for motive power, hoped that these sledges would do much to save the ponies and dogs. Owing to engine trouble, these hopes were not realized, but in connection with them, Sir Clements Markham has written, quote, Captain Scott was quite on the right tack, and with more experience, his idea of polar motors will hereafter be made feasible, a consummation which was very dear to his heart, End quote. The Terra Nova was by no means as fortunate as the discovery in making her way to the Antarctic. At the beginning of December, she encountered a prolonged and terrific storm, and subsequently she had to fight her passage through some 370 miles of ice. Not until January 3, 1911, did she reach the barrier, five miles east of Cape Crozier. Here, Scott had hoped to make his winter quarters, but owing to the swell, no landing could be made, and on the following day he decided to land at Cape Evans, 14 miles north of the Discovery's winter quarters. Strenuous work followed, and in a few days everything necessary had been landed from the ship. The house was soon built, and the explorers were ready to start laying depots in preparation for the march to the Pole. On his first depot-laying journey, Scott was accompanied by eleven men, eight ponies, and twenty-six dogs. He was more than a little doubtful about the dogs, but thought his ponies were bound to be a success. They work, he wrote, with such extraordinary steadiness. The great drawback is the ease with which they sink into the soft snow. They struggle pluckily, but it is trying to watch them. This depot-laying party reached latitude 79 degrees, 29 minutes south, and there it left over a ton of stores. Consequently, the name of One Ton Camp was bestowed upon it. On the return journey, disasters happened that seriously affected the success of the expedition, for six out of the eight ponies were lost. Everything out of joint with the loss of our ponies, but mercifully with all the party alive and well, is Scott's comment on this grave misfortune. Ten ponies still remained. During the winter, Wilson, Bowers, and Cherry Garrard started on June 27, 1911, on their famous journey to Cape Crozier to visit the Emperor Penguin Rookery, and they did not return to Cape Evans until the 1st of August. During these weeks, they had to fight against appallingly low temperatures. When, for instance, they started from Cape Evans, their three sleeping bags weighed 52 pounds, but owing to the ice that had collected upon them, these three bags weighed 118 pounds when the travelers returned. Scott considered that no praise was too high for men who would face such weather during the polar winter. With the beginning of August, preparations for the Great March went on apace, but it was not until the 1st of November that a start could be made from Cape Evans. Night marching was decided upon, and the order of marching was at first settled by the speed of the ponies, for some of them were slow, some fairly fast, and some were flyers. The motors, with E. R. Evans, Day, Lashley, and Hooper with them, had already started, and the dogs under the control of Mears and Dimitri were to follow behind the last detachment of men and ponies. Very soon, however, the motor party were in trouble and this party had to abandon their machines and push on as a man-hauling party. By the 15th of November, Scotch reached One Ton Camp, and fears about the ponies began to take shape. At Camp 19, the explorers were within 150 miles of the Beardmore Glacier, but some of the ponies were beginning to fail, and at the next camp, 
the first of them, the gallant Jehu, had to be shot. From this camp, it was arranged that Day and Hooper should turn back. At Camp 22, the middle barrier depot was made in latitude 81 degrees, 35 minutes, and then for some days the march was impeded by extraordinarily foul weather. Scott's desire was to take the ponies as far as the entrance to the Beardmore Glacier, but although on the 29th November at Camp 5 they were only 70 miles from what he calls his pony goal, some of the willing animals were very tired. At Camp 29, Six ponies were still left out of the ten which had started, but although the chances of getting through successfully to the glacier were good, the weather still remained as obstructive as possible. On the 5th of December, a terrific fall of snow added to the anxieties of the explorers, who found themselves within 12 miles of the glacier, but hopelessly held up by such a violent and unexpected storm. It was natural enough for Scott to be anxious, for on the 7th of December the food that he had hoped only to use after the glacier was reached had to be begun on. Two days later, however, by marching under terrible conditions, the entrance to the glacier was gained, and then at Camp 31, which was called Shambles Camp, the last of the ponies were killed. On the 9th of December, Wilson wrote, Nobby, Wilson's special pony, had all my biscuits last night and this morning, and by the time we camped I was just ravenously hungry. Thank God the horses are now all done with, and we begin the heavy work ourselves. At Camp 32, the lower glacier depot was built, and soon afterwards Mears and Dimitri with the dogs turned back for home. At this time the parties were made up of Sledge 1, Scott, Wilson, Oates, and P.O. Evans, Sledge 2, E. Evans, Atkinson, Wright, and Lashley, Sledge 3, Bowers, Cherry Garrard, Keen, and Cohane. But by the 21st of December, in latitude 85 degrees south, Scott had to send back four of these men, and Atkinson, Wright, Cherry Garrard, and Cohane returned. The upper glacier depot was made, and the returning men took back a letter from Scott, in which he wrote, quote, So here we are, practically on the summit, and up to date in the provision line. We ought to get through. End quote. On New Year's Day, 1912, the party were within 170 miles of the pole. Three degree depot was made, then in latitude 87 degrees, 32 minutes south, Scott was compelled to send back E.R. Evans, Crean, and Lashley. When all of the men were so anxious to go on, it was hard to have to part with any of them, but questions of food made it absolutely necessary that some of the party should return. The ages of the five men who marched on to the pole were Scott, 43 years old, Wilson, 39, P.O. Evans, 37, Oates, 32, and Bowers, 28. Again and again, Scott expressed his admiration of his four companions. Wilson, never wavering from the start to finish. Evans, a giant worker. Bowers, a marvel. He is thoroughly enjoying himself. Oates, goes hard all the time. With such men, Scott felt confident, in spite of terrible surfaces, of reaching the pole. But as he approached it, Fears that Amundsen had already arrived were constantly besetting him, and on the 16th of January, when within a few miles of the longed-for goal, there was no longer any doubt that the Norwegian party had won the race. Sledge and ski tracks and the traces of dogs were all too evident. Faced by such a grievous blow, not one of Scott's party could sleep that night, but on the day following they marched on some fourteen miles and reached the pole. The pole, Scott wrote, yes, but under very different circumstances from those expected. It is impossible to conceive a greater blow, and when it is remembered that Scott and his four companions were already fatigued, if not completely exhausted, by their tremendous labors, it is easy to realize how heavily the disappointment hung on their minds. Nevertheless, they had set out to reach the pole, and they had reached it. 
All honor is due to them, and the fact that Amundsen had preceded them in no way diminished the glory of their achievement. The altitude of the pole, as estimated by Scott, is about 9,500 feet. A cairn was built, and the Union Jack hoisted. And then, on Thursday, 18th January, they turned their backs upon their goal, and began the long march that separated them from Cape Evans. Anxiety about food began at once. Not until three degree depot was reached could it be lessened, and very soon anxiety at Evans' condition was added to the danger of the scarcity of food. On Wednesday, the 31st of January, the weary travelers reached the three degree depot, but by this time Evans had dislodged two fingernails and his general condition was very bad. Their next objective was the Upper Glacier Depot, and on Monday night, the 5th of February, they were within from 25 to 30 miles of it, but so critical had the health of Evans become that Scott was desperately eager to get off the plateau. Things, he wrote, may mend for him, Evans, on the glacier, and his wounds get some respite under warmer conditions. On the evening of the 7th of February, they reached the Upper Glacier Depot, and then, after turning aside to collect geological specimens, which proved to be the most valuable, they met with terrible surfaces and weather. On the 14th of February, with 30 miles still to go before the lower glacier depot was reached, Scott's anxiety about the condition of the party was acute. Indeed, poor Emmons had almost reached the limit of human endurance, and during the night of 17th February he became unconscious and died quietly at 12.30 a.m. It was a terrible experience for men, already supremely fatigued both in mind and body, to meet, and it was a sorrowful party which on Sunday afternoon arrived at Shambles' camp. There, horse meat in plenty awaited them, and this gave them the renewal of strength that was sadly needed. For the moment, the prospects of the explorers looked a little more hopeful, but from this point of their march they began to suffer from a lack of oil. When, at length, they succeeded in arriving at the Middle Barrier Depot, and on the 2nd of March they found so little oil that it was scarcely enough, however economically used, to carry them on to the next depot, which was 71 miles distant. Another irretrievable disaster was the fact that Oates's feet were very badly frostbitten. On the 4th of March, Scott wrote, quote, I don't know what I should do if Wilson and Bowers weren't so determinedly cheerful over things. End quote. And in all truth, the position had become desperate. On the 7th, when still 16 miles short of Mount Hooper Depot, Oates, though wonderfully brave, was in terrible pain. During the next day, they arrived at Mount Hooper, but the shortage of oil was not relieved. Over 70 miles separated the exhausted travelers from one-ton camp, and they struggled onwards with death staring them ever nearer and nearer in the face. With no helping wind and bad surfaces, they could not advance more than six miles a day, and on the night of the 11th, Scott reckoned up the situation in these words, quote, We have seven days' food and should be about 55 miles from one-ton camp tonight. Six times seven equals 42, leaving us 13 miles short of our distance, even if things get no worse, quote. Unhappily, instead of any improvement in the situation, misfortunes became more and more plentiful. It was obvious that Oates was near the end, and on the morning of the 15th or 16th, when the blizzard was blowing, he walked out of the tent. I am just going outside and maybe some time, were the last words he spoke to his companions in distress. We knew, said Scott, who still continued to write his journal, that poor Oates was walking to his death. It was the act of a brave man and English gentleman. Oates sacrificed himself in the hope of helping the others, and no brave man ever performed a braver act. But his sacrifice was of no avail. Fortune had declared too strong a hand against the explorers for them to be able to resist it. By midday on the 18th of March, Scott, Wilson, and Bowers had struggled on to within 21 miles of One Ton Depot, 
and during the afternoon of the following day they managed to advance another ten miles and then they made what was destined to be their last camp the men themselves were in a pitiable condition and blizzard following blizzard they were utterly unable to march a step farther on the twenty ninth of march scott wrote quote, since the twenty first we have had a continuous gale from the west southwest and southwest we had fuel to make two cups of tea apiece and bare food for two days on the twentieth every day we have been ready to start for our depot eleven miles away but outside the door of the tent it remains a scene of whirling drift we shall stick it out to the end but we are getting weaker of course and the end cannot be far it seems a pity but i do not think i can write more and then follows those pathetic words quote, last entry for god's sake look after our people End quote. it was not until the thirtieth of october that atkinson on whom the leadership of the expedition had fallen was able to take out a search party and nearly a fortnight later the bodies of these three friends and explorers were found no more fitting words could be found with which to conclude this chapter of great deeds than those which were left in the metal cylinder on the grave of these heroes Quote, november twelfth nineteen twelve latitude seventy nine degrees fifty minutes south this cross and cairn are erected over the bodies of captain scott c v o r n dr e a wilson m b b c and lieutenant h r bowers royal indian marine a slight token to perpetuate their successful and gallant attempt to reach the pole this they did on january seventeenth nineteen twelve after the norwegian expedition had already done so inclement weather with lack of fuel was the cause of their death and to commemorate their two gallant comrades Captain L. E. G. Oates of the Inniskilling Dragoons, who walked to his death in a blizzard to save his comrades, about eighteen miles south of this position, also Seaman Edgar Evans, who died at the foot of the Beardmore Glacier. The Lord gave, and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. End, quote. End of chapter 5, part 2「Chapter Six, Mount McKinley The ascent of Ruinzori unriddled the mystery of equatorial snows. There now remained the question of great peaks in the extreme north, where the mountaineering problems must obviously be very different from those found at a similar altitude in the temperate zones. Something had been done to solve the problem by the ascent of Mount St. Ilias in Alaska on July 31, 1897. But Mount St. Ilias was only just over 18,000 feet, and it was peculiarly accessible, for it lies close to the coast, on the borders of British and American territory. The eyes of explorers began to turn towards Mount McKinley, the highest peak in North America, which reached a height of 20,300 feet its latitude was sixty three degrees north and so within two hundred and fifty miles of the arctic circle the nearest salt water cook inlet was a hundred and forty miles from the southern face as the crow flies it was therefore almost unreachable lying as it did in the midst of an unexplored wilderness and surrounded by a mighty glacier system on the south these glaciers were drained by the susitna river with its tributaries the Yetna and the Chulitna, and on its northern face by the affluence of the Yukon. If the traveler attempted to reach it in summer, he might find a difficult waterway up to the beginning of the glaciers, but then he had thirty miles of ice to cross before he reached the base, and over these he must transport everything on his back. In winter, the journey might be made by dogs, but winter in those latitudes was scarcely the time to travel. Moreover, Mount McKinley, unlike the other great peaks in the world, rose from a low elevation. In the case of the South American and Himalayan peaks, climbing does not begin until an altitude of at least 10,000 feet has been reached, and their line of perpetual snow is very high. 
it is possible for example to cover the twenty two thousand eight hundred sixty feet of aconcagua without ever touching snow but in mount mckinley the snow line was not much more than two thousand five hundred feet and there was something like fifteen thousand feet of climbing again its position so far north did not permit the snows to melt properly in the summer or to grow hard and pack its snowfall was so great that the snow never got into the condition which eases the path of the mountaineer finally and this applied especially to a winter journey it was situated in a land of desperate storms the severest weather conditions ever recorded by the american meteorological bureau occurred at mount washington which is only six thousand feet above the sea where the temperature was forty degrees below zero and the wind one hundred eighty miles an hour what might the climber expect twenty thousand feet up in the sky with nothing between him and the north pole the attempt on mount mckinley therefore was not a thing to be lightly undertaken it meant a journey to the remote alaskan coast and then some two hundred miles through difficult and little-known country before even the base was reached what the climbing would be like no one could tell the obvious route as the map will show was the susitna river by which indeed its first explorer a young princeton graduate called dickey had approached it in eighteen ninety six it was he who christened it mount mckinley he fell into an argument with another prospector who was a rabid champion of free silver and after merely weary days dispute retaliated by naming the mountain after the champion of the gold standard in 1903 an expedition led by the too famous dr cook reached the base from the north but failed to do any climbing then in 1906 began the explorations of professor parker and mr belmore brown who were destined six years later to be the conquerors of the peak the 1906 expedition may be roughly sketched for though it was a failure it at least taught its leaders what routes were not possible they started with pack horses and a motor boat with the intention of trying the northwestern face they ascended the yetna river which enters the susitna from the west but found it impossible to cross the southern flanks of the alaskan range they then turned up the south side of the range and reached the glacier out of which the tokositna river flows by this time their transport was in a precarious condition and their horses could go no farther they were within view of mount mckinley and saw not only the impossibility of the southern face but the extraordinary difficulties of approaching even its base from that direction they accordingly returned to the coast where dr cook left them announcing that he intended to make one final desperate attempt on the mountain presently professor parker and mr belmore brown heard to their surprise the rumor that dr cook had succeeded knowing that the feat was impossible in so short a time they disbelieved the tale and stated their views publicly in new york then appeared dr cook's notorious book but before it was published he had departed for the arctic regions geographical circles in america were torn with the controversy a committee of the explorers club investigated the question but dr cook refused to give evidence professor parker and mr belmore brown were meantime busy with their own plans for another attempt the nineteen ten expedition was again directed to the southern face their reasons were that for most of the journey to that face a water route was possible and that if they failed there they believed they would be able to go on to the southern northeast ridge which from what they had heard and seen they believed to be the most promising avenue of attack they also wished to duplicate the photographs which dr cook had published and so prove or disprove his bona fides also the northern side of the great mountain had already been fairly well mapped but nothing had been done on the south side the notion of a pack train was discarded and all their energies were directed toward designing the right kind of boat in which to ascend the susitna and its tributary the chulitna till they reached the glaciers 
The party consisted of eight, including a young man from Seattle, Mr. Merle Lavoy, who was exceptionally fitted by Providence for the work of a pioneer. The present writer had many dealings with Mr. Lavoy during the Great War, and can confidently say that he never met anyone more intrepid, audacious, and resourceful. It was a summertime expedition, and the party left Susitna Station on the 26th of May. The ascent to the two rivers was difficult and exciting enough, but they reached without misadventure the foot of the Tokositna tributary, where they established their base camp. This camp was thirty-seven and a half miles from Mount McKinley, and a few miles away was the terminal moraine of a great glacier, which they hoped would give them a roadway to the mountain. Up that glacier they would have to carry all their belongings on their backs. In Mr. Belmore Brown's narrative, there is an interesting passage describing the process by which men are hardened to wilderness work. Quote, the day's work consisted in traveling through brush, soft sand, swamps, and glacier streams for about ten hours. With the exception of one or two men who put a biscuit in their pockets, we took no food with us. The day's work was in no way difficult, for we carried, during the preliminary reconnaissance, no loads. Our condition from the civilized standpoint was splendid. We were well fed, sun browned, and fairly hard. And yet we all came into camp thoroughly tired out. Two months after our adventures on Mount McKinley's ice flanks, we came down through the same stretch of country. The snow, however, had melted, leaving dense thickets through which we had to chop our way. Mosquitoes hung in clouds, and four of us were carrying packs running from 95 to 120 pounds. From the civilized standpoint, we were not well fed, and we did not look well. Our eyes and cheeks were sunken, and our bodies were worn down to bone and sinew. And yet we came into camp as fresh and happy as children, and after a bite to eat and a smoke, we could have gone on cheerfully. End quote. It was no light task carrying an outfit of 1,200 pounds over the 37 and a half miles of glacier, a distance which by the actual route used was much farther. Most of the weight was in pemmican and alcohol for the stoves. The pemmican consisted of pulverized raw meat mixed with sugar, raisins, currants, and tallow. Their principal drink was tea. On the 11th of June they had their last wood fire, and after that there was only the stove. The days were spent in sheer, hard, navvy labor, trudging along on snowshoes under heavy packs and trotting back for others. They had various misadventures. Frequent blizzards of wind and snow compelled them to shut up their tent fast at night, with the result that on one occasion they were nearly asphyxiated. On the 27th of June they reached the head of the main glacier, beyond which, through a narrow gorge, a secondary glacier descended from the mountains. Another glacier came down on their right, and here they achieved an interesting piece of detective work. At the top of it they saw some peaks which recalled an illustration in Dr. Cook's book. The illustration purported to be the summit of Mount McKinley, and showed on the left a rock shoulder which Dr. Cook described as a cliff of 8,000 feet. It was really a faked picture of the small peaks at the head of this glacier, miles and miles from the main mountain, and the cliff of 8,000 feet turned out to only rise 300 feet above the floor, and to be only 5,300 feet above sea level. One legend, at any rate, had been dispelled forever. Now began the patient relaying of provisions up the Great Gorge. It was desperately hard manual labor, their faces were burnt black by the glare of the sun, and every now and then there would be a slip into a crevasse which only the highest good fortune saved from being a tragedy. After thirty-six days of hard traveling, they were at last within two miles of the base of the southern cliffs of Mount McKinley. They found themselves at a great ice basin, hemmed in by colossal precipices down which avalanches thundered. Before them rose the mountain, 15,000 feet of rock and ice. Their glasses showed them that the southwest ridge became utterly unclimbable after an altitude of about 15,000 feet. 
the southern northeast ridge looked more promising and to this they turned their attention in that northern summer there was no dark Quote, the advance and retreat of the night shadows went on with scarcely a pause and sometimes we would be uncertain whether the alpine glow on the big mountain's icy crest was the light of the rising or the setting sun End quote. they had now a short spell of rest from their toil and as the mind of man on such occasions turned to food they invented out of their scanty larder a new pudding here is the recipe Quote, first soak three broken hardtack in snow water until they are soft add sixty raisins and pemmican the size of four and a half eggs stir slowly but energetically till the mess is thoroughly amalgamated boil slowly over an alcohol stove add three tablespoonfuls of granulated sugar and serve in a granite ware cup End quote. But between them and the northeast ridge lay a gigantic Sirac. For a day and a half they lay storm-bound under it, and then on the morning of 11th July tried to cut their way up the ice wall. It proved most difficult and dangerous work, and presently, owing to the diminishing provisions, they realized it was impossible. Again and again they attempted it, for only that way was there a road to the northeast ridges. But at last they had to give it up as hopeless and turn their attention to the southwest arit this too proved too hard for them they labored on under constant ice falls and avalanches and reached a height of ten thousand three hundred feet where they had perforce to halt during these days they saw some marvelous mountain scenery Quote, the whole of the great cliffs of the box canyon appeared at first glance to be on fire unnumbered thousands of tons of soft snow were avalanching from the southern flanks of mount mckinley on to the glacier floor five thousand feet below the snow fell so far that it was broken into heavy clouds that rolled downward like heavy waves the force of the rolling mass was terrific and as it struck the blue green glacier mail it threw a great snow cloud that raced like a live thing for five hundred feet Whirling in the wind, the avalanche had caused, the white wall swept across the valley, and almost before we were aware of it, we were struggling and choking in a blinding and stinging cloud of ice dust. End quote. They began their retreat, and their return to greenery in summer out of a hyperborean hell was like a man's recovery from a dangerous illness. Though the expedition failed, they were a merry party, for though every man was sunken-eyed and lean and hatchet-faced, he was in the pink of condition. It was nothing to them to carry a load of a hundred and twenty pounds, which would have broken their backs in the first days. The party included men of diverse temperaments and multifarious attainments, and Mr. Lavoy observed, quote, It is an education to travel with a bunch like ours. If anything should happen, you can listen to a whole dictionary. End quote. In the end, they came to their cash on Chulitna, and they emptied it as children empty their Christmas stockings. We were actually ravenous, said Mr. Belmore Brown, and as jars of chow chow, cans of maple syrup, and tins of meat appeared, we hugged them in our arms and danced delirious dances on the sand. One of the great truths of life that one learns to understand in the North is that it is well worth while to go without the things one wants for the greater the sacrifice the greater the reward when the wish is consummated i have eaten with all manner of hungry men from the sun-browned riders of the sage to the bedark men of the aleutians and i have feasted joyously on sill liver seagull omelettes and caribou spinach but never have i seen men eat more or better food End quote. As soon as the explorers returned to civilization, they began to plan a third attempt. It was clear to them that the western and southern faces of the mountain were impracticable, and that their best chance was on the northeast ridge. This, however, could not be approached from the south, so it became their object to get in on the north side. Their explorations in 1910 had proved the difficulties of a summer trip for loads had to be transported on men's backs over many miles of glacier. They therefore decided to make a winter expedition of it, 
and to use Alaskan dog teams. The best route seemed to be up the Susitna and Chulitna rivers, and they hoped somewhere near the head of the Chulitna to find a pass in the Alaskan range would take them round the north face of Mount McKinley. In October 1911, Mr. Lavoy began to relay supplies up the Chulitna, the plan being for him to join Professor Parker and Mr. Belmore Brown at Susitna in February of 1912. As Cook Inlet is choked by ice during winter, the travelers had to leave the steamer at Seward and make a long and difficult overland journey by way of Glacier City and the Knick Fjord to the Susitna River. There they found Mr. Lavoy with the dog teams. He reported that he had taken the bulk of the outfit to a cache on the Chilitna, several miles beyond the mouth of the Tokositna. The journey up to Susitna, which was now a flat snow trail, went easily and pleasantly. When they reached the cache, they found to their disgust that a wolverine, which is the arch-fiend of those northern wildernesses, had managed to break in, though it was placed for greater security on a platform of logs among the trees. The brute had destroyed a good deal of the dog feed and bacon, and a new and expensive camera of Mr. Lavoy's, which had been swung on the top of a thirty-foot pole. The wolverine had climbed the pole, cut off the corners of the leather case, and gnawed its way into the camera. From the cache began a long system of relays, for it was impossible to carry all the equipment in one journey. There was now no trail, and a road had to be broken before each stage. The route lay up the Chulitna, and the travelers hoped to find some large stream coming down on their left, which would indicate a gap in the Alaskan range. Any such gap would, of course, be filled with glaciers, the water which must form a river. On the whole, winter traveling compared favorably with summer. The men used snowshoes to break the trail, and after equipment had been transported for five miles, returned on the empty sleds for new loads. Winter had not killed all signs of wildlife, though hunting was difficult and the snow was dotted with the tracks of innumerable wild things. Even a finch was heard singing. Camping was perfectly comfortable, and in a tent with the stove lit and beds of green spruce prepared, the nights were warm and peaceful. At last, the trees began to thin. They came to a point where the valley split and a great canyon turned north toward the range. Travel now became rougher, for the broad level flats gave way to snow-covered rapids and big drifts. As they advanced up the gorge, a glacier was seen winding down from the center of the mountains. One night, Mr. Belmore Brown had an accident which might have proved serious. He went out to shoot an owl for food, and as the ejector of his little rifle had been removed, the cartridge came back on his eye and just missed his right eyeball. It gave him an eerie feeling to see the friendly dogs lapping up the blood-stained snow. Shortly after, he made a reconnaissance of twenty-five miles ahead and found the glacier they had seen from afar off running like a great white road into the hills. The route seemed possible, but there were ugly ice precipices at the head which suggested that the crossing of the pass might not be easy. A second reconnaissance took him to the head of the glacier. At first, no crossing could be discerned, but suddenly at the head of the right-hand basin, the mountains broke away and he saw a smooth snowfield leading to the crest. He climbed to the top of it and at first saw nothing but a sheer precipice. At length, however, he discovered on the right a gentle snow slope leading down into a great snow cup and realized that the pass could be crossed. On the 3rd of April, the main camp was pushed up to a height of 6,000 feet. Then came a delay from a blizzard which confined the explorers for 24 hours to their tents. It was bitterly cold and everything, including the alarm clock, froze stiff. They managed, however, to get a little fire with an empty pemmican case and with the stove had a sort of party in the tent, men, dogs, and everything. The party was, however, unceremoniously broken up by one of the dogs backing into the stove and filling the tent with a cloud of smoke from singed hair. Next morning they crossed the divide, partly shooting and partly lowering their belongings over the thousand feet drop into the hollow. 
they were no sooner across when another blizzard arrived and they were storm bound for thirty-six hours but their spirits were high for the time they were done with uphill climbs and they saw that by crossing a low pass at the head of another glacier they could reach the great Muldrow glacier which had been known to the world since nineteen o two this glacier would take them into the very heart of the mountain without much difficulty they crossed the pass and descending to the Muldrow moraine they realized with joy that they were on the northern side of the alaskan range it was now nearly the middle of april and they found themselves in the kind of country that hunters dream of there was a chance of fresh meat and to men who had been seventeen days on the ice the hope of a change in their menu and the sight of vegetation were an intoxication mr belmore brown went out one morning and fell in with a herd of white sheep ovis dali he secured three and that night the camp feasted in cold weather he writes one has a craving for fat and in the wilderness one is less particular about the way meat is cooked our desire for fat was so intense that we tried eating the raw meat and finding it good beyond words we ate freely of the fresh mutton i can easily understand now why savage tribes make a practice of eating uncooked flesh unquote. the white sheep was not the only game there was a special variety of caribou there was the alaskan moose there was an occasional grizzly and there were quantities of ptarmigan the traveller showed the most sportsmanlike spirit in refraining from killing females or immature beasts from the muldrow glacier they turned westward and struck the mckinley fork of the kantishna river which flows to the yukon presently they were in timber country and realized that they had crossed the alaskan range from wood to wood and incidentally had added two new glacier systems to the map after snow and ice and pemmican they had greenery and fresh meat and as they worked their way to the lowlands the first flush of spring above all they had the northeast ridges of which there were three above them to offer an apparently possible route to the summit they saw a glacier running between the central and northern and northeast ridges which they decided would be their road mr belmore brown went out to prospect and climbing the head of a valley found himself looking down upon the upper muldrow glacier which he now realized was split in two by the central northeast ridge he saw also that the northern branch of it gave a road to the very base of the central peak a base camp was established on the twenty fourth of april and four days later began the chief reconnaissance they took with them a dog team and for equipment their mountain tent instruments alcohol lamps and provisions of pemmican chocolate hardtack sugar and raisins the total outfit weighed about six hundred pounds they started at night when the snow was in better condition and found the northern branch of the muldrow which they called the mckinley glacier rising in steps like a huge staircase camp was pitched at the base of a serac between two great cliffs of solid blue ice on the third of may they reached the top of the serac at an altitude of eighty five hundred feet after a very difficult journey mr lavoy who was leading fell into a crevasse and the strain on the rope pulled mr belmore brown to the very edge mr lavoy however stuck on a ledge of ice which eased the strain without that ledge it may well be that the whole expedition would have ended in tragedy bit by bit they fought their way to the head of the glacier suffering severely from the glare of the sun though the temperature was only one degree above freezing they had now attained an altitude of eleven thousand feet and saw a low coal on the mountain ridge where they decided to make a high camp this would be about twelve thousand feet high which would leave them between three thousand and five thousand more feet to climb before they reached the basin between the north and south peaks it was now time to send the dogs home so after caching their equipment they started back for the base camp which they reached on the evening of the eighth of may some pleasant days were spent at the base camp when they left it the countryside had still been in the grip of winter but now everywhere there were grass and flowers and running streams so far they had managed well 
They had crossed the Alaskan range early enough to find the snow in good condition for dog sledding, and they had cached 300 pounds weight of mountain provisions at 11,000 feet. They could, therefore, afford to wait till the days lengthened before venturing on a final climb. Here is Mr. Belmore Brown's picture of the landscape. Quote, the mountain country at the northern base of Mount McKinley is the most beautiful stretch of wilderness that I have ever seen, and I will never forget those wonderful days when I followed up the velvety valleys or clambered among the high rocky peaks as my fancy led me. In the late evening, I have trotted downward through valleys that were so beautiful that I was forced against my will to lie down in the soft grass and drink in the wild beauty of the spot, though I knew I would be late for supper and that the stove would be cold. The mountains were bare of vegetation, with the exception of velvety carpets of green grass that swept downward from the snow fields. In the centers of the cup-shaped hollows ran streams of crystal-clear water. As the sun sank lower and lower, the hills would turn darker blue, until the cold, clean air from the snow fields would remind you that night was come and that camp was far away. End quote. The sight of big avalanches on Mount McKinley warned the explorers that great risks had to be faced. On the fifth day of June, they started out for their final attack. Unfortunately, the weather became very bad, and soon they were enveloped in a heavy snowstorm. Mr. Lavoy had hurt his knee hunting, and the ascent through the Serax was for him very arduous. The nervous strain, too, was great, for they had to be perpetually on the outlook for avalanches. They feared that one might have buried their cache, and it was an immense relief when they reached the 11,000 feet point and saw the top of their sled sticking out of the snow. They now moved their supplies up to a camp on the call of the ridge at a height of 11,800 feet. On the 19th of June, they made a reconnaissance, taking with them food for six days and intending to climb up to the big basin between the two main peaks. They reached a height of 13,200 feet up a sensational arete when Mr. Lavoy's knee gave out, and they were compelled to return. Three days later, they made a camp on the ridge at 13,600 feet. It was a wild and most laborious journey, with a drop of 5,000 feet on the left and 2,000 on the right. It would take them two hours of hard work to make 500 feet. Apart from the handicap of Mr. LeBoy's knee, Mr. Belmore Brown's eyes were very bad. They now realized that they could not reach the summit with their food supply of six days' rations, and they were forced to change their plans and go back for more food. They returned to the camp on the call and packed up ten days' rations. With tremendous difficulty, they transported them up to a 15,000-foot camp on the ridge, where they were on the edge of the big glacier-filled basin between the two summits. All three found their health beginning to suffer. The pemmican proved to be impossible food, giving them all violent stomach pains, and they were forced to confine themselves to tea and hardtack. The cold was intense, and inside the tent, with the alcohol stove burning and the warmth of three bodies, the temperature at 7.30 p.m. was 5 degrees below zero, and three hours later, 19 degrees below zero. Despite elaborate precautions, says Mr. Belmore Brown, I can say in all honesty that I did not have a single night's normal sleep above 15,000 feet on account of the cold. End quote. By this time, their appearance was, as Mr. Lavoy said, sufficient to frighten children into the straight and narrow path. All were more or less snow-blind, burnt black, unshaven, with lips, noses, and hands swollen, cracked, and bleeding. On 27th June, the packs were carried in relays to just under the last Syrac, which was the highest point in the Big Basin. The altitude was 16,615 feet. Their one comfort was that a snowfield seemed to lead easily up to the skyline of the central northeast ridge, and that from there they saw what appeared to be a reasonable gradient to the final summit. On the 28th of June, they rested and prepared for their last effort. They were now convinced that nothing could stop them except storm. The night was fine and the weather promised well for the morrow. 
the summit appeared to them to be nearly as flat with a slight hummocky rise which must be the highest point in north america on the twenty ninth of june they left camp at six a m moving very quietly and steadily and conserving their strength mr lavoy and mr belmore brown led alternately slowly they made their way up the snow slopes at the rate of about four hundred feet an hour at eighteen thousand five hundred feet they stopped and congratulated each other for they had beaten the duke of abruzzi's record on mount st elias presently they were on the skyline of the ridge and looking down on the arena where they had struggled two years before now for the first time came a threat from the weather the sky was clear to the north but from the south a great sea of clouds rolled against the mountain like surf on a shore as they moved up the ridge breathing became more difficult at nineteen thousand feet they had passed the last rock and were looking at the summit it rose as innocently as a snow-covered tennis court but now the wind was rising and the southern sky darkening and just at the base of the last lift the gale broke in a fierce scurry of snow they crawled up the round dome mr lavoy leading and hacking steps then came mr belmore brown's turn and he realized that his hands were freezing and that the bitter wind was cutting through his flesh he dare not get dry mittens from his rucksack lest his hands should be frozen during the change when his second turn was three-fourths finished professor parker's barometer registered twenty thousand feet and they were within three hundred feet at the top the rest was an evil dream to each man the other two seemed to be lost in the ice mist and the cold was freezing their marrow the storm was growing fiercer and as they topped a little rise its full fury burst upon them the story must be given in mr belmore brown's own words Quote, the breath was driven from my body and i held to my axe with stooped shoulders to stand against the gale i could not go ahead as i brushed the frost from my glasses and squinted upward through the stinging snow i saw a sight that will haunt me to my dying day the slope above me was no longer steep that was all i could see what it meant i will never know for certain all i can say is that we were close to the top End quote. there was no going on in the teeth of that gale the three chopped a seat in the ice trying to find shelter but they were not huddled there a second before they discovered they were freezing there was nothing for it but to return for the snow was obliterating their back trail dead tired and sick at heart they began the journey back and found that the steps they had cut had disappeared it took them nearly two hours to go down an easy slope of a thousand feet they reached the base of the dome guiding themselves only by the direction of the wind and at last at seven thirty five p m crawled into their upper camp all their apparel down to their underclothes was filled with ice they were beaten by the wind and by the wind only on a conservative estimate its pace was fifty five miles an hour and the temperature fifteen degrees below zero otherwise they suffered little from the altitude mr belmore brown was able to roll and smoke a cigarette between eighteen thousand and nineteen thousand feet they spent a day in their tent trying to thaw their clothes pemmican they could not touch their chocolate was finished and their food was tea sugar hardtack and raisins it was a cruel fate that they had lost ten days rations in useless pemmican since leaving their thirteen thousand two hundred feet camp and they had not only lost the food but carried useless weight they made one more attempt on the summit and reached the base of the final dome but there another storm assailed them and after waiting an hour they went back there was now a real risk of being caught with insufficient food in a blizzard which would destroy life and they made haste down the mountain they had spent seven days above fifteen thousand feet six days above sixteen thousand feet and four days above sixteen thousand six hundred fifty feet as they descended their health improved and at last they came off the glacier on to the moraine and lay down on the bare earth it was the first time for thirty days they had lain on anything but snow and ice 
they slept like logs till the afternoon and when they awoke a warm wind was blowing up the pass carrying with it the smell of grass and flowers never can i forget says mr belmore brown the flood of emotions that swept over me professor parker and lavoy were equally affected by this first smell of the lowlands and we were wet-eyed and chattered like children as we prepared our packs for the last stage of our journey End quote. How dangerous was the climatic condition of the mountain may be judged from what happened on the evening of 6th of July. From their camp in the foothills, they saw the sky suddenly turn a sickly green. There came a deep rumbling from the Alaskan range, and as they looked, the mountains melted into mist and the earth began to heave and roll. In front of them, a boulder weighing 200 pounds broke loose from the earth and moved. The surface of the hills seemed to open, and the cracks to spout liquid mud. The whole range was wrapped in dust, and as it cleared they saw the peaks sprouting avalanches. Had this earthquake overtaken them on the high ground, all must have perished. The story has always seemed to me one of the boldest and most patient adventures in the history of mountaineering. Slowly, the travelers fought their way to the discovery of the only practical route. Mount McKinley was conquered, though they had failed to cover the hundred or so feet which would have given them the actual summit. They had blazed the path to the top and solved its mysteries. Only that maleficent blizzard at the last moment robbed them of the full fruit of six years' pioneering. Next year, the actual summit was reached. The late Dr. Hudson stuck the archdeacon of the Yukon, ever since he came to the country nine years before, had contemplated an attempt on the mountain. In the autumn of 1912, he sent on supplies by way of the Cantitia River to a point 50 miles from the base. In March 1913, he and Mr. W. P. Karstens set out to reach the peak from the north. At their base camp, 4,000 feet up, they made a fresh supply of caribou pemmican, which proved more satisfactory than that used by Professor Parker and Mr. Belmore Brown. The road taken was the same as that of their predecessors, up the Muldrow Glacier and then up the central northeast ridge. They found that the earthquake of 1912 had completely changed the character of that ridge, and instead of being a reasonable snow gradient, it had become a confused mass of rock and ice most difficult to surmount. Bit by bit, they forced their way up it till they reached the upper basin, and then, being favored with clear, bright, still weather, they managed to attain the highest point, the southern summit. There had been a story of two miners called McGonagall and Anderson who had reached the top in 1910. Dr. Stuck discovered that the top they had reached was the lesser northern peak, for he saw the remains of their flagstaff. With this ascent, the story of the conquest of Mount McKinley is complete. Footnote. Dr. Stuck argued with much reason that the present name of the mountain is unsuitable and that the Indian name, Denali, which means the Great One, should be restored. It is to be feared that the suggestion comes too late in the day. Ever since the expedition of 1906, Mount McKinley has become too familiar a name in the Western Hemisphere to be readily changed for another. The story of the Parker Brown expedition is contained in the conquest of Mount McKinley, New York, Putnam's 1913, and that of Dr. Stuck in the ascent of Denali, New York, Scribner's 1914. End of chapter 6「The spell of far Arabia has been a potent thing from the days when the Egyptians drew wealth from this spice land of Punt, and Greek traders brought stories of the guns and jewels of Araby the Blessed. But ever since it became the holy land of Islam, a veil of secrecy, other than that of its stern climate and inhospitable deserts, has descended upon it. It is one of the oldest of arenas of adventure, and it is still one of the least exploited. Indeed, in its great southern desert, it holds one of the few unriddled mysteries of the globe. Except for the semi-mythical Gregorio, who may be read of in Albuquerque's commentaries, 
no one who did not profess the creed of islam has entered its two holy cities and lived but the greatest tale of arabian exploration is not concerned with mecca and medina it is to be found rather in the journeys of the english soldier captain sadlier in nejit of sir richard burton in the land of midian of wallen who crossed the great nafud sands of william gifford palgrave who may or may not have been an agent of napoleon the third and above all of charles montague doughty who as an avowed christian explored the northern hejaz and in his arabia deserta has written one of the foremost classics of travel in the english tongue compared with some of these wanderings a visit to the holy cities was a simple matter requiring only a firm nerve a good knowledge of arabic and of mohammedan ritual and a real or professed adherence to the creed of islam at the beginning of this century the list of europeans who had entered mecca and medina was a long one they were mostly renegades french english irish scottish and italian in eighteen o seven a certain domingo badia ileblich of cadiz traveling as a moslem prince called ali bey and probably in the pay of napoleon entered mecca in state but he had become a genuine mussulman in eighteen fifteen one thomas keith a deserter from the seventy-second highlanders was governor of medina surely one of the strangest posts ever held even by a scot the great european travellers like burckhardt wallen and burton went to the holy cities in order that by attaining the rank and fame of a haji they might win an advantage for travelling in other moslem lands more than one of them has described minutely the interior of both mecca and medina and the ritual of the great ceremonies the holy places though few western eyes have seen them were sufficiently well known to the western world their true unveiling may be said to have come about during the great war when hassein the sheriff of mecca fought as an ally with the british and as king of the hejaz proclaimed his independence of turkey yet one journey was taken just before the great war which must rank by itself it told the world nothing that was not known before but it had the merit of giving a picture of mecca and medina under the latest conditions a picture drawn with such vigor and in such detail that it may fairly claim to have revealed the holy cities in a new light to the ordinary man mr a j b wavell greatly distinguished himself in command of arab scouts in east africa in the early part of the great war and was responsible for the brilliant affair at ghazi in that campaign he gave his life for his country he had been at winchester and in nineteen o eight when he made the plan for visiting mecca had been living for some time at mombasa where he had acquired arabic and swahili and a considerable knowledge of moslem customs his motive was partly curiosity partly as he says to accustom himself to arab ways with a view to further explorations in arabia and partly in order to obtain the useful prestige of a haji he chose as his companions a certain abdul wahid an arab from aleppo who was established in berlin and masaudi a mobasa native the three met at marseilles on september twenty third nineteen o eight they started in good time for though the pilgrimage was not to take place till the beginning of the following january mr wavell wanted to go first to medina and also to prepare himself by a preliminary discipline in eastern life he managed to secure a turkish passport which described him as one ali bin mohammed aged twenty-five a subject of zanzibar on his way to mecca the three found a vessel at genoa which took them to alexandria where they managed not without trouble to get their medicine chest pistols and ammunition past the customs they then took passages on the cadival mail ship for beirut mr wavell had feared that the language difficulty would be serious but he found it less formidable than expected since the dialects of arabic are many he explained to those who found imperfections in his accent that in zanzibar the colloquial language was swahili and that no one talked arabic 
and on the few occasions when he had to speak Swahili, he inverted the story, announcing that, having been born in Muscat, his real language was Arabic. As Sir Richard Burton discovered in his own journey, it was rare indeed to find anyone sufficiently well acquainted with both languages to find him out. Meantime, he had changed at Alexandria into Arab clothes and shaved his head. They reached Beirut safely and proceeded at once by rail to Damascus. As they did not propose to start from Medina for some weeks, they took rooms and settled down, devoting great attention to the various Moslem ceremonies and picking up the right kind of phrases and quotations and greetings. It is on such small things that the efficacy of a disguise depends. There are nearly as many white men at Mecca, Mr. Wavell writes in his account of his adventures, as there are men black or brown in color. Syrian Arabs not infrequently have fair hair and blue eyes, as likewise have some of the natives of the holy cities themselves. I was once asked what color I stained myself for this journey. The question reveals the curious ignorance that lies at the bottom of the so-called race prejudice, of which some people are so proud. You might as well black yourself all over to play Hamlet. End quote. Abdul Wahid had brought letters of introduction to a local merchant, who was most hospitable and supervised the preparations for the journey. They passed safely through the period of Ramadan, and so complete was Mr. Wabell's get-up, and so stalwart his Moslem respectability, that it was with some difficulty that he prevented a middle-aged lady and her two daughters from joining his party for the pilgrimage. He bought the iram, the white robes which are required when entering Mecca, a full camp equipment, and a certain number of stores, and deposited his money with his merchant friend who gave him two checks on his agents, one at Medina and one at Mecca. He proposed to travel to Medina by the Hejaz Railway, a very different method from those used by earlier adventurers when aiming at Mecca. The third-class carriages were desperately crowded, and the train started to the accompaniment of gramophones, a modern invention which is very popular in the Hejaz. On the way, Mr. Wavell had a touch of malaria, and his fellow pilgrims showed him every kindness. Presently, the train reached Medain Sala, the boundary of the Hejaz, which no infidel is permitted to pass. On the fourth day, the rocky hills opened, and through a gap appeared the minarets of the Prophet's Mosque. They arrived at Medina in the middle of a battle, for the Turkish garrison had come to loggerheads with a neighboring Bedouin, and the holy city was more or less in a state of siege. The railway was spoiling trade for the neighboring tribes, and they were demanding compensation, which Constantinople would not pay. Medina lies in an open plain some 3,000 feet above sea level. To the south, the country is open, but on the north and west, between 5 and 10 miles distant, rise rocky mountains. The city, which has a population of some 30,000, lives entirely on the pilgrims, just as an English watering place lives on summer visitors. The pilgrims are classified by their lands of origin, and there are official guides called Mutoafs attached to each group. The first trouble arose from these guides. If Mr. Wavell went about with the Zanzibar Mutoafs, he was certain to meet someone who knew him in Mombasa, even if he were not caught out in the language. So it was arranged that Abdul Wahid should profess to come from Baghdad, while Mr. Wavell passed as a dervish and Masoudi as his slave. A dervish, which denotes properly a member of a certain monastic order, is a title occasionally assumed by pilgrims who do not wish to be identified with any particular nationality. Happily, at the station there were no Zanzibar guides, and the party were able to find rooms in a retired corner at the moderate rate of two pounds a month. The landlord was an Abyssinian called Iman, a man of some private means who had been captured as a child by Arab slavers and sold in Mecca. He proved a most useful friend to the party during their stay. So began a curious life of endless religious observations. 
Apart from the sacred places which few European eyes had beheld, there was a perpetual interest in the study of the pilgrims. Quote, a large caravan came in from Yembu, bringing crowds of Indians, Javanese, and Chinamen. Every eastern race might be identified in the motley crowd, and every variety of costume, till the whole resembled nothing so much as a fancy dress ball. In the same line of prayer stand European Turks with their frock coats and stick-up collars, Anatolians with enormous trousers and fantastic weapons, Arabs from the West, who look as if they were arrayed for burial, the Bedou or Bedouin with their spears and scimitars, and Indians who, in spite of their being the richest class there, managed, as usual, to look the most unkempt and the least clean. Then, besides, were the Persians, Chinese, Javanese, Japanese, Malayans, a dozen different African races, Egyptians, Afghans, Baluchis, Swahili, and Arabs of every description. End quote. Representatives of half the races of the globe may be picked out in the mosque any day during the month before the pilgrimage. The behavior of the pilgrims, who now saw with their own eyes the tomb of the prophet, which from their childhood they had been taught to regard with awe, was a proof of the living reality of the Islamic faith. Quote, Many burst into tears and frantically kissed the railings. I have seen Indians and Afghans fall down apparently unconscious. They seem to be much more affected here than before the Kaaba itself. At Mecca, the feeling is of awe and reverence. Here, the personal element comes in. The onlooker might fancy that they were visiting the tomb of some dear friend, one whom they had actually known and been intimate with in his lifetime. With frantic interest, they listened to their guides as they described the surroundings. Here is the place where the prophet prayed, the pulpit he preached from, the pillar against which he leaned. There, looking to the mosque, is the window of Abu Bakr's house, where for long he stayed as a guest. And beyond is the little garden planted by his daughter Fatima. End quote. Moreover, there is no suggestion of infidel authority. The Moslem standard floats over the town, Moslem cannon protect its gates, and no unbeliever may enter. But there are startling touches of modernity. In the shops, you may buy European tin goods and note advertisements of Cadbury's chocolates and Huntley and Palmer's biscuits. The party had brought introductions from Damascus, and Abdul Wahid had made various friends, so they saw a good deal of society. The time was just after the rising of the Young Turks and the grant of the Constitution. Mr. Wavell, who was a staunch Tory, found to his disgust that everyone talked parliamentarianism and liberal principles. England and the English were everywhere in high favor because of our attitude in this recent quarrel with Austria over the annexation of Bosnia. Quote, I am afraid I managed to give the impression that Zanzibar is a sadly backward state, or that I myself am peculiarly stupid. Not to know a word of any European language is to be held very ignorant, even in Medina. Most people of the class whom I associated had at any rate a smattering of French, and sometimes of English too. I was careful never to know anything. End quote. Their stay in Medina was much enlivened by the Bedouin siege. Mr. Wavell tried to get enlisted in the defense force, and when that plan failed, succeeded in getting into a very warm corner just outside the gates. They visited, like industrious tourists, every possible place of interest, and few pilgrims could have spent a more enlightening three weeks. During the whole time, they were never in real danger. They had, indeed, a scuffle with a Persian Matoff, who would insist that Mr. Ovell was a Persian. But by vigorous bluffing, they made him apologize, and afterwards employed him as a guide. Once only was there a hint of trouble. Masoudi, standing in the mosque one day before the noonday prayer, found himself face to face with five Mombasa Swahilis who knew him intimately, and what was worse, knew Mr. Wavell. Masoudi showed remarkable gifts of mendacity. 
he said that he had left mr wabell in england and having saved a little money thought the present was a good time to perform the pilgrimage he was in medina he said as a servant of some rich egyptian pilgrims as he walked back after prayer he dropped his string of beads the swahilis asked where his house was and he promised to show it to them but halfway up the street he suddenly remembered the beads bolted back and lost himself in the crowd the incident convinced mr wabell that he had better start without delay for mecca their plan was to go to the coast at yembu for which a caravan was starting at once they arranged for three camels one to carry a shugduf which is a cross between a pannier and a howda and the other two for luggage and they brought the necessary food they took with them a persian called jaffa as a cook and his brother ibrahim as a general servant the luggage was carried down to the big square where the caravan was parked and where the travelers had to pass the night that evening there occurred an untoward event mr wavell was going to a shop for some small purchase when he met two matuafs who demanded to know his nationality the matuafs being a strict trades union were convinced that he was defrauding the brotherhood he took a high line and showed his pistol and fortunately his late landlord came down the street at the moment and took his side what might have been an ugly experience ended in a minor street brawl the journey to yembu was little better than a nightmare the fashionable road from medina to mecca is overland or back to damascus and so direct to jidda by the suez canal only poor people go by the yembu route which is supposed to be the most hazardous and the roughest in the hejaz there were no escort or police arrangements no daily market and each traveler had to carry his own provisions and water the bedouin hired out the camels which numbered about five thousand and a badawi sheik was in charge the countryside was infested by robbers who constantly cut off stragglers the ground too was difficult going being a rough mountain land and while the noons were scorching the nights were bitterly cold every night an encampment was made roughly circular in shape into which the whole caravan was packed in the smallest possible space Quote, while i was trying to get warm a man stumbled against me and nearly knocked me into the fire turning round i was shocked to see a figure stained almost from head to foot with blood from a tremendous gash in the head obviously a sword cut he asked for water and i went into the tent to get him some but returning found him gone we heard the next day that no less than six men had been murdered that night and many others wounded and so it went on until we reached yembu these unfortunates were mostly people who could not afford camels and so had to perform the journey on foot straying from the main body in search of firewood they got picked up by the marauders hanging on the flanks who seized every opportunity to plunder such stragglers of their miserable possessions and killed unhesitatingly anyone who resisted it was in this country that charles doty spent part of his time and mr wavell thinks that one reason of his success was that he carried nothing worth stealing the fact that doty denied neither his religion nor his nationality seemed to him not the most remarkable fact about the achievement Quote, the bedou themselves are not fanatical on these points and he did not attempt to enter the forbidden cities of course the fact of a stranger being a christian is always a good excuse for knocking him on the head but failing it they will soon find another if they want to do so and will be quite uninfluenced by it if they don't End quote. they had one row with their camel man sod who tried to extort backsheesh suddenly he quieted down and became all politeness to the end of the journey the reason for this was that the resourceful liar ibrahim had told him that mr wavell was a nephew of the governor of yembu this story served the travelers well it spread through the caravan and many of the pilgrims who were being blackmailed by their camel men came to him and begged his protection and received it at last on the dawn of the sixth day after trekking without a stop for the last twenty hours they reached the gates of yembu 
Here they were delayed some time, owing to the fact that the pilgrim ship to take them to Jidda, an old Greek vessel chartered by a syndicate of Persians, would not start till its owners considered that sufficient pilgrims had arrived. Abdul Wahid now became the popular leader. At the head of a mob of passengers, he seized the Persians and carried them off to the governor. Mounted on a pile of sugar bags, he delivered an impassioned address, concluding with, quote, We had better be dealing with Christians than Moslems who cheat their brethren in this fashion. End quote. Murmurs of protest, says Mr. Ravel, deprecated this revolting comparison. We all thought he was going a little too far. End quote. The Persians finally capitulated, and the ship got under way. But there came one last contretemps. A party of Maghrebi Arabs had passed the quarantine and were halfway out to the ship when one of them died. The shore authorities refused to let them land again, and the Persians declined to take the corpse aboard. The Arabs could not throw it into the sea because there were certain ceremonial washings to be performed and certain prayers to be said. An Egyptian lawyer on board gave it as his opinion that the man, having taken his ticket, was entitled to his passage dead or alive, there being no saving clause in the contract. Finally, the Maghrebis got sick of arguing, swarmed over the bulwarks, and hoisted up their departed comrade. Their fierce faces and long knives settled the point of law. At half past four in the afternoon, the siren blew to announce that the pilgrims were within that latitude where they must exchange their ordinary clothes for the Iram the garb which has to be worn by all travelers who attain a certain distance from Mecca. The costume consists of two white bath towels, one worn round the loins and the other over the shoulders. The head is unprotected, but deaths from sunstroke are singularly few. The costume is not becoming, especially in the case of a fat man. Quote, a party of elderly European Turks close to us look peculiarly ludicrous, their appearance suggesting members of the Athenaean club suddenly evicted from a Turkish bath. The party remained four days at Jidda, visiting, among other places, the tomb of Eve, who apparently was about a quarter of a mile in height, so it was a tiring business to make the necessary perambulation of her sepulchre. Owing to their behavior at Yembu, they had acquired much kudos among the pilgrims and had no difficulties during their stay. The only anxiety was about the Mombasa Swahilis and also about a certain Mombasa sheik who knew Mr. Wavell and was proposing to go to Mecca that year. As neither sheik nor Swahilis arrived, they decided to risk it and go on to Mecca after Mr. Wavell had left a letter for the sheik requesting him to hold his tongue. They found a Mutoaf, who was a local agent of one of the principal Mecca guides, to whom he wrote recommending them. They never intended to employ this guide, but the recommendation gave them an excuse to refuse to employ others. Having taken every precaution they could think of, they prepared for the last stage of the journey. Quote, Abdul Wahid made a vow that if he returned safely, he would present three dollars to the poor of Jeddah. We told him we thought he was asking the Almighty to do it for too cheaply, and that he had much better make it a sovereign. To our disgust, when he did get back, he utterly declined to disgorge the promised sum. The journey from Jidda to Mecca can be performed in a day, for it is only some forty miles. The road is protected by a line of blockhouses. Every mile or so there is a restaurant or a booth for refreshment, and all day long during the pilgrimage season there is a continuous caravan. A strange silence broods over everything. There is no shouting or singing or firing of guns, and the camels move over the deep, soft sand with scarcely a sound, for to the Moslem it is the approach to the Holy of Holies. Quote, to him it is a place hardly belonging to this world, overshadowed like the tabernacle of old by the almost tangible presence of the deity. Five times daily throughout his life has he turned his face toward the city, whose mysteries he is now about to view with his own eyes. Moreover, according to the common belief, 
pilgrimage brings certain responsibilities and even perils with its manifold blessings good deeds in mecca count many thousand times their value elsewhere but sin that is committed there will reap its reward in hell End quote. mr wobell and his companions decently but simply clad in their bath towels approached the city repeating the ceremonial prayers to one which began o lord who hast brought me in safety to this place do thou bring me safely out again he said a fervid amen mecca lies in a deep-cut hollow of the hills and is not visible till travellers are at its gates presently they found themselves in the great square which contains the kaaba the black covering of which is in startling contrast with the dazzling white marble of the pavement the kaaba itself is a cube about forty feet square built of granite blocks and led into the wall as a great black stone this stone is believed to have fallen from heaven which it probably did as it is clearly a meteorite barefooted the little party moved round it the requisite seven times chanting the proper prayers then a small circular patch of hair was shaved from their heads and the first part of the ceremony was over mecca was then under the semi-independent rule of sheriff hassein and on the whole seemed to be well governed but the problems of the municipal authorities in looking after the vast crowd of pilgrims was no easy one as at medina every race on earth was represented there mr wavell was most struck by the javanese who were present in great numbers for there was then a strong islamic revival in the far east the party found comfortable lodgings in a quiet street and as at medina went much into society owing to the wide acquaintance of abdul wahid mecca is one of the few places remaining where there is an open slave market and female slaves may be bought for prices ranging from twenty pounds to one hundred pounds though georgians and circassians fetch more a saudi discovered an acquaintance in a boy called kepi from mombasa whose father had died on the pilgrimage and was now left destitute kepi was accordingly attached to the party mr wavell heard the good news that the mombasa sheik whose coming he had been warned of had now written saying that he would not arrive that year the time passed pleasantly in sightseeing and giving and receiving hospitality mr wavell gave one dinner to no less than twelve guests which since he had an excellent cook was very successful there are few more curious incidents in the literature of travel than this party given by a disguised christian in the moslem holy of holies to a company which included arabs from bussorah and mecca two persian merchants and a turkish officer from the baghdad corps most western luxuries can be obtained in mecca including ice cream which according to mr Wavell, is a frozen mixture of tin milk dirty water and cholera germs alcoholic liquor can also be got if you know where to go for it the great festival was now approaching a white linen band was fastened round the black covering of the kaaba which remained there till the great day when that covering was changed a new covering is brought every year from egypt made of dull black silk and cotton embroidered with the name of god on every square foot it is prepared in constantinople and is said to cost three thousand six hundred pounds the main ceremony of the festival is as follows on a certain fixed day all adults must leave the city before nightfall and go to a village called mina some five miles to the north they pass the night there and go nine miles farther on the next morning to mount arafat where they remain till sunset they then return and sleep at nimrah halfway between arafat and mina the third day they must be back at nina in the morning go through the ceremony of throwing stones at the three devils proceed to mecca for other ceremonies and return to mina for the night the fourth day is spent at mina and at noon on the fifth day they return to mecca the bath towels of the iram are now relinquished and the pilgrim dons the best new clothes which he can afford he is then entitled to the name of haji and thereafter throughout life can wear a special headgear such as a green turban 
the exodus from the city to mina was a strange sight the different holy carpets were escorted by regiments and brass bands that of egypt marching to the tune of barren rocks of aden sheriff hudsine was there on horseback accompanied by a crowd of spearmen and a squadron of racing camels the ride to mina beggared description the best idea of what it is like mr wavell wrote will be gained by considering that at least half a million people are traversing these nine miles of road between sunrise and ten o'clock this day that about half of them are mounted and that many of them possess baggage animals as well the roar of this great column is like a breaking sea, and the dust spreads for miles over the surrounding country. When, passing through the second defile, we came in sight of Arafat itself, the spectacle was stranger still. The hill was literally black with people, and tents were springing up around it, hundreds to the minute, in an ever-widening circle. As we approached, a dull murmur caused by thousands of people shouting the formula, Lebeka, Lebeka, Alahuma, Lebeka, which had long been audible, became so loud that it dominated every other sound. In the distance it sounded rather ominous, suggestive of some deep disturbance of great power, like the rumble of an earthquake. End quote. The hygienic conditions of the Exodus were, of course, abominable. Tanks and springs were soon fouled by people bathing in them and the condition of the hillside was filthy beyond description. Often some infectious disease like cholera decimates the pilgrims, but our travelers were fortunate in escaping it. They went through all the proper ceremonies and stoned the three devils at Mina with gusto. The three devils are three stone pillars, and in a mob of many thousands of bad shots, a good many pilgrims are bound to suffer. They bought a sheep to sacrifice, like the others, and a mess of offal and blood was soon added to the attractions of the countryside. They then went back to Mecca, kissed the black stone, had another square inch of hair shaved from their temples, and were free to put off the bath towels. Now was the moment for the new clothes. Abdul Wahid appeared in a bilious yellow garment brought from Damascus. Masoudi in an obsolete regimental mess waistcoat while Mr. Wavell was chastely arrayed in white cloth robes, a black jubba, and a gold sash with a dagger. Thus attired, they set out again for Mina for the last ceremonies. In the night, a thief got into their tent and carried off Masoudi's new turban, five dollars in gold, various oddments, including a couple of pistols. In the morning, they went to salute the sheriff, and when they had returned and were sitting in their tent, passed through the most dangerous moment of the adventure. The wall of the tent was down, as is usual in the heat of the day, and they were squatting on the carpet, when suddenly they heard an exclamation from Masaudi. Looking round, they saw, standing within a few feet of them and looking straight into the tent, three of the Mombasa Swahilis whom they had met at Medina. It scarcely seemed possible that they could miss seeing Masoudi, and if they did, they would certainly come into the tent to greet him, when Mr. Wavell was bound to be recognized. The morning sun, however, was shining right in their eyes, so they saw nothing and passed on. As soon as they had turned their backs, Mr. Wavell and Masudi ran out of the tent on the other side and mingled with the crowd. They returned to Mecca to be congratulated by their friends on the successful accomplishment of the pilgrimage, and Mr. Wavell was free to go into the world as Haji Ali bin Muhammad. It was now their business to get out of Mecca as soon as possible, especially as money was running low. They paid the necessary farewell visits, hired the transport, and started, intending to do the journey in one day. They were, however, held up by a sentry on the road, and had to spend a cold and comfortless night in the open. It did not enter Jeddah till sunrise. At Jeddah they separated. Masaudi went to Mombasa, Abdul Wahid to Persia, and Mr. Wavell to Egypt. In summing up the expedition, Mr. Wavell was disposed to attribute his success not to any histrionic gifts of his own, but to the ignorance of the inhabitants of the holy cities and their lack of interest in the outside world, even the Islamic world. Quote, 
there are so many different sects in islam and its adherents are found in so many different countries that i seriously believe that if someone invented for himself a country and a language that did not exist at all and journeyed thus to mecca no one there would know enough geography to find him out yet withal they are quick enough in their way and if some matuoff would take the trouble to write a book on ethnography and its relation to islam of the day and classify the different races that come to mecca such a deception as i practiced would become impossible they did as a matter of fact excite a certain suspicion and their two servants though they were persians and knew little arabic must have had their own views the great assets of the travelers were their knowledge of arabic and moslem ceremonial and the fact that mr wavell took up his disguise long before he approached the hejaz he considered that medina was much the more dangerous place of the two and that no traveller should go there who was not thoroughly at home in his oriental character whatever may be said the journey is one of extreme danger and delicacy and demands not only great knowledge but perpetual vigilance it must be remembered that a european is all the time in the midst of a fanatical and devout people and that the highest merit would be acquired by anyone who might discover and denounce the unbeliever in spite of every precaution there must be an enormous element of luck and mr wavell's conclusion is that his escape was due rather to a series of happy chances than to his own good management end of chapter seven chapter eight the exploration of new guinea almost every part of the globe has suffered some change in the past century it may have altered its appearance by settlement and cultivation and the growth of cities or if it still remains a wilderness there are routes of commerce through it which bring it to the knowledge of the world but the great island of new guinea is almost as little changed today by the advent of white adventurers as when in the year fifteen twenty seven jorge de meneses the portuguese governor of the spice islands first landed on its swampy shores in fifteen forty five eighteen years later it received the name by which it is known today the portuguese empire decayed and during the seventeenth century the dutch appeared in the eighteenth century many famous voyagers like dampier carteret and captain cook touched the island and in the last century the rapid opening up of the world by travellers and missionaries bore fruit even in those remote seas the dutch held the western end in eighteen eighty four germany laid claim to the northeastern part and that same year the southeastern section which had been formally taken over in eighteen eighty three by queensland was annexed to the british crown in eighteen ninety nine the dutch boundary was delimited and holland with the assent of the powers assumed direct control of her share the one change today in these arrangements is that the former german section is now administered under mandate by the commonwealth of australia the first decade of this century saw great exploring activity on the part of all three european masters the dutch especially did excellent work and Dr. Lorentz was the first man to reach the snows of the inland mountains. But few of the secrets of the island, geographical, zoological, and botanical, have yet been unriddled. The place is so remote from Europe, its climate is so deadly, its inhabitants so treacherous, and its forests and swamps so impenetrable, that exploration there is in many ways a more desperate undertaking than anywhere else on the globe. I have selected two expeditions as an example of what the pioneer must undergo. In 1910, the Ornithologists' Union set out an expedition to investigate the new Kinney fauna and collect specimens. Captain Cecil Rowling, whose thirst for the unknown was unquenchable, accompanied it on the geographical side, and Mr. A. F. R. Wollaston as medical officer. There was no proper survey equipment, as the mission was primarily one of naturalists. Ten Gurkhas were enlisted from India, and the Dutch government supplied a certain number of Javanese troops. 
Coolies also were recruited in Java, who turned out to be hopelessly unsuitable both in physique and character for any serious travel in the wilds. The majority were about sixteen years of age, and they appeared in the jungle decently dressed in black frock coats and bowler hats. The part selected was the southern coast of the Dutch territory, and it was Captain Rawlings' hope that they would be able to penetrate to that belt of snow mountains at the head of the coastal rivers, running from the Nassau Range in the west to Wilhelmina Peak in the east, where Dr. Lorenz had been the pioneer. Obviously, it was vital to find a river which would take them direct to the hills but they had no previous information to go upon, and were compelled to select their stream at random. Had they gone farther east and chosen the Utaqua, they would have found a current navigable for an ocean-going steamer for 17 miles from its mouth, and for launches for many miles more. A river, moreover, running directly from the highest snows of Mount Karstens. As it was, they hit upon a river called the Mamika, a small, jungle-fed stream rising in the low foothills sixty miles to the west of Karstens, and twenty miles or so short of the main range. The Mamika, too, was full of endless windings and liable to sudden and violent floodings. Hence, it was of little use to the expedition in the way of transport. This was the more regrettable, since transport was the essence of the problem. From the foothills of the mountains to the sea lies a belt of forest like a barbed wire entanglement. This forest is so dense that the cutting of a road can only progress at the rate of a hundred yards a day. It is swampy and often in flood time under water and filled with every form of noxious insect life. Unless this nightmare land can be circumvented by the use of a broad river channel, it must take even a strong party many months before they reach the base of the hills. This was what happened to Captain Rawling. On January 26th, 1910, after a base camp had been established at Wakatimi, not far from the Mimika mouth, he set off to ascend the river. Here is his description of the country. Quote, it is quite impossible for anyone who has not visited these parts of New Guinea to realize the density of the forest growth. The vegetation, through which only the scantiest glimpses of the sky can be obtained, appears to form, as it were, two great horizontal strata. The first comprises the giant trees, whose topmost boughs are a 150 feet or more above the ground. The other, the bushes, shrubs, and trees of lesser growth, which never attain a greater height than 30 to 40 feet. Such is the richness of the soil that not one square foot remains untenanted, and the never-ending struggle to reach upwards towards the longed-for light goes on silently and relentlessly. Creepers and parasites in endless variety cling to every stem, slowly but surely throttling their hosts. From tree to tree their tentacles stretch out, seizing on to the first projecting branch and limb and forming such a close and tangled mass that the dead and dying giants of the forest are prevented from falling to the ground. The various devices recommended in the books of one's childhood, and it may be added in learned books as well, whereby the traveler is enabled to recover a lost trail or regain the right direction, are here of no avail. For instance, Moss does not grow more on one side of a tree trunk than on the other. Trees do not lean away from the prevailing wind, nor is the position of the sun a guide, for it is seldom visible. In fact, the traveler has nothing to rely upon but the compass or a local guide, and even the latter is often at fault. Hopeless indeed does the outlook appear when the wanderer, hedged in by a wall of scrub and creeper which limits his vision to a distance of ten or twelve yards, realizes that he has lost his bearings. When the vastness of the forest seems to press upon him, and there is no sound to be heard but the drip, drip of the water-laden trees and the bubbling of the stinking bog underfoot, his only chance of escape is to find a stream and follow it down till it joins a main river. End quote. The first big episode was the discovery of the pygmies who lived in the foothills and were assiduously hunted by the forest tribes. 
The average height of these little men was four feet seven inches, and Captain Rawling penetrated to their village in a clearing above the headwaters of the Mamika. The Mamika's source was reached, but led them nowhere, and they fared no better with another small stream to the west, called the Capare. Then, by accident, a secret native path was discovered running eastward, a mere tunnel in the matted forest. By this route, they were able to reach a parallel river called the Tuaba, which was a tributary of the larger Camura. From a village called Ibo as a center, the expedition made various casts east and north, but found it impossible to get near the skirts of the hills. Captain Rawling returned to the coast and made excursions along the eastern shore, but found no adjacent river mouth which promised better. By this time it was June, and the floods began with such vigor that practically the whole country between the mountains and the sea was under water. When the floods ebbed, a resolute attempt was made to push east from Ebo, and with a good deal of trouble, another parallel stream was reached, called the Wataiqua. The party founded a camp there, and explored the upper waters of that stream. Traveling was extremely difficult, because the only decent road was the riverbed, and this route was promptly made impossible by a new spate. The travelers had to face the fact that the farther they went eastward, the greater became the labor of carrying supplies, for their base camp remained on the Mimica. Still, an effort must be made unless the expedition was to admit failure. It was decided that the best plan was to try and cut a road through the forest to the next stream on the east, in the hope that it would lead them into the hills. This was done, and the Iwaka River was reached after much severe toil. They had entered a desperate country strewn with moss-covered boulders and seamed with gullies covered with an impenetrable mass of timber. The density of this growth was unbelievable. Through it, no man could force a way unless with an axe in hand, and as most of the trees were of a very hard wood, the stems varying from four to eight inches in diameter, and clothed from top to bottom with damp earth covered with moss, progress at times became impossible. An idea of the labor involved in the task of clearing a two-foot path through this forest may be judged by the fact that a stretch of 5,000 yards required three weeks' constant work before a man could pass freely along. On one day, two cutters achieved a length of 210 yards, and on another, when Captain Rawling was working by himself, all he could add was a piece of 90 yards in length. No wonder, he asks, quote, can this forest, with its horrible monotony and impregnability, be equaled by any other in the world? Unquote. Down came the rain again, and in August the country was all under water. The advance was not renewed till the beginning of 1911, when fresh supplies had arrived from England, and the old motor boat had been put in repair. So far, a year's hard labor had not taken the explorers within measurable distance of their goal. With the help of a launch, food supplies for eight weeks were stored at the head of the Mamika. One story may be quoted as a piece of comic relief in a very grim campaign. On the 4th of January, two men quarreled in camp and killed each other. Quote, the sergeant, who by the way was a foreigner, took charge of the burial ceremonials and was evidently quite determined that, for his part, nothing should be lacking which the importance of the occasion demanded. Drawing his sword and placing himself between the graves, he harangued the spectators. Men, he said, this day two servants of the government have lost their lives at the hands of each other. Were they not both good men? Hein? One man, very bad man, chipped in an officious convict, but a glance from the offended sergeant made him wish that he had never spoken. Whether they will both go to heaven I cannot say, exclaimed he, but I think Allah, pointing upward with his sword, will first purge them with a fire. Take this as a lesson. Then, drawing himself up to his full height as befitted the occasion, he returned his sword with a clank to the scabbard, and as far as the public was concerned, the ceremony was at an end. The sergeant, however, had not yet finished. 
returning to his hut he refreshed himself with a few glasses of gin and played on the mouth organ the national anthems of the three flags under which he had served this terminated the funeral of obsequies and with the exception of the official report and the entry in the accounts to one bottle gin for disinfecting corpse nothing remained to mark the sanguinary affair the iwaka was safely reached and the last stage began at first the advance was up its right bank but this only brought the travellers back to the upper glen of the wateiqua which they had already found impossible it was clear that the iwaka must be crossed and the ridges to the east ascended getting over that stream was an ugly business and it was achieved only by the heroism of one of the gurkhas who managed to haul himself hand over hand along a thin rope captain rawling records that it was quote, one of the best actions carried out in cold blood that i have ever had the good fortune to witness end quote. a rough bridge was constructed and on the morning of february eighth nineteen eleven thirteen months after their first landing on the coast the party had at last a road to the upper ridges it was thick misty weather and of the farther mountains they had only an occasional glimpse camp was pitched at an altitude of five thousand four hundred feet but not on solid ground for all the climbing had been done to the top of live or dead timber the following morning they hacked their way to a clear space on the ridge at a height of five thousand six hundred feet and there they were at last favored with a view for which they had longed and were able to fix the position of the main peaks looking southward they saw the sea and between it and them the dark green of the forest through which they had struggled for so many months the gloom was broken at rare intervals by a streak of light which was a river nearly five miles away stood mount godman and beyond it the huge southern face of the range a gigantic black cliff eighty miles from east to west with a clear drop of nearly a mile and three quarters by far the greatest precipice in the world behind this scarp rose the snow mountains mount leonard darwin to the northwest thirteen thousand eight hundred eighty two feet and to the northeast mount indenburg fifteen thousand three hundred seventy nine feet and the glittering top of karstens which is almost sixteen thousand feet the great peak seemed below a mass of wild black precipices cleft with fissures but above a long easy snow field curving gently to the summits it was such a view as the old portuguese adventurers might have had when after struggling for months through the coastal jungles they suddenly came in sight of kenya or kilimanjaro but for captain rawling and his party it would be no more than a pigsaw sight advance was impossible the fatal choice of the mamika route meant that they had taken the worst road conceivable to the great snows the attainment of the peaks must be left to their successors he who would understand the full difficulties and miseries of that expedition must read captain rawling's own narrative rarely has a more thoroughly comfortless expedition been undertaken to begin with the food was bad and unsuitable for they had the surplus stores from shackleton's antarctic expedition and the joys of bully beef pea soup and pickles under an equatorial sky may be imagined it was impossible to get good local assistance for the natives were a preposterous race treacherous and unreliable when they were not actively malevolent they were subject to sudden panics when they fled into the jungle and to wild outbursts of sorrow when they would weep and sob for hours the imported javanese were if possible more hopeless then there was every kind of noxious insect mosquitoes without end gigantic leeches dangling from every leaf which made a specialty of attacking the eyeballs ticks stinking caterpillars immense blue bottles which swarmed in clouds over any food left uncovered crickets which ate up a man's clothes in a night and a plague of minute bees which settled in myriads on the heated face of the traveller above all there was the rain the whole country was waterlogged by the flooding rivers and the incessant deluge 
In the dry season, the average rainfall was about two and a half inches a day. Mr. Wallison took the trouble to keep a meteorological diary and found that during the first year, rain fell on 330 days and that on 295 days, it was accompanied by thunder and lightning. Of the 400 men of all races employed during the first year, 12% died in the country from hardships and 83% of the total force was invalided from New Guinea. Of the Europeans and natives who landed during that year, only 11 lasted out the whole 15 months of the expedition. Of these 11, four were Europeans, four Gurkhas, two Javanese soldiers, and one a convict. When it is remembered that eight months is the maximum period allowed by the Dutch authorities for continued service in New Guinea, the marvel is that these eleven escaped with their lives. It was with no regret that Captain Rawling said farewell to what must be by far the most unpleasant land on earth. Quote, wild shrieks had greeted us on our first arrival in the country, and wild shrieks echoed down the still reach of the river as the boat crept toward the sea. End quote. Mount Karstens still awaits its conqueror. Since the Rawling expedition, much has been done in the exploration of the central mountains. In 1913, Mount Villamina, 15,550 feet, of which Dr. Lorentz had trodden the lower snows, was finally ascended by Captain Herdenshee. In 1921, Captain Kremer reached the same summit from the north and found the means of crossing the range at a height of 13,480 feet. A German expedition under Dr. Moskowski, which was projected in 1913 to attempt Karstens from the north, was stopped by the war. Meantime, in September 1912, Mr. Wallison, Captain Rawlings' companion, had returned to New Guinea and ascended the Utaqua River. Its headwaters led him direct to Karstens, and by establishing a series of depots for food in the foothills, he was able to reach the main massif of the mountain. Above 8,000 feet, he left the jungles behind. But the mountain proved very difficult, and the rain, as usual, fell without intermission. At 14,200 feet, he reached the snow line, and on February 1, 1913, from a camp above 12,000 feet, he climbed to 14,866 feet, a thousand feet or so below the summit. There he was stopped by an icefall, and lack of provisions and the weakness of his party prevented him from finding a way to turn it. The top of the mountain is an ice cap which breaks down very sheer on the south side, and Mr. Wollaston is of the opinion that the easiest ascent would be from the north. This closes for the present the history of the exploration of Karstens. For the second story, we move east into British territory. There, the general configuration is the same. Swamps near the shore, then a tangled forest, then a range of inland mountains, though these are much less conspicuous than the ranges in Dutch territory and scarcely rise above 6,000 feet. In 1911, the Honorable Miles Staniforth Smith, who had been mayor of Kalgoorlie and a senator representing West Australia in the Commonwealth Parliament, was at the time the administrator of Papua and set out across the center of the unexplored part of his province to investigate the sources of the rivers emptying into the Papuan Gulf. As the traveling was of the roughest, and the aim was exploration rather than scientific research, the party was kept very small. Three white men, Mr. Staniforth Smith, Mr. Bell, the Chief Inspector of Native Affairs, and Mr. Pratt, a staff surveyor, together with 11 native police and 17 carriers. They started from the head of the navigable waters of the Kikor, or Aird River, meaning to push north to the top of Mount Murray, and then traverse to the west along the ridge. Mount Murray, which is some 6,000 feet high, was safely reached, and the explorers found themselves moving along a high limestone plateau, much fissured by streams and diversified by parallel ranges. They hoped, ultimately, to reach the Strickland River, which is a tributary of the Great Fly River, and so complete the rest of their journey by rafts. 
Presently they found such a river running in a deep gorge, and from certain rapids which had been noted by earlier explorers, they assumed it to be the Strickland. Now began their adventures. The stream seemed to be a series of wild rapids, but as the Strickland had already been descended in rafts, the risks appeared to be justifiable and four rafts were built. Mr. Staniforth Smith started out first with three police and two carriers, and Mr. Bell and Mr. Pratt arranged to follow in quick succession with the rest. In 200 yards, the first raft was upset, but its occupants managed to hang on. Instead of the rapids disappearing, they grew worse, and after four or five wild miles, the party dashed into a timber block. One of the natives was so seriously injured that he died the next morning. Mr. Staniforth Smith then started to go back along the river in the hope of joining his companions, but found that he was on an island with swift streams on either side. Next morning, the party tried to ford the river and, with some difficulty, succeeded. As they were cutting a track up a bank, they met two of the police who had lost their rifles and who informed them that Mr. Bell and Mr. Pratt were on the other bank of the river, and that several of the carriers had been drowned. The party had now been two days without food, so Mr. Staniforth Smith resolved to turn and travel down the stream in the hope of finding smoother water in a native village. They had no means of making a fire, and in any case there were no sago or breadfruit trees in the neighborhood. For five and a half days, the explorers hacked their way downstream. During all that time, they had no food of any kind and no shelter from torrential rains except a few palm leaves. On the sixth day, after traveling 20 miles, they saw natives on the opposite bank. They built a rough raft and managed to cross. It was just in time, for they were now utterly exhausted. But the food which the natives gave them revived them. Curiously enough, as they were at their meal, the party of Mr. Bell and Mr. Pratt came out of the jungle. They had, if possible, suffered even worse disasters. Both the white men, though powerful swimmers, had been nearly drowned, and seven of the carriers had lost their lives. They would certainly have perished had they not had the luck the day before to shoot a wild pig. By this time, it was clear that whatever stream they were on, it was not the Strickland, for the Strickland flowed southwest, and this river ran nearly due east. The natives, who had never seen a white man before, took them to their village and treated them kindly. The good repute of the British official throughout the wilds now stood them in good stead. They hoped that the river would soon be clear of rapids, but to their consternation there was nothing but gorges and whirlpools for another hundred miles. The stream was the Kikor in the middle reaches, the same stream as they had ascended from the coast. It took them 29 days to pass the hundred miles of gorges, and during that time they rarely had a full meal. On one occasion, the whole party worked for seven days without getting anything to eat, except a few handfuls of soup powder and a few tins of cocoa, saved from the capsized rafts. They had no matches, so they had to keep a fire burning day and night. They slept in caves and under palm leaves, which made no pretense of keeping out the rain. By the twenty-ninth day, the river seemed smooth enough for rafts, and the explorers again embarked, and managed to cover fifty miles without any serious misadventure. But next day, the rapids began again, and their two canoes, made of hollow logs, were upset. They descended the rapids for ten miles, hanging on to the upturned logs before they could land. That night they spent in the rain without food, and, starting again at daybreak, they suddenly saw, to their immense relief, European tents, and were welcomed by an officer of the constabulary who had been sent out to look for them. They had reached the exact spot from which they had struck north to Mount Murray at the beginning of their journey. When, two days later, they arrived at the coast, they had traveled in fifteen weeks approximately 524 miles through utterly unknown country, 374 miles on foot, and 150 by river. Mr. Staniforth Smith encountered every misfortune that can meet the traveler except one. He had no trouble with the natives. Indeed, by his tact and patience, 
he made friends everywhere with the bushmen and the survivors of the party owed to them their lives by some strange system of bush telegraphy the repute to the white men was spread from village to village it was the one piece of good fortune that befell the explorers and it was final in its effect for it made the difference between life and death i do not know any narrative exploration which contains adventures more desperate than those whirling voyages on upturned rafts through black ravines or that month when starving men hacked their way through the jungle along the torrent's bank in a perpetual tempest of rain End of chapter eight chapter nine part one mount everest the himalaya not only contain the loftiest peaks on the globe but can boast at least eighty summits loftier than those of any other range the andes come next but their highest point at concagua is only twenty three thousand sixty feet in the huge mountain land which bounds india on the north and which stretches as great a distance as from the english channel to the caspian there are more than eighty peaks above twenty four thousand feet some twenty above twenty six thousand and six above twenty seven thousand mount everest the highest is according to the latest measurements twenty nine thousand one hundred forty feet high its true character was not always recognized at one time chimborazo in the andes was thought to outsoar himalay in the middle of the last century kanchenjunga which fills the eye of the traveller who looks north from darjeeling was believed to be the loftiest of the world's mountains at that time officers of the indian government were conducting the great trigonometrical survey during which they discovered a summit for which they could find no native name in which they labeled peak fifteen in eighteen fifty two when the observations had been worked out an official rushed breathlessly into the room of the surveyor general in calcutta with the news that peak fifteen proved to be twenty nine thousand two feet high and was therefore the chief mountain in the world as its native name was unknown it was called after sir george everest who had been in charge of the survey the name is beautiful in itself and may well stand though had the circumstances been otherwise there would have been much said for the tibetan name chomolungmo which means goddess mother of the mountains the ascent of everest was a project which only slowly entered into men's minds when the great peak was first discovered mountaineering was still in its infancy and for a generation afterwards climbers were preoccupied with the alps then mountaineers began to look farther afield at first the caucasus and then the andes were conquered till some thirty years ago the ambitious began to turn their eyes to the himalaya gradually the limit of achievement on high snows was extended on trisul dr longstaff in ten and a half hours ascended from seventy thousand four hundred fifty feet to the summit of twenty three thousand three hundred sixty feet on Kamet, mr charles meade took coolies up to a camp of twenty three thousand six hundred feet the duke of the abruzzi after his ascent of ruanzori attacked with a splendidly equipped party k two that icy lump in the karakoram the second highest of the world's mountains and reached a height of twenty four thousand six hundred feet which till the year nineteen twenty one remained the world's record in nineteen twenty Dr. Kellis found that on reasonable snow, he could ascend at a rate of 600 feet an hour above 21,000 feet. It was inevitable that, when the Great War was over, lovers of high places should fix their thoughts on Everest. It had long been a dream of mountaineers. Lord Curzon, when Viceroy of India, had suggested the exploration of Everest to the Royal Geographical Society and the Alpine Club but there were political difficulties connected with the journey through tibet or nepal and even a reconnaissance of the mountain proved impossible cecil rawling who fell at the third battle of ypres as a brigadier general with the twenty first division during his journey in nineteen o four to the headwaters of the brahmaputra saw for the first time from a distance of sixty miles 
the north side of Everest and believed that it might be climbed. I well remember how, in the year before the war, he and I planned an expedition which was to cover two seasons and explore that northern side. In March 1919, Captain Noel urged the Royal Geographical Society to undertake the work, and Sir Francis Young Husband, the president of the Society in the following year, in conjunction with the Alpine Club, entered into negotiations with the government of India. Permission was obtained from the Tibetan authorities, and in January 1921, a joint committee of the Royal Geographical Society and the Alpine Club proceeded to organize an expedition. There were many to ask what was the use of such an enterprise, which would be costly, difficult, and certainly dangerous. The answer is that it was of no earthly use, and that in that lay its supreme merit. The war had called forth the finest qualities of human nature, and with the advent of peace, there seemed a risk of the world slipping back into dull materialism. Men had begun to ask of everything its cash value, and to cherish, as if it were a virtue, a narrow utilitarian common sense. To embark upon something which had no material value was a vindication of the essential idealism of the human spirit. In Sir Francis Young Husband's words, quote, the sight of climbers struggling upwards to the supreme pinnacle would have taught men to lift their eyes to the hills, to raise them off the ground, and divert them, if only for a moment, to something pure and lofty and satisfying to that inner craving for the worthiest which all men have hidden in their souls. And when they see men thrown back at first, but returning again and again to the assault, till, with faltering footsteps and gasping breaths, they at last reach the summit, they will thrill with pride. They will no longer be obsessed with the thought of what mites they are in comparison with the mountain, how insignificant they are beside their material surroundings. They will have a proper pride in themselves and a well-grounded faith in the capacity of spirit to dominate material." End quote. These are almost the words of Theophile Gautier's defense of mountaineers. Quote, il sole volante protestant entre l'obstacle la vouble et il plante sur l'inaccessible le drapeau de l'intelligence humaine. Unquote. If the climber wants a further statement of his creed, let it be that of Mr. Belloc when he first saw the Alps from the ridge of the Jura. Quote, up there, the sky above and below them, the great peaks made communion between that homing, creeping part of me which loves vineyards and dances and a slow movement among pastures, and that other part which is only properly at home in heaven. These, the great Alps, seen thus, link one in some way to one's immortality. Nor is it possible to convey, or even to suggest, these few fifty miles and these few thousand feet there is something more. Let me put it thus, that from the height of the Weisenstein I saw, as it were, my religion. I mean humility, the fear of death, the terror of height or distance, the glory of God, the infinite potentiality of reception, whence springs that divine thirst of the soul. My aspiration also toward completion and my confidence in the dual destiny. For I know that we laughers have a gross cousinship with the Most High, and it is this constant and perpetual quarrel which feeds the spring of merriment in the soul of a sane man. Since I could now see such a wonder, and it could work such things in my mind, therefore some day I should be part of it. That is what I feel. That is also which leads some men to climb mountain tops, but not me, for I am afraid of slipping down. End quote. And now for the great mountain itself. First of all, it is a rock peak. All the upper part is a great pyramid of stone with three main reeds, the west, the southwest, and the northeast. It lies exactly on the frontier between Tibet and Nepal, and from the Nepalese side and the plains of India, it is hard to get a good view of it, for only a wedge of white is seen peeping between and over other peaks. On the Tibetan side, however, it stands clear, and its preeminence over its neighbors is patent. 
Now, in all attacks upon a great peak, the first question is how to get to it, a problem most difficult in the case of other Himalayan summits like K2 and of peaks like Mount McKinley in Alaska and Mount Robson in Canada. It is not only the question of the climbers getting there, but of transporting the food and tents and accessories required by a well-equipped expedition. Had the only route to Everest lain through the deep-cut gorges of Nepal, the transport problem might have been insuperable. But here came in the value of Tibet, which is a high plateau averaging twelve or 13,000 feet. It was possible to take a large party, with baggage animals, up through the passes of Sikkim to the Kampajong, Kampajong, and then westward along the north side of the range to a base camp at Tingridzong, due north of the mountain. Everest itself would be 40 or 50 miles from such a base camp, but there was a clear road to it by the upper glens and glaciers of the Arun, which flows north and east before it turns south and cuts its way through the Himalayan wall. The problem of access to the base was, therefore, not a hard one. The problem of the ascent was twofold, part physiological, part physical. Could human beings survive at an altitude of 29,000 feet? Human beings who were forced to carry loads and to move their limbs? Aviators, of course, had risen to greater heights, but they had not been compelled to exert themselves. Could a man in action support life in that rarefied air? Above 20,000 feet, a cubic foot of air contains less than half the oxygen which it holds at sea level. As the working of the body depends upon the oxygen supplied through the lungs, this fact was bound to lessen enormously man's physical energy. On the other hand, it had been found that the human frame could adapt itself to great altitudes by increasing the number of red blood corpuscles. Dr. Kellis had been able to climb 600 feet an hour above 21,000 feet, and Mr. Meade had camped in comparative comfort at 23,600 feet. Still, the highest altitude yet reached had been only 24,600 feet, and no one could say what difference the extra 4,500 feet might make. Clearly, before final climbing began, it would be necessary to acclimatize the party. In the last resort, oxygen might be artificially supplied to the climbers. The physiological problem was of the kind which could only be solved in practice. The second was the physical. A man might live and even move slowly above, say, 26,000 feet, but it was quite certain that no human being would be capable of the severe exertions required by difficult climbing. If the last stage of Everest proved to be like the last stages of many Himalayan mountains, then the thing was strictly impossible. The hope was that, on the Tibetan side, the Aritz might be easy going. It all depended upon finding an easy route and being able to make an ultimate camp at some point like 26,000 feet. There was good hope that the first might be possible, judging from Rawlingson's survey at a distance of 60 miles and the known geographical features of the Tibetan side of the range. The other physical difficulties would be the gigantic scale of Himalayan obstacles, the hugeness of the ice fields and glaciers, the immensity of the rock falls and avalanches. Also, at a great height, there would be the bitter cold to lower vitality and the likelihood of violent winds. Much would depend on the weather, which was still an unknown quantity. Indeed, all the physical factors were in the region of speculation. Only a reconnaissance could determine them. It might be that the expedition would have to turn back at once, confessing its task impossible. General Bruce, who was the chief living authority on Himalayan traveling, was unable to accompany the party, so Colonel Howard Bury was selected as leader. An elaborate scientific equipment was prepared, and steps were taken to get the full scientific value out of the journey. But the primary object was mountaineering first a reconnaissance, and then, if fortune favored, an effort to reach the summit. The four climbers chosen were Mr. Harold Rayburn, who, in 1920, had done good work on the spurs of Kanchenjunga, Dr. Kellis, who had reached 23,400 feet on Kemet, 
and two younger men, Mr. George Lee Mallory and Mr. Bullock, distinguished members of the Alpine Club, who had been together at Winchester. In India, they were to be joined by Major Morshead and Major Wheeler of the Indian Survey. Early in May, 1921, the party assembled at Darjeeling. The start from Darjeeling was on 18th of May. The first stage through Sikkim and by way of Chumbi Valley to the Tibetan Plateau was over familiar ground, which need not be described. There was a good deal of trouble with the mules, which had been badly chosen, but no incident of importance happened till Dochen was reached, the point where their road left the main road to Lhasa. At Camp Zong, Dr. Kellis died suddenly from heart failure, an irreparable loss to the expedition, for he had been one of the mountaineers from whom most was looked for, and he was the only member of the party qualified by his medical knowledge to carry out experiments in oxygen and blood pressure. Then, too, Mr. Rayburn fell sick and had to return to Sikkim. The expedition made its way almost due west behind the main chain of the Himalaya until one evening its members saw, almost due south of them, a beautiful peak which was, apparently, very high. The natives called it Jomo Uri, which means the goddess of the turquoise peak, and from observations next morning it was clear that it was Everest. They passed some wonderful monasteries perching on the face of the perpendicular crags, and eventually, on the 19th of June, they reached Tingri Zong after a month's traveling from Darjeeling. This was the spot they had decided upon for their base camp. The obvious route to Everest seemed to be by way of the Rongbuk Valley, where the great Rongbuk Glacier flowed from its northern face. There, accordingly, the two climbers, Mr. Mallory and Mr. Bullock, established themselves. The preliminary reconnaissance, however, proved to be a somewhat intricate matter. It was soon plain that there were no easy approaches from the west. So Colonel Howard Beery moved his headquarters to Karta on the east side, close to the Aran. That river, which there is about 100 yards wide, a little further down enters great gorges in which, within a course of 20 miles, it drops from 12,000 feet to 7,500 feet, or over 200 feet in a mile, a far more wonderful spectacle than anything on the Brahmaputra. On the 2nd of August, Mr. Mallory and Mr. Bullock started their exploration of the eastern approaches to the mountain. This was no easy business, for the valleys were separated by ridges, the lowest point of which was higher than any mountain in Europe, and every route had to be explored personally, for no information could be had from the natives. The two main valleys running down on the east side of Everest are the Karta and further south the Kama. The latter valley was first explored, and it was found that it ended under the precipitous eastern face of the mountain, and that there was no way from it of reaching the northeast ridge. It was a marvelous valley for scenery, but for mountaineering impracticable. A move was accordingly made to the Karta Valley to the north. Mr. Mallory and Mr. Bullock proceeded up this till they reached the glacier of the Karta River, and at last found a valley which seemed to lead them straight to the northeast ridge. It was now, however, early August. The monsoon was blowing, and everywhere there was deep, soft, fresh snow. They returned accordingly to the camp at Karta to wait till weather conditions became better. What was called the Advance Base Camp was established in the Karta Valley at a height of 17,350 feet, in a grassy hollow well sheltered from the wind and amid a glory of alpine flowers. Meantime, Mr. Mallory and Mr. Bullock spent their time in carrying wood and stores to a camp higher up the valley. This was finally established at a height of some 20,000 feet, well up the Karta Glacier. At the glacier head was a pass called the Lakpala, or Windy Gap, and the next step was to form a camp there at a height of 22,350 feet. It was in this neighborhood that the tracks, probably of a wolf, were found, which the coolies attributed to the wild men of the snows. From the Lac Pala, the mountaineers were now looking straight at Everest, and at last were able to unriddle its tangled topography. 
the attention of the readers is called to the map. It will be seen that the great Rongbuk Glacier, which descends from the western side of the northern face, receives, as a feeder, the east Rongbuk Glacier. The entrance to the latter is so small that Mr. Mallory and Mr. Bullock had failed to notice it in their exploration of the main glacier. This lesser Rongbuk Glacier ends on the eastern part of the northern face of the mountains, and between its head and that of the main glacier is the pass called the Chang La, or North Goal. From the Lak Pala, one looks into the east Rongbuk Glacier with the North Coal straight in front. If the North Coal could be attained, it seemed to the mountaineers to be possible by working up the easy northern face to attain the northeast ridge at a point above the main difficulties. The camp on the Lak Pala was not a comfortable place, with a howling wind, 34 degrees of frost, and little stuffy tents which gave dubious protection and inevitable headaches. It was decided that the two expert alpine climbers, with a few picked coolies, should alone attempt the North Col, and if fortune favored, prospect the farther route, while the others returned to the 20,000 feet camp. We are now concerned with the doings only of Mr. Mallory and Mr. Bullock, who were to attempt the North Col. In the week since their arrival in the neighborhood of Everest, they had been studying its contours with the eyes of trained mountaineers. They saw that it was a great rock mass, quote, coated often with a thin layer of white powder, which is blown about its sides and bearing perennial snow only on the gentler ledges and on several wide faces less steep than the rest, end quote. They saw that from the point of the northeast shoulder, a more or less broad arete fell northward to the snow coal called the Chang La. If they could reach that snow call, the road to the northeast ridge looked reasonably simple. They had seen that the Chang La would be very difficult of attainment from the Rongbuk Glacier, and that was why they had turned their minds to an eastern approach. Here is their conclusion in Mr. Mallory's words, reached about the third week in July. Quote, if ever the mountain were to be climbed, the way would not lie along the whole length of any one of its colossal ridges. Progress could only be made along comparatively easy ground, and anything like a prolonged sharp crest or a series of towers would inevitably bar the way, simply by the time it would require to overcome such obstacles. But the North Arete, coming down to a gap between Everest and the North Peak, Changsti, is not of this character. From the horizontal structure of the mountain, there is no excrescence of rock pinnacles in this part, and the steep walls of rock which run across the north face are merged with it before they reach this part, which is comparatively smooth and continuous, a bluntly rounded edge. The great question before us now was to be one of access. Could the North Coal be reached from the east, and how could we attain this point? End quote. We have seen the two climbers as far on their journey as the Lac Pala, looking over the east Rongbuk Glacier to the North Col. The chief difficulty, it was soon evident, would be the wall under the coal, which must be over 500 feet high and appeared to be very steep. On the morning of the 23rd of September, Mr. Mallory, Mr. Bullock, and Mr. Wheeler started from the camp on the Lac Pala with ten coolies some of whom were mountain sick, and all of whom were affected by the height. They started late and resolved to make an easy day, pitching their tents that night in the open snow under the North Goal. They had looked for a sheltered camp, but the place proved to be a temple of the winds, and no one that night had much sleep. Next morning, the 24th, a few hours after sunrise, they began to climb the slopes under the wall and found them easier than they had feared. By 11.30, the party was on the coal. Only three coolies had accompanied them, two of whom were already very tired. Of the three sahibs, only Mr. Mallory was in anything like good condition. The place was scourged by icy blasts and frequently in a whirl of powdery snow, but there could be no doubt that the arit in front of them was accessible. In that gale, however, they dare not attempt it, so they struggled back to their camp below the wall. Next morning, the 25th, a council of war was held. 
it was clear that they must either go on or go back. In their plan, they had dreamed of making a camp at 26,000 feet, but that was now out of the question. It was too late in the season, the weather was too bad, and the party was too weak. There was nothing for it but to return, and accordingly they struggled over the Loch Pala, back to the Carta Valley, and the road to England. The reconnaissance of 1921 had established certain facts of the first importance. The first was as to the proper season for the attempt. The rainfall in the Himalaya that year was abnormal, and the monsoon began and finished later than usual. But it was clear that between its end and the coming of winter, there was not sufficient time to give climbers a chance of good weather. The next attempt must obviously be made before the coming of the monsoon, that is, in May or June. The second fact established was the best way of attempting the summit. The only feasible route lay from the Changla up the subsidiary ridge to the shoulder of the northeast Arit. The distance from the Changla to the top was not more than two miles, and the rise not more than 6,000 feet. So far as the climbers on the pass could judge, and their conclusion was supported by numerous photographs from other points, there seemed to be no very great difficulties on this route in the shape of steep rocks. It looked as if it might be practicable to find a site for a camp at about 26,000 feet. By this route, the northeast route would be reached at about 28,000 feet. The thousand feet from that point to the summit looked slightly more difficult and appeared to possess certain rock towers which, however, might be circumvented. The actual top seemed to be a cap of snow with a steep, blunt edge on the side of the ridge. The transport question must always be difficult. The thousand feet from the East Rongbuk Glacier to the Chang La, half of which was very steep, might give trouble to laden coolies, especially earlier in the season when the ice was uncovered by snow. An advanced base camp on the Chang La would, of course, be essential if a high camp were to be made at 26,000 feet. But the physical problem might be regarded as solved, at any rate, as far as the shoulder of the northeast are reap. On the physiological question, little light had been thrown. The climbers in September 1921 were all more or less tired from spending long periods in high camps and could not be regarded as at the top of their form. Yet, in the cases of most members of the party, the process of acclimatization had been rapid, and Mr. Mallory on the Chang La was remarkably fit. What would happen, however, at the higher altitudes? The effect of these upon the human body had not been decided. The conclusion from the year's work was that, while no insuperable difficulty had been proved in the problem, yet for success there must be a combination of happy chances in the shape of weather, the condition of the snow, the endurance of the transport coolies, and the bodily fitness of the climbers. A second attempt would be justified, but it could not be regarded with anything like confidence. The enterprise was seriously and responsibly envisioned, and no better expression of the spirit of those who undertook it can be found than in Mr. Mallory's own words. Quote, it might be possible for two men to struggle somehow to the summit, disregarding every other consideration. It is a different matter to climb the mountain as mountaineers would have climbed it. Principles, time-honored in the Alpine Club, must, of course, be respected in the ascent of Mount Everest. The party must keep a margin of safety. It is not to be a mad enterprise rashly pushed on regardless of danger. The ill-considered acceptance of any and every risk has no part in the essence of persevering courage. A mountaineering enterprise may keep sanity and sound judgment and remain an adventure. And of all the principles to which we hold, the first is that of mutual help. What is to be done for a man who is sick or abnormally exhausted at these high altitudes? His companions must see to it that he is taken down at the first opportunity and with an adequate escort. And the obligation is the same whether he be sahib or coolie. If we ask a man to carry our loads up the mountain, 
we must care for his welfare at need. End quote. End of chapter 9, part 1. Chapter 9, part 2, Mount Everest. The 1922 party had as its leader Brigadier General the Honorable C.G. Bruce, the supreme authority upon the Himalaya, to the exploration of which he had devoted much of his life. He knew the hill people, too, as no other man knew them, and his advice was invaluable in the selection of porters. The climbers were Mr. Mallory, Mr. Finch, who had been selected for the expedition of the year before, but had been unable to accompany it, Mr. Norton and Mr. Somerville, all of whom were trained mountaineers, and Captain Jeffrey Bruce, who had never done any serious climbing before. Major Morshead was also of the party. The 1921 expedition had discovered what seemed a possible route to the summit by the North Goal, and the new expedition proposed to follow its tracks. It was stronger in personnel than its predecessor, and much stronger in equipment, for it had learned many lessons from the experiences of the year before. Among other things, it carried a supply of oxygen and bottles, and the necessary apparatus to use it. The party, being resolved to make the attempt before the monsoon broke, made straight for the old advanced base camp in the Carta Valley. Thanks to General Bruce's consummate skill in the organization of mountain travel, it reached that point on the date fixed, and with everybody in good health. The next duty was to establish an advanced camp one stage before the North Goal, up to which the porters could be brought without undue fatigue. The summit of the Lac Pala was abandoned, and an advance base, known as Camp No. 3, was established under the west side of the pass, close to the East Rongbuk Glacier. The next step was to ascertain whether the road to the North Col was practicable, for when Mr. Mallory's party had traveled it the year before, there had been fresh snow and at this early season there was a danger of bare ice. Mr. Somerville and Mr. Mallory on the 13th May, with one coolie, set forth from Camp No. 3 on a reconnaissance, and found that the route they had followed the year before was one sheet of glittering ice. They saw, however, that they could cut their way into a corridor filled with good snow, which would lead them up to the foot of the final slope, and that final slope, proved also to be snow and not ice. On the North Col, they found a difficulty they had not looked for. Between the point at which they reached it and Everest itself was an ice cliff, which the year before they had circumvented. Now they found their way barred by a hopeless crevasse. Ultimately, they discovered a route at the far end of the ice cliff and reached the level snow from which the north ridge of Everest springs. The next few days were occupied in bringing up supplies to Camp 4 on the North Col. They had only nine porters available, and this decided them that it would not be feasible to make two camps on the face of the mountain. They resolved to attempt to make one camp at about 26,000 feet, and from that to make their final effort. On the 19th, the four climbers, Mr. Mallory, Mr. Norton, Major Morshead, and Mr. Somerville, left Camp 3 at a quarter to nine in the morning, and an hour after midday were busy putting up tents and arranging stores at Camp 4 on the North Gull. The sun set at 4.30, and they turned in for the night in the best of spirits. On the morrow, they proposed to carry up two of the small tents, two double sleeping sacks, food for a day and a half, cooking pots, and two thermos flasks. They would make four loads of the stuff, which would give two porters to each load with a man to spare. On the 20th of May, Mr. Mallory got up at 5 a.m. and found that there was no sign of life in the tents in which the nine porters were quartered. The coolies had shut themselves in so hermetically that they were all unwell, and four of them were suffering badly from mountain sickness. Only five were able to embark on the day's work. Breakfast was a slow business because everything was frozen hard, 
and the dish of spaghetti which they had promised themselves could only be prepared after an elaborate process of thawing. A start was made at 7 a.m., and everything went smoothly at first, for ropes had been fixed between their camp and the call itself so as to help them on their return. From the call, a broad snow ridge went up at an easy angle, and all the climbers felt that bodily fitness which is the assurance of success. Then their troubles began. The first was the cold. The sun had no more warmth in it than a candle, and a bitter wind began to blow from the west. They came to an end of the ridge of stones on which they had been progressing easily, and realized that they must get some shelter from the wind by moving to the east side of the shoulder. Step cutting was now necessary, and at that height, the exertion required was extraordinarily severe. Moreover, the cold was telling upon them, and the porters especially suffered badly. After some three hundred feet of steps, they rested about noon under the shelter of some rocks at twenty-five thousand feet. It seemed to them that they could not get their loads much higher, and that they had better look out for a camp, for the porters had to return to the North Coal. But a camping ground was not easy to find. At last, on the east side of the ridge, they discovered a steep slab up to which they could level the ground. It was a poor place, for the incline was sharp, most of the floor was composed of broken rocks, and men lying down would inevitably slip on top of each other. There, however, they placed the little tents, each with its double sleeping bag, and melted snow for their makeshift supper. The porter started back for the North Coal, and the climbers, two in each bed, did their best to keep warm. All four had suffered a good deal from the cold. Mr. Norton's ear was badly swollen, three of Mr. Mallory's fingers were touched with the frost, and Major Morshead was chilled to the bone and clearly unwell. The wind dropped in the evening, and during the night fresh snow fell. At 6.50 on the morning of the 21st of May, they crawled from their sleeping bags and made a laborious and exiguous breakfast, for only one thermos flask had turned up. At eight o'clock they started, none of them feeling their best after the stuffy, headachy night. Major Morshead was unable to go with him, for his illness had increased, and most regretfully the other three went on without him. A good deal of fresh snow had fallen, but the first hours of climbing were not very difficult. The worst trouble was the perverse stratification of the mountain, for all the ledges tilted the wrong way. Slowly they crawled up, first regaining the ridge by turning west, and then following the ridge itself in the direction of the point of the northeast arit. They decided that they must turn back at about two o'clock if they were to make the descent in reasonable safety. Besides, they had to consider Major Morshead left alone in Camp 5. At 2.15 they reached the head of the rocks, about 500 feet below the point where the north shoulder joined the northeast arit. Here they had a clear view of the summit. The aneroid gave the elevation as 26,800 feet, but it is possible that it may have been nearly 200 feet more. Their advance had for some time been reduced to a very slow crawl, but none of the party were really exhausted. It was wise, however, to turn while they had sufficient strength to get back to Camp 4. They tried moving westward, where there seemed to be more snow, but they found that the snow slopes were a series of slabs with an ugly tilt under a thin covering of new snow. So they went back to the ridge and followed their old tracks. At four o'clock they reached Camp 5 and picked up Major Morshead in their tents and sleeping bags. After that the going became more difficult, as the fresh fallen snow had made even easy ground treacherous. One slip did occur, and the three men were held only by the rope secured around Mr. Mallory's ice axe. The descent now became a race with a fast gathering darkness. When they got to the snow ridge, they could find no trace of the steps they had made the day before, and had to cut them all over again. At this point, they were in sight of the watchers far below at Camp 3 on the glacier. Major Moore's head was suffering severely and could only move a few steps at a time. As the night drew in, 
lightning began to flicker from the clouds in the west, but, happily, the wind did not rise. They were soon at the crevasses and the ice cliff, and as their air was calm, it was possible to light a lantern to guide them. They hunted desperately to find the fixed rope, which would take them down to the terrace where they could see their five tents awaiting them, but the rope was covered with snow, and at that moment the lantern gave out. Happily, somebody hooked up the buried rope, and after that it was plain going to the tents. They reached them at 11.30 and could find no fuel or cooking pots. Their mouths were parched with thirst, and the best beverage they could concoct was a mixture of jam and snow with frozen condensed milk. Mr. Mallory ascribes to the influence of this stuff, quote, the uncontrollable shudderings, spasms of muscular contraction in belly and back, which I suffered in my sleeping bag, and which caused me to sit up and inhale again great whiffs from the night air, as though the habit of deep breathing had settled upon me indispensably. End quote. The four men did not waste time next morning on the North Coal, for they were tormented by thirst and hunger. It took them six hours to reach Camp 3, for they had to make a staircase beneath the new snow which the porters could use in order to fetch down their baggage, since they did not intend to spend the night at Camp 3 without their sleeping bags. At midday, they were back in comparative comfort, with certain solid conclusions as a result of the venture. One was as to the difficulties of the new snow and the precariousness of the weather. Another was as to the unexpected capacity of the porters. But the most important was as to the need of oxygen. They had reached a point very little below 27,000 feet, and that left 2,000 feet to be surmounted before the summit was reached. For success, a higher camp was needed than Camp 5, and the men who started from it must, if possible, have an extra stimulus to counteract the malign effects of altitude. If Everest chose to clothe itself with air containing less oxygen than a man needed, the defect must be supplied. If a climber used extra clothes to counteract the cold, he must use some extra device to supplement the atmosphere. We come now to the second attempt of 1922 in which oxygen was used. Certain eminent scientists at home had held that Everest could never be conquered without its aid, and the expedition had brought a very full equipment, oxygen stored in light steel cylinders and a somewhat complex apparatus for its use. There had been oxygen drill parades among the party, and perhaps it might have been well had they used it straight away for one main attempt, instead of making the first effort without it. Unfortunately, the apparatus needed overhauling, and it was not till the 22nd of May, when Mr. Mallory and his party were coming down from the mountain, that four sets were ready for use. As to the legitimacy of such a device in mountaineering, Mr. Finch's arguments are final. Quote, few of us, I think, who stop to ponder for a brief second, will deny that our very existence in this enlightened 20th century, with all its amenities of modern civilization, is artificial. Most of us have learned to respect progress and to appreciate the meaning and advantages of adaptability. For instance, it is a fairly firmly established fact that warmth is necessary to life. The mountaineer, acting on this knowledge, conserves as far as possible his animal heat by wearing especially warm clothing. No one demurs. It is the common sense thing to do. He pours hot tea from a thermos bottle and never blushes. Nonchalantly, without fear of adverse criticism, he doctors up his insides with special heat and energy-giving foods and stimulants. From the sun's ultraviolet rays and the wind's bitter cold, he boldly dares to protect his eyes with Crook's anti-glare glasses. Further, he wears boots that to the average layman look ridiculous. The use of caffeine to supply just a little more buck to an almost worn-out frame is not cavilled at, despite its being a synthetic drug, the manufacture of which involves the employment of complicated plant and methods. If science could prepare oxygen in tabloid form, or supply it to us in thermos flasks that we might imbibe it like our hot tea, 
the stigma of artificiality would perhaps be effectually removed but when it has to be carried in special containers its whole essence is held to be altered and by using it the mountaineer is taking a sneaking unfair advantage of the mountain in answer to this grave charge i would remind the accuser that by the inhalation of a little life-giving gas the climber does not smooth away the rough rocks of the mountain or still the storm nor is he an aladdin who by a rub on a magic ring is wafted by invisible agents to his goal oxygen renders available more of his store of energy and so hastens his step but it does not alas fit the wings of mercury to his feet the logic of the anti-oxygenist is surely faulty on the twentieth of may mr finch and captain geoffrey bruce arrived at camp three accompanied by tedgebeer one of the four gurkha non-commissioned officers lent to the expedition there they found the oxygen apparatus in bad condition and had to tinker at it for four days during this period they made a trial trip to camp four on the north coal using oxygen a good deal of new step cutting had to be done for fresh snow had fallen but in spite of that the oxygen enabled them to get to the call in three hours and return in fifty minutes with halts to take three dozen photographs on the twenty fourth of may mr finch captain bruce captain noel the official photographer and tedgebeer with twelve porters went up the north call and camped for the night the next morning the twenty fifth brought a clear windy sky and at eight o'clock the twelve porters with the camp outfit provisions for one day and the oxygen cylinders started up the north ridge followed an hour and a half later by mr finch captain bruce and tedgebeer each carrying a load of over thirty pounds all fifteen used oxygen it was their intention to make a camp above twenty six thousand feet but after one o'clock the wind freshened and snow began so it was deemed advisable in order to ensure the safe return of the porters to the north coal to camp at twenty five thousand five hundred feet the camping place was no better than that which mr mallory had found the place was on the actual crest of the ridge for the west side was scourged by wind and there was no good position on the east side the tent was pitched on a little platform on the edge of precipices falling to the east rongbuk glacier four thousand feet below the tent was secured as well as possible by guy ropes but when the climbers got into their sleeping bags it was both blowing and snowing hard and minute flakes filled the tent snow was melted and a tepid meal was cooked a really warm meal was out of the question for at that altitude water boils at so low a temperature that man can hold his hand in it without discomfort as the night closed in the two climbers comforted themselves with the assurance that next day they would get to the top but after sunset the wind increased to a gale so furious that even the ground sheet with three men lying on it was lifted completely off the earth they blocked up the small openings as well as they could but before midnight everything inside was covered with spindrift it was impossible to sleep they had to be constantly on the watch to prevent the flaps being torn open and to hold the tent down for they realized that if once the gale got a hold of their shelter the whole outfit would be blown on to the glacier below few adventurers have ever spent a more awful night tedgebeer had all the placidity of his race and captain bruce who was making his first serious mountaineering expedition on the highest of the world's mountains was as cheerful as if he had been sleeping in an ordinary alpine cabane here is mr finch's own description Quote, by one o'clock on the morning of the twenty sixth the gale reached its maximum the wild flapping of the canvas made a noise like that of machine-gun fire so deafening was it that we could scarcely hear each other speak later there came interludes of comparative lull succeeded by bursts of storm more furious than ever during such lulls we took it in turn to go outside to tighten up slackened guy ropes and also succeeded in tying down the tent more firmly with our alpine rope it was impossible to work in the open for more than three or four minutes at a stretch 
so profound was the exhaustion induced by this brief exposure to the fierce cold wind. End quote. Morning broke with no lull in the violence of the elements. They prepared a makeshift meal and spent the forenoon hours in desperate anxiety. At midday, the storm seemed to reach the summit of its fury, and matters were made more awkward by a stone cutting a great hole in the tent. Mercifully, an hour later, the wind suddenly dropped, and the anxious occupants of the tent could prospect the weather. The sensible thing would have been to make a retreat to the North Coal, but there was no thought of giving up. The party were unanimous in resolving to hang on and make the attempt the following day. With the last of their fuel, they cooked supper, a frugal meal, for, since they had only carried provisions for one day, they were now on very short rations. As they settled down for the night, voices were heard outside, and the porters from the North Coal appeared, bringing thermos flasks of hot beef tea and tea sent by Captain Noel. In a little more comfort, they tried to sleep. All three, however, were strained and weak from their labors of the past twenty-four hours, and they felt a numbing cold creeping up their limbs. Mr. Finch had the happy inspiration to use oxygen, and so arranged the apparatus that each could breathe a small quantity throughout the night. Quote, the result was marvelous. We slept well and warmly. Whenever the tube delivering the gas fell out of Bruce's mouth as he slept, I could see him stir uneasily in the eerie greenish light of the moon as it filtered through the canvas. Then, half unconsciously replacing the tube, he would fall once more into a peaceful slumber. End quote. Next morning, the 27th, they woke well and hungry, and after a struggle with their boots, which were frozen stiff, started off at 6.30, Captain Bruce and Mr. Finch carrying each over 40 pounds, and Tedgebeer some 50 pounds. Their plan was to take Tedgebeer as far as the northeast shoulder, and there to relieve him of his load and send him back. It was cold, clear weather, and the wind was not too strong. Presently, however, it began to freshen, and after they had gained a few hundred feet, it was Tedgebeer who showed the first signs of weakness. He collapsed entirely, and had to be relieved of his cylinders and sent back. The height was about 26,000 feet, the highest point which any native had yet reached. In order to move more quickly, Mr. Finch and Captain Bruce dispensed with a rope. The rocks were quite easy, and at 26,500 feet, they had passed two admirable sites for a camp. But the wind was steadily increasing in force, and they were compelled to leave the ridge and traverse out across the great north face. This was bad luck, for the ridge was easy climbing and the face was not. The stratification of the rocks was most awkward, and it was hard to find any good footholds. The climbers were unroped, and it was a severe test of Captain Bruce, who had had no mountaineering experience to give him confidence. Sometimes they were on treacherous slopes, sometimes on more treacherous snow, and they often had to cross heaps of scree that moved with every step. They stopped occasionally to replace an empty cylinder of oxygen with a new one, each of which meant five pounds off their load. Presently, the aneroid gave their height as 27,000 feet. They now ceased traversing and began to climb straight upward to a point on the northeast ridge, halfway between the shoulder and the summit. Soon they were at 27,300 feet, and the top of Everest was the only mountain they could see without looking down. The peaks, which had seemed so formidable from the glacier, had now sunk into insignificant humps. They were 1,700 feet below the summit, well within half a mile of it, and they could distinguish stones and a patch of scree just under its highest point. But it was very clear that they could go no farther. Weak with hunger and the anxiety and labors of the past 48 hours, it was plain to Mr. Finch that if they went on even for another 500 feet, they would not both get back alive. Like wise and brave men, they decided to retreat. It was now about midday, and for greater safety they roped together. 
At first they followed their old tracks, and then moved towards the north ridge at a point higher than where they had left it. They reached the ridge at two o'clock, and there reduced their burden by dumping four oxygen cylinders at a place to which future climbers could be directed. The weather was getting worse. A violent wind from the west was bringing up mist, but happily there was no snow. Half an hour later they reached their camp of the night before, where they found Tejbir sound asleep, wrapped up in all three sleeping bags. The porters from the North Coal were a mile below, and Tejbir was instructed to go down with them. The rest of the descent was a nightmare. The knees of the climbers knocked together, and their limbs did not seem to respond to the direction of the brain. Often they staggered and slipped, and often they were forced to sit down. But at four o'clock in the afternoon, they reached the North Coal. Happily, they still felt famished. They had not yet reached the limit of a man's strength when hunger vanishes. At the North Coal, they had hot tea and spaghetti, and three-quarters of an hour later, they started off for Camp 3 in the company of Captain Noel. The journey was made in record time, 40 minutes, and at 5.30 they had reached Camp 3, having descended since midday 6,000 feet. That evening made amends for the long hours of famine. Quote, Four whole quails, truffled in pâté de foie gras, followed by nine sausages, left me asking for more. The last I remember of that long day was going to sleep, warm in the depths of our wonderful sleeping bag, with the remains of a tin of toffee tucked away in the crook of my elbow. End quote. Captain Bruce's feet were badly frostbitten, but Mr. Finch had come off scot-free, which was neither more nor less than a physical miracle. As Captain Bruce, on the way down to the base camp, turned to take his last close view of Everest, his farewell was, quote, Just you wait, old thing. You will be for it soon. End quote. It was the logical conclusion. He and Mr. Finch had got to 27,300 feet after exertions and deprivations which might well have unfitted a man for the ascent of the Rigi. These misfortunes were accidental and not inevitable. The value, the superlative value of oxygen, had been abundantly proved. It may be fairly said that the 1922 expedition, though it had not set foot on the summit, had solved the secret of Everest. The mountain could almost certainly be climbed, provided a little luck attended the climbers. Now that the quality of the native porters had been proved, there seems no reason why, with the help of oxygen, a sixth camp could not be arranged on one of the flat places under 27,000 feet, which Mr. Finch noted. A night in such a camp would be no more trying than a night at 25,000 feet. If the climbers, starting from 27,000 feet and, after a good night, fell in with reasonable weather, there seems little doubt that the remaining 2,000 feet could be ascended and the peak conquered, with a good prospect of a safe return on the same day to the North Coal. There remains, of course, the possibility of physical breakdown, such as happened to Major Morshead and Tejbeer, but against this may be set the fact that Mr. Mallory, Mr. Somerville, Mr. Norton, Mr. Finch, and Captain Bruce, at great altitudes and after severe physical labor, were not especially distressed, and suffered no bad effects afterwards. The conquest of Everest will always remain one of the most difficult adventures which man can undertake. But it is a reasonable adventure, and not a piece of crazy foolhardiness, which could only succeed by the help of the one chance in a million. The two reconnaissance expeditions have shown that, for its achievement, every available human resource is necessary. But granted the utilization of these resources and the possibility which our familiarity with the lower slopes may soon permit of waiting upon a spell of kindly weather, the ultimate conquest would seem to be assured. The secret of Everest has been solved. We now know that there is a way to the top, and we know what that way is. End of chapter 9 This reading by Stephen Seidel End of The Last Secrets by John Buchan